Well, hello and welcome to Hearth and Homes OTR Visual Radio. I'm Mr. H. I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's compilation is Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This Blake Edwards created show starred Dick Powell. It was on NBC from 1949 until 1953. Powell had previously done another show called Rogue's Gallery, where he played oh, Richard yeah. Rogue. Then in 1948, he auditioned for a new show that was coming out called Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, but he opted instead to do Richard Diamond. Now, if you've heard his Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar audition show, I think you'll agree that it sounds a lot like a Diamond episode. So ultimately, it seems like this was a better fit for him. Now, just before we get into the show, I do want to take a minute to tell you about a couple ways you can help support the channel. First up, we've got the Johnny Dollar Club. Starting at just a dollar a month, you can help keep these great shows coming. You've got three ways to join. Coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. The links for those are in the description below. And many of you have asked about using PayPal. So if you prefer PayPal, the first option, coffee.com, is a great one for you. And the second way you can help support the channel and get a little something for yourself is to check out our hearth and home shop on Etsy. We've got a great assortment of old-time radio-related merchandise, including the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar collection. We've got the old-time radio detective mug series. And our newest collection, starting right now, is, is the Harold Apple Knocker collection. The link for the Etsy shop is in the description below. Head on over and check that out. Well, now, without any further ado... Let's get on with our program. It's time to sit back and relax and enjoy Dick Powell in Richard Diamond, Private Detective. And as always, thanks for tuning in. National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, a corpse in every plot. Oh, Rick, that's awful. I know, Helen, but my sense of humor is out of gas. Oh, what's the matter? No business? Not for a week. If a client walked in now, I'd probably swear it was an hallucination and referred to Bellevue. Well, I've been trying to get you. He called here about five minutes ago, said it was important. I just got in the office. I'll give him a call. Am I going to see you tonight? You know it. Me and my empty wallet will be glad to stop over for dinner. Well, I'll have Francis fix something healthy. Tell him to cook some money. <laughs> I'll see you around seven, then. Don't forget to call Walt. Bye. Bye. Lieutenant sure Levinson, homicide. Oh, you want to talk to me, Fatty? Rick? How many people call you Fatty? Where the devil have you been? I called you at your apartment all morning. Uh, Helen just told me I slept late. Well, why didn't you answer your phone? Rent was due. Could have been a trap. Can you come down here? Well, if it's important, I can come down. But if a potential client gives up because he can't find me, I may have a crying jag all over your office. I'll stock up on hankies. I wouldn't ask you, Rick, but it is important, very. Well, don't sound like the last course of gloomy Sunday. I'll be there. Relax. I knew Walt was on the level because every time he thought something was important, he came on in a higher register and began to sound like a harp. Well, I closed the office, set the bear trap in front of the door in case of a client, and left a box lunch. I might be gone for a good while this time, and if I caught something, there was no sense to let it starve. The fifth precinct was 20 blocks away, so being a practical man who always regards that lonely feeling in his pocket as the sure makings of a pedestrian, I insulted a few well-meaning cab drivers, and 30 minutes later, I limped into the squad room of the fifth precinct police station. Yes? Is there something I can do for you? In my business, you have to be conditioned to anything. Nothing should surprise you. But in my business, like any other, there's always a first time for everything. And it looked like this was it. For over a year, I had been walking leisurely into the squad room of the 5th Precinct and smiling inside when I spotted a cop with a battering ram for a head and landing barges for feet. He was always the best straight man I'd ever run across, and his name was Sergeant Otis Lovelorn. But this day, dear old Otis was not to be found. Instead, sitting at his desk, looking up at me through a pair of thick horn rim glasses, was something else. It pulled out a clean white handkerchief, removed the glasses, clouded them up with a quick breath that filled the room with the essence of sen-sen, and said, Well, 
Where's Otis? You mean Sergeant Loveloon? He's been transferred. He's been what? Transferred. Who are you? Sergeant Andre Klum. Is there something I can do for you? Andre Klum? Sergeant Andre Klum. Sergeant Andre Klum. Uh, just one moment. Yeah? Where do you think you're going? Uh, look, uh, uh, Sonny, I'm going in to see the lieutenant. You'll have to wait until I find out if he can see you. Oh, he'll see me. He just called me. May I have your name, please? What? Citation. Mr. or Mrs. Hey, this may not be so bad after all. No? No. We're going to have fun, Andre. Are we? Yes, indeed. Now, call in to the lieutenant and tell him Mr. Diamond is coming in to see him. Yeah? The gentleman you were expecting, Mr. Diamond. He's getting introductions now? Send him in. Yes, sir. The lieutenant will see you, Mr. Diamond. Thank you, Sergeant Klum. And uh, something else, Mr. Diamond. Yes? Sergeant Loveloon warned me about you, and I can assure you right now that I have no intention of becoming the brunt of your obvious crude comedy. Sergeant Klum, I don't think there's much you can do about it. Oh, Walt, I want to go on record right now as saying... Don't. That I... I know. Well, what is that out there? The commissioner says he's one of the most valuable men on the force. Well, how can you put him in a cop's uniform? It's like dressing Rasputin and a Mother Hubbard. I miss Otis as much as you do, but strictly off the record, Sergeant Klum has relatives. Oh, I thought so. Been scratching all the way in here. Otis moved over to the 11th precinct. Well, who's he working for now? Lieutenant Crawford. They've had a suicide watch on him all night. What's this Andre Klum supposed to be so good at? He's only been with us for a couple of days. I don't know. Well, if I keep thinking about him, I may have to be dipped in hot tar. You better tell me what you want to see me about. You may not like it, Rick. Oh? This is new? Remember Ralph Baxter? Sure. I sent him up while I was still on the force. Yeah. Well, you worked on that case for over a year, didn't you? You were in charge of the department. You know darn well I did. Rick, you knew Baxter's habits better than anyone on the force. Oh, now, Walt, Walt, what's it all, what's it all about? Is uh, Baxter loose? Very loose. Busted out at 8 o'clock this morning along with seven other guys. Oh. All got away clean? Every one of them. One of the best planned breaks I've ever heard about. Well, if Baxter was in on it, it had to be. He's a smart boy, Walt. One of the smartest. Yeah, well, the commissioner says we've got to pick him up before he does any damage. Just like that, huh? Just like that. I need someone who knows him so well, he might have a chance of nailing him before the trouble breaks loose. And you know Baxter and trouble. How come you're in on this, Walt? Somebody already get killed? Truck driver. Oh. Baxter's an unhappy boy. He kills to make up for it. Really does a fancy job. You want to help me out? You in trouble if they don't nail Baxter in a hurry? The commissioner is uh, relying on me. Okay, then. It's got to be official in case you have to make an arrest. Oh, now, wait a minute. Got to swear you in as a deputy. Uh -uh. Look, Rick, we've got to. I don't really care how you bring Baxter in and who gets the credit, but, but what, what would, would the, the commissioner, commissioner say, say if... Uh... Uh, yeah, I know, I know. I'm sorry, Walt. Every time I used to put on that badge, a book of rules and regulations went with it. I do it my way or not at all. But, but... Now, but... don't start running your motor. I don't want the credit. The department can have it. Besides, it's 20 to 1 in any man's book that I'll never even get close to Baxter. And you stand more chance than anyone else. Okay, then. You still don't have to worry about the credit. It's 50 to 1 that the newspapers will read. Private detective found with his head missing. Okay, Rick. Your way. Andre. Yes, Lieutenant? Andre. Yeah, some name. I beg your pardon? Uh, bring in all the information on Baxter and the seven other men who were in on the break. Yes, sir. Andre. Andre Klum. Yeah. Yeah, you are, Lieutenant. You want to look over this stuff, Rick? Yeah. I want to know how, how the break was pulled off. Maybe if we can get a line on who helped them, we can get it back to that way. A truck was used. Hmm. A Ford pickup that hauled garbage regularly. The large garbage cans were placed on the truck and taken off to a dump. The seven men in Baxter hid in the cans and were covered up with garbage. Oh. The men in the prison kitchen have all been questioned, but none will admit a thing. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Maybe you can tell us what happened after that, Sergeant. Several miles outside of the prison, the men got out of the cans. One man climbed up into the cab of the truck and ordered the driver to stop. He shot the driver, and the men climbed off the truck, rolled it over a 44-foot hill. 44 feet? 44 feet, 9 inches, at the first point of impact where the truck went over. The hill, of course, varies at other spots. Of course. Two cars were waiting for the eight men. Tire tracks were found and casts made. A report on these casts should be in at any minute. Synchronize your watches, then, Rick. Tell me, Sergeant Klum, have you any idea who might have been driving the two cars? No. 
Turning your MIGs and your ray gun, you're through. Very amusing. Now, please, Rick, for the sake of my psychiatrist, don't start on Clume like you did on Otis. Might be a woman. Clume? Driving one of the cars. Oh. Baxter was a known woman hater. You don't say. I suppose the other seven guys got together with him and formed a club. Four of the seven men were known to have had women friends at one time or another. But only one woman remained loyal after the men were sent to prison. How do you know that? I remember things. He remembers things. Oh. She visited the prison many times to see Tony Leggetti, one of the escapees. Maybe you can remember the dates? The first time was right after Tony was sent up. Uh, November... All right, all right, Sergeant. Uh, what's the girl's name and uh, where does she live? Jean Lawrence, 1782 East 12th Street, Apartment C. Uh, no, B. Butterfingers. I'll take this list of histories on the seven guys. You going to check on the girl? Yes, and uh, thank you, Sergeant Andre Clune. You've been a brick. <laughs> I left Kloom polishing his glasses with Walt looking sick. Dean Lawrence did live at 1782 East 12th, apartment B. So I looked up the landlady, a nice old reproduction of Worcester's mother with a hangover, Mrs. Shook by name. She was a little unhappy that I'd bothered her, but I finally sold her on the idea that she could shave any time, and aided by my best smile and the promise of a fast fifth, I finally got her to open the door to apartment B. There you are, lover, but I can tell you right now, Jeannie ain't in. Mm. Well, what's in this room? Bedroom. She didn't come home all day yesterday or last night. She didn't, huh? You know, I shouldn't be showing you around like this, <laughs> except that you look like a real nice fella. And you're thirsty. Oh, go on. You see anyone else hanging around, say, in the last week? Yeah. Come to think of it, about a week ago, some dark fella started coming over to see Jeannie. Used too much hair oil. Greasy type. Think you'd recognize him? Hmm. You bring me that present, lover boy, and I could recognize a clove of garlic in an onion warehouse. <laughs> I'd make book on it. May I use the phone? Go right ahead, lover. Oh, uh, by the by, hundred truth, huh? Hundred proof. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, this is Rick. I'm up at the girl's apartment. Not here. But the landlady says she can identify some guy who's been hanging around here for the last week. So look up... Oh, hold it a minute, Rick. Something coming over the hot shot. Okay. Oh, uh, bottle and bond, is that right, dear? Oh, lovely, lovely. <laughs> lovely. Rick? Yeah? Get that landlady in here, then meet me out at the end of River Street, Pier 14. Something up? Sus came up. Someone didn't want it to. She hit bottom, the bricks in the sack must have torn it open. What? A dock worker spotted her floating near one of the pier pilings. Jean Lawrence? Yeah. I'll see you over there. Something happened to little Jeannie. I could hear... Found what... her floating in the river. Oh. Well, if we're going down to the station, can we stop off and get that present? Yeah. Bottled in bond, you promised. I grabbed a cab and took Mother McCray over to the 5th precinct, making one stop on the way for the promised present. I turned her over to the desk sergeant and took off for Pier 14 at the end of River Street. When I got there, I spotted the homicide prowl car and Walt standing near the ambulance. On the wooden floor of the pier, covered with a sheet, was the dead body of Jean Lawrence. The coroner had just finished his examination. Well, give me a full report as soon as I get to the lab, Lieutenant. Well, this is a rush, coroner. It always is. Well, hello, Rick. Hi, Charlie. Shot twice, then thrown in the drink. Yeah, nice, nice. Anything else? Book of matches in her coat pocket. Probably don't mean a thing. Lieutenant, we just got a report from the precinct. Hello, Diamond. Oh, good afternoon, Clum. You're looking fine. Oh, you'll be kissing each other on the cheek in a minute. Oh, what about that report, Sergeant? The landlady Diamond brought in 22 minutes ago has just identified a picture in the morgue as a man who had been visiting Jean Lawrence for the past week. Anyone we know? William Nash, alias William Barnes, uh, alias Bootleg Barnes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of five feet eleven, black hair, brown eyes, slight scar. Oh, oh, uh, oh, hold it. What about his record? Uh, nine arrests, two convictions, robbery and assault. Uh, in the cafe business now at uh, Red Dot Inn? Yes, sir. Matches you found on the girl, Walt? Yeah, Red Dot Inn. Let's take a run over there. <laughs> Yes, Jess, what'll it be? William Nash, you around? No. Police. He still ain't around. He got an office? Well, I... Uh... He got an office. Yeah. Where is it? Top of those stairs. Down the hall, last door. 
Go around to the back of the bar, Clum. Yes, sir. Hey, now, wait a minute. You ain't supposed to come back here. See that he doesn't have any way to let Mr. Nash know we're coming up. Just go ahead and tend your bar. You guys want to get me in trouble? Not unless Nash is really in his office. Then you don't have to worry about trouble. You're in it. Let's go, Rick. Down the hall, he said. Last door. We both go? Yep. Fire escape down there. This way, Sergeant Clum covers him. Can uh, Clum shoot? I forgot to ask him. You get on there by the fire escape in case he gets past me. Who is it? Fire department. What? Yeah, we received a report that your cafe isn't properly equipped in case of fire. Are you nuts? I just had no extinguisher. William equipment. Nash? Yeah. Now, what the let's devil... Let's go. Huh? You heard him. Hey, what is this? Police, let's go. He's clean. All right, copy. You want to haul me in. What's the charge? Murder. Murder? Now, listen, Start you walking. Who's murdered? Gene Lawrence. Down the steps. I don't know any Gene Lawrence. Sure, sure. Everything all right, Lieutenant? Go upstairs and watch this guy's office. Yes, sir. You need a warrant for this, you know. I'll get one. I tell you, I don't know any Gene Lawrence. My friend, I know a little old lady who thinks you wear too much hair oil. She's going to make a very big liar out of you. <laughs> NBC is bringing you Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. All right, Sergeant, get the lineup going. Yes, sir. Henry Phipps. Henry Phipps, alias Henry Phipps. I ain't never seen a lineup before, lover. The man you identified earlier from the picture. See if you can pick him out. George Chalmers. No. Ain't him. Chalmers, alias George Lippert, alias Geo the Lip, charge Betty. Ain't him neither. William Nash. William Nash. That's him. William Barnes. All right, hold him. You sure that's a man who was calling on Gene Lawrence? Yep, that's him. Why don't he use bay rum on his hair? Nash. Yeah. Yes, Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant. You know him, Mr. Gene Lawrence? I told you I don't, Lieutenant. <laughs> He sure is a lousy liar. All right, run him off. Step down. Hal Ennis. He killed Jeannie. Ennis, we don't know. Vital. Yes, sir. Maybe he sure should, should use bay rum. Well, Walt and I and a couple of the boys took Nash downstairs and worked on her for about a half an hour before I got tired and decided to see what I could turn up myself. Nash still wouldn't admit he knew the dead girl, and we still weren't any closer to finding Ralph Baxter. I was pretty sure that Nash was connected with Baxter in some way, or he would have admitted knowing the girl and denied the killing. So I went back to the Red Dot Inn with a warrant to search Nash's office. Sergeant Andre Clune was guarding the door in the best prescribed manner. Legs spread, arms folded, back straight against the door. You're flat. Mm -hmm. What? Oh, oh, Diamond. Uh, I have... Absolutely no excuse. I, I'll understand if you report me to the lieutenant. Well, no one could get by, could they? Not without waking me. Mm, then you did what you told to. You guarded the place. But there is no excuse for falling asleep on duty. Unless you get tired. Now, forget it. I got a warrant here. Let's give this officer going over. And that's exactly what we did. We took the place apart, piece by piece. And I have to go on record by saying that Clum really knew his business. He didn't miss a thing. This might be important, Diamond. What is it? Bills to William Nash from the garage. Let me see. Mm. Nick's Garage, 13th Street. 1,000 mile service on both cars, 1490. Parking space rental on both cars, $25. Two cars. Mm. May not mean a thing. I'll check it anyway. Two cars were used in the escape diamond. Now, don't get excited. You stay here. I'll call you from the garage. I left Clume and went over to Nick's garage, looked up the owner, and he showed me the two cars, both sedans, 48 Chrysler and a new Hudson. Nick told me that both cars had been taken out the night before and returned early that morning. He said that Nash had driven one and the girl the other. So I put in a call to the Red Dot Inn and Sergeant Clume. Yes, the lab has two good casts of the tire prints. Well, put in a call to the lieutenant and tell him to get right down here with him. I hope you'll forgive me uh, being a little premature, but... You uh, already told him to come down. Uh, yes. Mm. 
Tony, Sergeant, you don't know anything about the fifth at High Lear, do you? One by uh, step up in one. Uh, and goodbye, uh... Sergeant. <laughs> Well, this is Nick Miller, who runs the garage. Hi, Lieutenant. Now, man, how about the cars? Uh, this one and uh, that one. Hold this cast. I'll try the other one, okay? Fit? No. Those tread prints on that cast supposed to fit the treads on one of these cars? We hope so. How about that one, Walt? Like a glove. Try your cast on that car. Uh uh. Fits this one, Walt. Rick, both of the cars were used in the getaway. What happens now? Go back to headquarters and tell Nash we got him dead to rights. We'll sweat him till he cracks. I got a better idea. Turn him loose. What? Nash knows that it's only a matter of time until we turn up his evidence anyway. And he knows something else. He knows Ralph Baxter. He knows if he spills anything, Baxter will kill him, sure. But we'll promise him protection. Against Baxter? Baxter would get him if it took ten years. Not if we get Baxter first. Nash probably knows where he's hiding out. Walt, even if Nash knows where Baxter is, he'd be a long time telling you. In the meantime, Baxter can cause a lot of trouble. All right, so I let Nash go. So what? Get a hold of the newspapers. Tell them to run a story that you've picked up Nash for questioning in the prison break. But that you had to release him because of insufficient evidence. You think Baxter will go after him? Well, he'd at least send some of his boys. I think the girl was knocked off because she got out of line. You can bet that Baxter won't want Nash around for a witness. Okay. Gee, you're kind of making Mr. Nash a sitting duck, ain't you? Oh, I guess you'd say that, Mr. Miller. Now, why don't you come on down to the station with us and answer a few routine questions? Oh, hey, I don't know nothing about this. That's what Mr. Nash said, but you can see what a liar he turned out to be. We went back to the precinct, and the garage owner was held for questioning. In the meantime, two men were sent to the home of William Nash, and the phone tapped. Two other men took their places on a stakeout at the Red Dot Inn, another pair at the garage. The garage owner was cleared of any suspicion and told to go back to work, but warned not to say anything. About four in the afternoon, a call came over the hot shot at the 5th Precinct. My name is Barton. I've just been robbed. Where are you calling from? I own the Rome Jewelry Store. Three men came in and tied us all up. They stole over $100,000 in gems. Anyone hurt? My clerk. He's still unconscious. All right. What's the address? The corner of Wilmot and 21st Street. It looked like just a routine robbery at the time, so the robbery detail took over. Walt released Nash and called the papers. Around 4.30, Walt got a call from robbery. Levinson. Jennings, Walt. Those guys are held up the jewelry store over on Wilmot Street. The owner just identified one of the holdup men, Tony Lugetti. Oh, thanks. Rick, Tony Lugetti, one of the guys that busted out with Baxter, has been identified as one of the holdup men in the jewelry store. Now it starts. The gang had gotten away clean. No trace except a cab driver who spotted a green sedan in front of the jewelry store. Three men in it. We waited. Levinson. Sullivan. Nash just got a phone call. Man said he wanted to see him for the payoff. Said to meet him at the place. Nash left the house. Fisher's tailing him. Right. Nash just left the house. Got a call. Let's go. We piled into the squad car and headed across town in the direction of Nash's house. The newsboy on the corner yelled the planted news of Nash's arrest, and the car radio told us what Nash was doing. Suspect just went into garage. We're parked across the street. Instructions. I'm about two blocks away. If he gets in his car, let me know. He's coming out, turning north on Chestnut. See him? There he is, Walt. We've got him, Jennings. We'll tail him. We followed Nash until he hit the outskirts of town. We drove for another good half hour, then pulled into a roadside eating place with a motel off to the left. Uh, this looks like it. Yeah, yeah. Drive past. We'll swing back. Nash is going into the diner. We'll walk up. Attention, all units. I'm at a roadside diner. The stop a while motel near it. Suspect just went into diner. All units proceed with caution. A whole bunch might be in that motel. Mm hmm. Hope the boys get here before things start popping. You said it. We can't go in. Hey, there's uh, Nash at the counter. See anyone else? Not from here. Let's walk over to the other side. Hey, Walt. What? Over there by the gas pump. Green sedan. You think it might be the robbery car? Uh, nobody in it. Look. Two guys coming out of the restroom. Yeah. 
And one of them, Tony Leggetti. Baxter's boys. I got a hunch Baxter's around. I got Tony's going in the diner. He's going in to pick up Nash. Probably going to take him for a ride. Let's take this guy before Leggetti comes out. He hears us. He's turning around. Police. He's going for a gun. <laughs> you knocked him cold. Nice tackle, Rick. Vassar, 28. Here's his gun. I'll dump him in the car. Here come some of the boys. I'll wave them off. You get in the back of the car. Okay, I'll get in with you. I wonder where Baxter is. Can you look out that back window without being seen? Yeah, yeah. Two more prowl cars pulled up. Mm, if the boys in the diner don't spot them. Nothing yet? No, no. Hey, here they come. The Gideon Nash? Yeah, holy cow, the whole bunch. Is Baxter with them? Yeah, and one, two, five others. They've spotted the cars. The head of this car. You go out that side, I'll go out this. You're boxed up, Baxter. Look out, Rick! Two of them them down. Baxter's heading around back. Rick, don't go after him alone, you crazy... Now he tells me. Stop, Baxter! You get him, Rick. Yeah, but just barely. That was my last shot. How was the dinner? Oh, if I'd eaten any more, I'd I'd need a new belt. (laughs) You got to tell me what you did all day and why you were so late? Mm, Went for a long walk in the park. Oh, that's what I love about you. Gone all day. Come in smelling like a shooting gallery until you tell me you went for a walk in the park. Oh, no. I get it. Yes? Oh, Rick, you gonna give me a routine or do you want to hear about Baxter? Oh, Harold Applenocker's tired. Let's have it. Well, Getty's dying in the hospital. Two of the other boys died on the way. The guy you tackled is singing all over the place and Baxter will have a quiet funeral tomorrow. The others we got locked up. Your boys all right? One of them got it in the leg. Otherwise, okay. You were right about the girl. Baxter killed her because he was afraid she'd talk. Seems she had a beef and walked out. Baxter got worried. Nash was to get his tonight, just like you figured. Okay, Walt, thanks. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And thanks, Rick. Sure. Well? Well? Wanting to know if his boys were all right. Now, Rick, you've been doing something exciting, and I want to know about it. Honest, baby, the park's very dull uh, in the afternoon. Want to go stir up some action in it now? Good move. Rick, why do you lie to me? Mm. Oh. All right, come on. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We're forgetting something. I got to sing a song first. Oh, Rick, now that you've brought it up, I want to go to the park. Well, this will only take a few seconds. You just pucker up and hold Well, 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 look who's here. I haven't seen you in many a year. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. Baked a cake, baked a cake. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do? Had you dropped me a letter, I'd have hired a band. Grandest band in the land. Had you dropped me a letter, I'd have hired a band. And spread the welcome mat for you. Now I don't know where you came. Came from, cause I don't know where you've been. But it really doesn't matter. Grab a chair and fill your platter and dig, dig, dig right in. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake, hired a band. Goodness sake, if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. How'd you do? How'd you do? How'd you do? Now I don't know where you came from, cause I don't know where you've been. But it really doesn't matter. Grab a chair and fill your platter and dig, dig, dig right in. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake, hired a band. Goodness sake, if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. How'd you do? How'd you do? How'd you do? Oh, how'd you do? How'd you do? How do you do? My house still puckered? Mm-hmm. Think you can hold it till we get to the park? Mm-hmm. Now, you see, if you're patient, I always make it up to you. You 
have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Lieutenant Levinson was played by Ed Begley. Also in the cast were Virginia Del Valle and Wilms Herbert. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards, and the entire production was under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Richard Diamond's Private Detective will next be heard two weeks from tonight. Check your local newspaper for the time of broadcast. Listen next week at this hour for Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, Soldier of Fortune. Remember, at this time next week, it's Dangerous Assignment on NBC. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us two weeks from tonight when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist, speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names, and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs in seconds. Its zippy, tangy quality leaves a happy aftertaste. For a reliable yet refreshing mouthwash, use Rexall MI-31. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Dick's special guest star tonight is... is, uh... Uh, What was your name again? I'm sorry, but I really can't tell you. You can't tell me. Well, Rexall brings you Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. Well, morning, Mr. Diamond. Morning, Charlie. Now, uh, fix me something, will you? Like that, huh? You look pretty good. Oh, you should have seen me when I got up. Both my heads were hissing each other. I'll fix you my special. You snap right out of it. Well, take it easy. I tried snapping out of it this morning and scattered myself all over the room. You relax for a minute. Just getting to work? Yeah. Helen gave a party last night. I think it turned out to be the finals of the roller derby. Have a swallow a roller skate, Charlie. Once on a dare, a mouse. Oh, Sorry. Charlie! Gotta mix it. Oh, that's a horrible machine to have in a bar. Some poor guy's liable to end up with shell shock. Here, hold your breath so you don't change your mind. What's in it? In your condition, that is a very touchy question. You just drink it, you'll feel better. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. No fudging all the way. Charlie! Uh, All the way? What are you, chicken? Oh... Oh, I knew it. I knew it. You snitched this stuff from a fire extinguisher. Tastes terrible, don't it? What are you going to thaw me out with, a chisel? Now I know it ain't that bad. No? A mortician would pay good money for the formula. Well, look what came in the front door. Hmm? Oh, yes, sir. Pardon me, but I'm looking for someone. There's nobody here but me and Mr. Diamond. Here's a picture of him. Has he been in here? Oh, lady, a lot of people come in here. No, I mean this morning. Mr. Diamond's my first customer. Oh. Uh, something wrong, miss? I've just got to find him. I don't know where to look. Oh, uh, what made you think he'd be in here? I'm trying every place that's open. I lost him in this block someplace. Lost him? Well, he... Well, he just disappeared. Uh, who is he? My husband. Oh. I stopped to look at some hats in a window... 
I started talking about how pretty they were, and the next thing I turned around and he was gone. You called home? We're living at a hotel. He hasn't shown up there. I, I've called everyone I know in New York. You're from out of town? Yes. Oh, I'm so worried. Well, honey, from this picture, your husband looks old enough to find his way around. Why don't you go on back to the hotel and... You the... don't understand. My husband had quite a shock earlier this morning, and he was acting strangely. So you figure he might have gone looking for a drink? I don't know what I thought. It isn't like him to wander off like that. I'm so worried. Well, if you're that upset, why don't you go to the law? Missing persons. Oh, I thought about that, but I can't. You can't go to the police? I can't explain why. It, it just wouldn't be good. Would you mind a completely new remark? What? Haven't I seen you before, Miss... Uh... No. Mm, nice name. Mr. Diamond sees a lot of people. Used to be a cop himself. Oh. Private detective now. Private detective? Seems to me I've seen your husband someplace before, too. Is this an old picture? Yes, I carry it around in my wallet. Are you really a private detective, Mr... Uh... Diamond, Miss... Like Sam Spade? Well, no, no. Sam drinks and runs around with women. I lead a rather sheltered life. <coughs> Steady, Charlie. Mr. Diamond, I'm really frightened. I'm sure something awful's happened to my husband. Will you help me? I might. If you tell me two things. What are they? Why you can't go to the police and if you can afford a hundred a day in expenses. Oh, I can afford the money. You should have answered the first question first. Now I'm almost tempted to forget the last one. But I can't go to the police. Uh, there. There, when people can't go to the police, it worries me. Your old man got a record or something? A record? Well, I've seen both of you someplace. You sure you aren't working some kind of a racket? Oh, 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 oh now, now, lady, take it easy. I lose my husband. I come in here for help, and you think I'm some sort of a criminal or something. Look, dear, I... I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't want to go to the police, and it has nothing to do with breaking the law. Shame on you, Diamond. Here, lady, here's a handkerchief. Thank you. Look, uh, I'm sorry. No, you're not. You're terrible. Oh, please, please. Look, I I'm in pretty bad shape myself. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll help you. Wonderful, Mr. Diamond. Where can we talk? Hey, she turns them off like a hydrant. You'll help me? Oh, yes. A hundred a day in expenses. Certainly. Get her. Yeah. You sure you didn't dip into one of Charlie's specials? I don't drink. This isn't drinking. It's like diving into an active volcano. Where can we talk? Uh, one of the booths. Good. I don't want anyone else to know about this. You mean after this build-up, I ain't gonna, even going to hear what it's all about? Come on, dear. Oh. Uh, relax, Charlie. Have one of your specials. Who knows? You may be the first one to reach the moon. Is this booth all right, Mr. Diamond? Uh, just fine. Now sit down, dear, and tell me all about it. Well, there's really not much to tell. I took my husband to the... Well, to an appointment this morning. What kind of an appointment? I can't tell you. And you can't tell me your husband's name? No. Not even his first name? Well, I... I guess I could tell you his first name. It's Richard. Richard? Yes. You can't tell me any more? No. You want me to find him and you want me to trust you? If you will. Will you trust me? Yes. Then I'll try and find Richard, but I'll need some help. I'll try. No, 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 please. I'll need some outside help. Who? A policeman. Oh, no, I told you. And I told you. You want me to trust you? Okay, that's what I'm going to do, but you've got to trust me, too. But the police... If you and your husband aren't in trouble with the police, you've got nothing to worry about. But the police... Not the police, a policeman. One man. But he'll find out why Richard disappeared. Well, don't you want to know why? I know why, but I don't want anyone else to know why. You don't want anyone else... You know why, but you... Oh, don't let me do this to myself. I just want to find him. Okay, okay. I promise the policeman won't say anything. I'm trusting that you have a good reason for not telling me any more than you have, but to find a man, this man in the picture, and an old photograph at that, to find this man needs a lot of doing. Checking hospitals. Hospitals? Now, don't start crying. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. When you've got to check hospitals, morgue... Morgue! Look, 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 dear. You wait here. Oh. No, I'm going with you. Good girl. Charlie, thank you for being so patient. A pleasure, miss... Shall we go, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, yeah. And Charlie? Yeah? I'd like to thank you, too. Anytime. Your hospitality and good manners are only equaled by your loyalty and perspicacity. Huh? All in all, you've been a living doll. <laughs>
Being a person who lives out in left field most of the time myself, I realized that these little disturbances in my life were pretty average. So with cute little anonymous tagging along behind, I left Charlie's fancy bistro and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and the good Lieutenant Levinson. When we walked into the squad room, we bumped right into the one thing that science had been working 24 hours a day to find a cure for. Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh, how are you, Diamond? Hey. Oh, unpucker, Otis. Mrs. X will think the lieutenant uses you to unstop sinks. Mrs. X? What kind of a name is that? You want to meet the lady? That's the name. Mrs. X? How do you do, Sergeant? Oh, <laughs> Hey, uh, ain't I seen you someplace before? Otis, haven't I seen you someplace before? Now, what are you talking about, Shama? Sure you've seen me before. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, but this is nothing. Stick around him for a whole day sometime. Come on, let's see the lieutenant. Uh, I'll see you later, Mrs. Oh, uh, uh, yes, Sergeant. It's been a pleasure. Otis. Yeah? Your eyes are hanging out so far they cover your badge. Oh, Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. I am... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is Mrs. X, Walt. Dear, this is the mighty arm of the law, Lieutenant Levinson. How do you do, Lieutenant? How do you do, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. X? Oh, let's not go into this thing again. The young lady prefers to be known as Mrs. X. Now, Walt, I want you to do me a favor. Yeah, a uh, young lady, uh, haven't I seen you someplace, someplace before? before? Yeah, Walt, even Otis is with us on that one. I said the same thing when she found me in Charlie's bar. Now, the young lady's lost her husband, and I'm going to help her find him. Here's his picture. See if you got anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you sure I haven't seen you? Walt, we'll solve that one later. The picture, go make like a policeman. Okay. She got a record? Lieutenant. Oh, uh, well, I, uh... I never forget her face. He's been trying to ever since he got Otis. Now, come on, Walt. Get a report from missing persons. Check the hospitals and the morgue. The morgue? Oh! Oh, lady, lady, please. It's a habit. Uh, honey, we got to do these things just in case. <laughs> but you think he's... Oh! Give me that picture. Lady, lady, please. Now, now, now. What's your husband's name? Uh, she can't tell you that, Walt. What do you mean she can't tell me that? I can't. Now, you look, Diamond, if this is one His of your... His first name is Richard. Richard, what? That's something I really can't tell you. I wouldn't have told Mr. Diamond the Richard part, but it just sort of slipped out. No way. What are you two trying to do to me? You come in here and ask me to locate this guy in the picture, and you won't even tell me his last name? Look, Walt, I promised you'd do me the favor without the question. The young lady seems to have a very good reason for not wanting to give her name or her husband's. Now, all I want you to do is check the morgues. Uh... What's the matter with her? She wants her husband. Yes, I want my husband. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. It's always a pleasure when a customer herself tells you why she likes your product. And last week, one said to me... You know why I really prefer Rexall Milk of Magnesia? It's because one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it, and then the next one thin and watery. Somehow, Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity, or it can't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by viscosity? It's the degree of thickness or pourability in a liquid. Rexall conducts scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall Milk of Magnesia to be sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity. And that's not done just to please you with its consistency. What's much more important... It means you'll always get uniform dosage from every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia. And I thought it was all an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. <laughs> Well, 
I checked, and no no one that looks like this guy is in any of the more, uh, usual places. Well, that's fine. Now let's start looking for him where I lost him, Mr. Diamond. Oh, swell. Well, Walt, we really just stopped by to say hello. Killing time, you know. Sure. I appreciate everything you've done, Captain. Lieutenant. Of course. Thank you very much. But now, Mr. Diamond and I have to go and find my husband. Richard. Yes. I think you'd better wait a few minutes. What for? Yes, we've got to hurry. I've got to find my husband before the 8 o'clock plane leaves this evening. You're leaving tonight? Who didn't tell me that? Well, Richard has to be in California by tomorrow morning. Got a little job to do? A very big job, Captain. Lieutenant. Well, what do you want us to wait for? Because I've got Otis checking on this girl, this Mrs. X. Oh, no. Walt, you promised. I promised nothing. You assume. Oh, you're a fine buddy. Buddy schmuddy. You might be taken in by her sweet innocence, but not me. You double-crossed Mr. It. Diamond, you promised. But I didn't, lady. I just checked the morgues. Uh... Oh, now you shut up. Walt. Well, I never... I've seen this girl someplace, Rick, and I've got a sneaking suspicion she's wanted. Wanted? You can't cross me like this, Fatty. Wanted? Won't tell me her name, huh? No. Won't tell me her husband's name, huh? No. Then you're hiding something. Yes. Yes? Why, yes, meaning of course. Now you stop that, Rick. Rick, is your name Richard, too, Mr. Diamond? No, my friends call me Rick. You ever in Chicago, lady? Of course. Of course? O-F-C-O-U-R-S-E. You meaning... stay out of this. You run around with Tony Capone when you were in Chicago? You talking to me? I'm talking to her. Well, I'm glad. Tony never gave me back my elk's tooth. Well, I don't know why you're talking to me, Captain. I never gave Mr. Capone an elk's no. tooth. No. It's Lieutenant there. You got to stop promoting him. You'll get a swell head. <laughs> oh, you rat! You call me Lieutenant? No! Uh, if, if, well, gee, don't scare me like that. I got something on this picture you gave me. Her husband? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. X. Hello, Corporal. <laughs> All this. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, you won't like it, Lieutenant. I won't like what? What I got on this picture. Something's happened to Richard. Now, take it easy. Well, what did you find out? I'll tell you whether I like it or not. Well, I sent it down to the boys in the morning. No! No! Uh... Oh, now, what you've done, you mallet head. Well, gee, what did I say? You said more! Uh... Now, honey, honey, listen. This morgue is where they keep photographs. Oh. Well, what did they come up with, Sergeant? I mean, she sure looks pretty when she cries like that. Oh, this. Uh, oh, oh, uh, well, I shall quote from the report. <clears throat> uh, person in said photograph resembles one Richard Diamond private detective. What did you say? Come to think of it, you do, Mr. Diamond. I shall continue. Member of the New York police force for seven years. Height six feet one. One hundred and ninety. Eighty. Uh, the general confirmation of the head. Note. Right ear... Order, shut up! Oh, it gets real interesting. You didn't tell me about getting mixed up with that fan dancer back in 39, Diamond. I was simply interested in starting an ostrich farm. Otis. Uh, yeah? Do you think that picture looks like Mr. Diamond? Oh, uh, kind of. Thank you, Patrolman Lovelo. Uh, Patrolman? Yes, and if I ever catch you wearing a sergeant's stripes again, I'll put you on a beach so far out that I'll have to fly food into you. Now get out of here. Sergeant Levinson. Lady, please, it's Lieutenant. Well, I don't care what it is. I think you were just horrible to that nice little policeman. Is that right? It certainly is. And I'm going to write a letter to the governor about you. Now, wait a and minute. And what's more, I'm going to tell him what a horrible, mean, impolite person you are. But... But... I come in here with Mr. Diamond, and simply because I won't tell you my name, you accuse me of being a mop. Mop? Yes, mop. One of those gangsters girls. Mop. Yes. And just because everyone thinks they've seen me before, I'm accused of all sorts of things. But lady, I... No telling what's happened to my poor, wonderful husband. Oh, 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 oh uh... lady, please, lady. Uh... <laughs> you big bully. Yes. Well, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Can Sergeant Loveloon have his stripes back? Yes. No, thank you very much. Come on, Mr. Diamond. We've got to find Richard. Goodbye, Major. Well, I was in it up to my neck. Any other time, a client like Mrs. X would have scared me right into four months of hibernation. But she was such a cute little screwball that I just had to go along with it. We took the picture that looked something like yours truly and started making the rounds. Starting with the last place Mrs. X had seen her husband... We showed the picture to every shop owner within a four-block circle, but no one had seen him. 
Mrs. X kept uh, checking with the hotel, making me stay at a good distance so I couldn't hear the conversation. But no one had seen her husband. We ended up right back where I first ran into her. Charlie's. Wow. Find him? No. Uh, look, dear, why don't you check again with this place that you and your husband went to this morning for his business appointment? Maybe you went back there. Well, I guess I could try it again. Phone in the back on the wall. Thanks. I'll call him. No luck, uh, Diamond? No. How do I get into these things, Charlie? When someone wants to give you a hundred a day in expenses, you get into them. Phone. Brilliant deduction. Hello? A little lady will get it. Mm. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? It's for you. Hopkins Levinson. You've been promoted? Several times in the last hour. You think he's heard something about Richard? He might be. Yeah. What is it, Fatty? I thought you might be there. What made you think of Charlie's? Oh, well, it's pretty obvious you had a hangover. Well, maybe I stuck a bicycle pump in my nose and pumped up my head just to get a laugh out of Otis. You'll have to do better than that. You told me you met the girl at Charlie's. Shrewd, shrewd. Is it something important? Honey, just relax. I'm getting to it. But if it's about Richard... The girl there? Yeah. What's on your mind? Well, I don't know if it means anything, but we just got a report from the Johnson Sanatorium. Johnson Sanatorium? Never heard of it. Over on 84th Street. The missing husband? I don't know. The report fitted his description, but who knows from that old photograph. Well, it's worth checking. What's the address? 644 East 84th Street. Seems they found this guy wandering around the streets. Johnson Sanatorium, 644 East 84th Street, huh? Did he give his name? Uh, amnesia. Loss of memory. Seemed to be suffering from shock. Thought I'd let you get there first. I'm kind of sorry for the girl when I realized the story might be kosher. Okay, Wall, well, I'll check it. Thanks. Meet you there. Well, honey, that might be... Hey. Hey. Charlie. Yeah? Mrs. X, where'd she go? Took out of here like she was shot out of a gun. Something wrong? When are you going to stop asking stupid questions? Well, that tore it. Mrs. X was probably on her way over to the Johnson Sanatorium and with a good head start. So I went out and grabbed a cab for 84th Street and kicked myself a dozen times for getting mixed up in a situation like that. Why not forget the whole thing and get some rest until my head returned to a normal circumference? Answer. Because I'd wasted the whole afternoon looking for the missing husband and hadn't even got a retainer. Yes, sir. Is there something I can do for you, Prince? I'm looking for the man you reported. As Hello, the... Rick. Oh, Walt. Have you seen Mrs. X? I just this minute got her. She's been and gone. What about the guy you got the report on? Took him with her. Uh, the young lady came in, took a look at the man, claimed it was her husband, paid his bill and left. You let him go like that? I thought the man had amnesia. Well, yes, he was suffering from some kind of shock and had temporarily lost his memory. But you just let him walk out of here Correct, with... Rick, Rick, let him finish your story. Hmm. Uh, the, the minute the man saw the young lady, he snapped right out of it. She said they had to hurry to catch a plane or something. Had a lot of packing to do. Did she uh, give her name? Yes, she, she signed the release. Uh, here, let me see it. And now, uh, take it easy, Rick. It's signed Mrs. Richard Diamond. She used my name? Is that your name? You're darn right it is. She leave any address? Phony, I checked. Oh, swell. I'll cover the airports if it'll make you happy. Oh, it'll make me very happy. She did nothing for my hangover. She didn't pay me one red cent for my trouble. And I think I may be getting hives. Oh, I'm going over to Helen's and have a complete nervous breakdown. How do you feel now? Oh, I'm all right, Helen, dear, but my ulcer's just had a parade. Any word from Walt? No. Miss Helen? Yes, what is it, Francis? A young lady at the door for Mr. Diamond. I'll get it. I'll bet you will. Wow. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Now, look, I've got something to say to you. I can't stop to talk. My husband's waiting in the car, and we have to catch a plane. Now, you look, I... I want to thank you very much for all you've done, and I want to apologize for running out on you. But your husband... He's fine, thank you. He just lost his memory for a while. Now, I'm not I haven't got time to tell you anymore. We've got to catch a plane. But you... Oh, I said that. Here's an envelope. But I... It explains everything, and there's something in it for you. But you can't... And here's something else, because you've been so wonderful. But... Hmm... I hope if you ever get to California, you'll look us up. Goodbye, and thank you again for everything. You're wonderful. Bye. Well. Hmm? All right, Blue Eyes, what was that all about? Hmm? Oh, no, that was her. Oh, she, the girl. 
The girl. Uh, uh, Mrs. X. What's that? Hmm? Oh, it's an envelope. Said it would explain everything. I hope it does. Especially that fond farewell. Oh, that. She was just being grateful. Yeah. Go on, open the envelope. Uh, pardon, Miss Helen. Now it's the phone. Lieutenant Levinson for Mr. Diamond. I better tell him about the girl. You'd better read what's in that envelope. Hello, Walt. Uh, Rank, that dame phoned on us, asked where she could find you. Oh, that's how she's found the place. Yeah, the melon had told her you might be over at Helen's. Gave her... She's been there? Uh, just left. And she left an envelope that she said would explain everything. Well, what did it say? I haven't read it. Well, read it. I want to know what this is all about. So does Helen. Well? Well? Five hundred bucks. The explanation? What about the letter? Well, it says, uh, uh, Dear Mr. Diamond, I know that I've caused you a great deal of trouble. So I wish to take this opportunity to... To thank you for your patience and understanding. As for an explanation, well, here it is. But I count on your discretion and hope that you will keep my secret. This morning, my husband and I went to a doctor because I hadn't been feeling well. We discovered and were overjoyed to find out that I was going to have a baby. Immediately, I informed my husband that I had decided to give up working until after I had the baby. The realization that I wasn't going to make any more money for the rest of the year was too much for him. The shock made him lose his mind, and he, well, he just wandered off. Although he has recovered his memory, the thought of having to support us both for the rest of the year has left him nervous and despondent. So I'm taking him back to the coast of the family psychiatrist. I wish to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your kindness and help. Signed, Oh. Signed, Ho. Rick! Helen, Helen, what's wrong? He's fainted. What? He looked at the signature on the letter and just flopped over. Well, what about the signature? It's signed, June Allison. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you have a headache, remember this about Rexall aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Yes, whenever you have a headache, remember that about Rexall aspirin. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember always... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. June Allison appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and will soon be seen co-starring with Dick Powell in the MGM motion picture Right Cross. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, and Bob Sweeney. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen, while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall MI-31, for example. 
America's popular all-round mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full strength MI-31 kills contacted germs in a matter of seconds, yet will not harm delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of MI-31 at the same price as smaller quantities of other leading brands. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. And now your Rexall family druggist brings you transcribed another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, if you have a little corpse in your home, swap it in for something useful. Mr. Diamond? Yes? I'd like to hire you, Mr. Diamond. Well, bless your little heart. One hundred a day in expenses. My name is Raymond R. Walter, an attorney at law. Would you mind coming right over to my office? Will you have a retainer ready? By the time you get here. Where is here? 758 East 45th Street. Just sign the check and I'll stamp in the amount with my track shoes. Then I can expect you. You could even clock me. Who knows? You may witness the first four-minute mile. I quickly bounded over to the sink, pulled out a bundle of soaking laundry, grabbed a straight razor that looked like it had been used to hack out shrapnel, applied the Brillo to my overnight beard, and 20 bloody strokes later, I observed myself in the mirror. Wounded, sire, but not dead. By 11 o'clock, I was standing in the reception office of Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law. I looked for the secretary, but none was to be seen. Then the door of Mr. Waldron's inner office opened, and a man about six feet tall, sporting a heavy black beard and thick horn-rimmed glasses, stood facing me. I suppose you're Mr. Waldron? Yes. Uh, Take this chair, if you will. Thank you. Now, uh, what's your trouble? Oh, not mine. My client's. You see, I'm supposed to give you $100 as a retainer until you speak with my client this evening. Uh, before you wave the bills around, tell me something about your client. My ethics get so double-jointed when someone shows me money. My client is a she. Hmm. Well, you certainly present the beginning of an interesting argument. Her name is Miss Mary Bellman. Miss? 28, blonde, showgirl. Very attractive. Hmm. Ah, uh, so she killed 30 members of the volunteer fire department. I like tough cases. She's in fear of a life, Mr. Diamond, and since I'm her attorney, she called me and asked me to hire a good detective. You said Miss Bellum was in fear of her life. Uh, somebody trying to kill her? I think it best to let Miss Bellman tell you. She has all the facts. Uh, here's her address, and here's your retainer. She expects you at eight. It was close to 12 when I got back to the office and spotted my landlord nailing up my door. His eyes dropped blushingly down to his waist when he saw the two months back rent in my hand, and he hurriedly explained his carpenter work on my door as a delayed April 1st joke. I paid him off as the last board fell and then left the building and went to my flat on 53rd Street to take it easy until that evening. By 7.30, I was dressed in my best suit, the gray one that stands out from the rest because the rest are one brown gabardine that even a starving moth would gag on. Suddenly, I remembered my dinner date with Helen... So I put in a fast call and told her butler, Francis, that I'd be a little late. Then promptly at 8 o'clock, I walked up to the door of Miss Mary Bellman, prospective client. Yes? Who is it? Uh, Richard Diamond. Oh. Come in. Have you got it? Well, I don't know. Got what? Look, how about the envelope, huh? Envelope? John said it would be in an envelope. But if you don't have it in an envelope, just kindly give it to me. Then I'll fix us a drink. Well, maybe you better fix the drink first. This is some kind of a joke. What's the matter? What are you doing here? Who? Oh! Everything happened so fast, I didn't even have time to guess what it was all about. Someone belted me with the Chrysler building, and I went down like a loose ski in the snow slide. As I hit the floor, I felt a pair of hands pull open my coat and relieve me of my 38. The floor fell away, and I dropped into a deep black pit that smelled something like a dirty carpet. When I finally came around, it was like squeezing myself out of a starch diving suit. I got my eyelids apart and 
There, standing in front of me, were two very good reasons for wanting to go right back to sleep. Oh. Oh, he's coming around, boss. Good. I want him to see it when I give it to him. Oh. Slap him around so he comes to in a hurry. Sure. Come on. Oh. Wake up. Wake right. up. You hear me? No, okay. Come on. Oh, sit up. All right. Oh. Oh, my head. It's going to be your stomach in a minute. Mm. Pull the slugs, you dirty, no good gum Oh, wow. Well. Oh, Louis Hall, huh? You slug me, Louis? Why'd you kill her? Huh, Shamus? Why? Why? Oh, what? Mary. Look at her, Shamus. Oh, where? Oh, holy smoke. Yeah. My pretty Mary. Tell me why you shot her, huh? You think I shot her? You're going to die anyway, Diamond. In a minute, I'm going to kill you. But I gotta know why you done it to Mary. What makes you think it was me? The shotgun, ain't it? You got an empty shoulder holster. Well, that's your gun, ain't it? Yeah. I... Sure. Well, this is a gun that shot Mary. One slug gone. See the slugs in her. Oh, you got the wrong boy, Hall. Oh, knock him off, boss. He's lying. He done it. Shut up. Oh, sure, sure. I killed the girl and slugged myself, hoping that someone would come in and pin it on me. Boss, I think you're the... Yeah. Anybody in there? What's that? The U.S. Marines. Keep it quiet. Okay, Otis, use your pass key. If that doesn't work, use your head. Lieutenant. Lieutenant, the cops. Come on, Tony, we're getting out of here. <laughs> Great, but what about the shamus? I don't want to knock you off if you didn't do it, Diamond, but I'm going to find out. Then maybe we talk more. Well, let's go, let's go. Right, out the back way. You mallet head, you've tried everything but your button hook. Well, I guess maybe we better bust it in, huh? Okay, give me a hand. Put your shoulder against the door. Now, one, two. Hello, Walter. Diamond, what are you doing here? I came to see a client. We got a report on the homicide. Where is it? In the other room. Take a look, Otis. Yes, sir. How did you get mixed up in this, Rick? That's a pretty good question. Lieutenant. Yeah? It's a dame. It's the dress and high heels. He spotted them right away. Who is she? Name's Mary Bellman. Hey, who called you to come over? I don't know, but we traced the call. It came from a phone booth right next door to this building. How long ago? 8.15. Right after I got slugged. You got slugged? Thoroughly. Otis, go call the coroner. Right. Let's see. One shot came right out between the shoulders. Yeah, when I came to, I could still smell cordite. Well, where's your gun, Rick? Well, right now, it's with Lewis Hall. Louis Hall, the gambler? Yeah, the guy who owns the Ace High Club. When I came to, Louis and one of his boys were getting ready to kill me for killing the girl. He waltzed out of here when you showed, took my gun with him. Maybe he knocked her off. Uh, Maybe. Anyway, I think whoever did it used my gun. I still don't see how you figure in this deal. Well, a character by the name of Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law, called and told me to come by and see my recently deceased client. Come on. Let's see what we can find out about a Mr. Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law. Well, I was in it up to my earlobes again. Walt had Otis put out a pickup on Lewis Hall and his torpedo. Then we climbed in the squad car and headed for the offices of Raymond Waldron. On the way over, I told Walt what had transpired since that morning. One, Waldron hiring me for Miss Bellman, saying he represented her. Two, seeing Mary Bellman in the strange way she had greeted me, as if she expected me to have an envelope for her. We got to the building, found the night watchman, went in, and in two minutes we were standing in front of the door marked 402. Isn't there usually a name on the door of an attorney's office? Uh, Usually. Maybe that's why I saw it there this afternoon. Now, uh, let us in, will you, Pop? (laughs) Sure, boy, but there ain't nothing to see. We know Mr. Waldron's not in, but we want to look around. (laughs) Sure, boy. (laughs) Yeah, look as much as you like. Reception room, boy. Where's the furniture? <laughs> Pretty dull looking, huh, boy? <laughs> uh, what about the inner office? Uh, no sense going in there. It's as naked as this. Well, it was all here this afternoon. Was there someone in this office this afternoon, Pop? <laughs> you think the boy's lying? <laughs> sure, like he said, some lawyer fella. Had all the furniture moved out, run out on a week's rent, too. Landlord's in an oxygen tent. (laughs) You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Brought to you by the makers of Rexall drug products and your Rexall family druggist. 
Right now, here's a lady with a problem for him. Every summer, it's the same thing. My children either eat their meals so fast or fill themselves with all kinds of cold drinks and hurry-up snacks. And then we have our usual siege of what I call summer stomachs. Well, ma'am, a lot of mothers have that same trouble. And a whole lot of them have solved it with Rexall Milk of Magnesia. Why, how's that? Well, it's a quick and effective way to neutralize excess acidity and a remarkably gentle laxative. What's more, because of its special formula and exceptional purity, Rexall Milk of Magnesia has almost none of that unpleasant, earthy taste. Well, say, the children will like that. And because it's Rexall, ma'am, you know it's laboratory tested. All you have to do is follow the tested instructions on the label. Well, from now on, I'm asking for Rexall Milk of Magnesia. At Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now, back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, Mr. Raymond, R. Waldron had skipped, furniture and all. We thanked Pop, went downstairs, climbed into the squad car, and Walt checked into the precinct. He put a tracer out on Waldron and learned that Lewis Hall and his henchmen were yet to be found. The coroner's report on the dead girl, Mary Bellman, confirmed the obvious. Death by a thirty-eight. The slug having been found in the wall. Ballistics had a full report and were waiting for the gun to show up. It was six to an even that Louis Hall still had it and that it was mine. On the way over to Hall's nightclub, Walt told me that Hall had been going with a girl named Willis, Jean Willis. And he was a little surprised when I told him of Hall's recent interest in the late Mary Bellman. It seemed that Jean Willis and Louis had been an item for nearly a year. In fact, she was working as a headliner in his nightclub. <laughs> What a dime. Yeah. Better not leave the doors open too long. The smoke will run out and the walls will fall down. I'm going to see what I can find out about Louis Hall, Rick. You want to try looking up Gene Willis? Meet you back at the bar. Rick, I'm on duty. Well, who said you got a drink? You've got on shoes, but you're not walking. No. A table, sir? No, thanks. Now, where can I find Gene Willis? Your friend? I might be. I'm afraid, Miss Willis. Oh, oh, my goodness. I dropped $10. So you did. It uh, looks a little messy. I uh, hate to see you dirty your hands, sir, so I just keep it and you can go wash up. The huh? uh, washroom's right next to Miss Willis' dressing room. Right down that hall. I'll see that you're decorated by the Department of Sanitation. Who are you? Name's Diamond, honey. I'm a private detective. Good for you. I hope you're happy in your work. Now beat it. I'm looking for Lewis Hall. He's out. Uh, down the street somewhere. Having your initials tattooed on the soles of his feet, no doubt. Look, wiseacre. Blow or I'll yell and have a couple of boys show you the fastest way out of here. Honey, before you do, I think there's something you ought to know. Yeah? What? You open that pretty mouth of yours and you may end up swallowing a fist. Oh, Yeah. You know a Mary Bellman? What? Know her? Yeah, she works here. She ain't showed up tonight. Something happened to her? What makes you say that? Wishful thinking. Oh. You used to be Louis Hall's girl, didn't you? Yeah, until she came along. Now, look, what is this? What's going on? What do you want Louis for? You really don't like Mary Bellman much, do you? I... Yeah. She's all right. What would you say if I told you someone put a bullet in her tonight? What? Where's Louis, Jean? Somebody took care of the little... Well, what do you know? Good. If Louis did it, I'm real happy. that he found out what kind of a... No. I don't know where Louis is, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Now get out of here. Okay, okay, but the law may be around to see you. Dandy, now beat it. Do me just one favor, will you, Jenny? What is it? Don't move. I want to remember you just as you are. Why, you crummy... You moved. Well, I went back to the bar just in time to see Walt look around the room like a shoplift on bargain day. Then he slipped the bartender a bill and downed a stiff belt with the speed of an alcoholic 30 seconds before prohibition was to set in. Good evening, Lieutenant. <laughs> 
That was a dirty trick. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw the girl. I got nothing but a fast shuffle. I couldn't find out anything about Haller's boy either. Now, get your breath and let's get back down to the station and think about this thing. Let's go. <laughs> Hi, you lieutenant. Hello, pink eyes. Huh? Oh. Anything on the dead girl? Uh, here's the report. Thanks. How are you, Shamus? Fine, notice, fine. Still under contract to the Museum of Natural History? That ain't very funny. Wait till they pick up your option and try to collect your head. Shut up, you two. Listen to this, Rick. This lab report says Mary Bellman was the one-time girlfriend of John Webb. Oh, the John Webb I sent up on an embezzlement rap eight years ago? The same. He got out a month ago. See, wasn't he suspected of being in on that Aetna payroll holdup? Yeah, but we never could prove that one on him. Mm. The dole was never recovered either. No, but the roll of bills and the dead girl's pocketbook checked with the numbers on the bills from that holdup. Walt, I'm getting an idea. When I sent Webb up, he was pretty unhappy. Made a lot of threats to me. You got the serial numbers from that holdup? Here's the whole list. Well, check him with this money. Your own doll? Okay, but I don't get it. Notice, did you find out anything on Raymond R. Waldron? Uh, the guy that was supposed to be the attorney? Yep. Uh, he ain't no attorney. He ain't even with the state bar, and I can't even find the Raymond R. Waldron in the phone book. Rick, where'd you get these bells? Huh? They check. You bet they do. Where'd you get them? Raymond R. Waldron. Gave them to me when he hired me. Oh, just go get a picture of John Webb. Right. You think Waldron and Webb are one and the same? Waldron had a beard and wore glasses. It's been eight years since I've seen Webb. Hey, it fits. If Webb is Waldron, he's got a motive. For one thing, he'd love to frame you. Yeah, but we're going to have a hard time proving Waldron is Webb without fingerprints. Not only that, we're going to have a hard time just finding him. Uh, here you are, Diamond. Thanks, Otis. Uh, give me a heavy lead pencil, Walt. Right here. Hmm? <laughs> Get him, some artist. <laughs> oh, shut up, Otis, shut up. Now, let's see. There's a beard. Put some glasses on him. Uh-huh. There you are. Well, Raymond R. Waldron. Or John Webb with glasses and a beard. I'll put out a gem. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Walt. I got an idea. Let's pull a real old stunt, huh? A real old stunt would be a cinch for us. Let the papers print a story that Mary Bellman is not dead. Webb must have made sure. Look, I didn't say that I was positive that Webb did the job. Louis Hall was standing with my gun in his hand. Gene Willis hated Mary Bellman for stealing her boy, Louis, and uh, we're loaded with suspects. Well, she did only have one bullet in her, and there is a possibility that she could have knocked herself off. Oh, stop sitting on your badge and call the papers. Say that Mary Bellman is in Bellevue in a serious condition. Due to an anonymous phone call, the police found her and rushed her to the hospital. I know, and she's expected to recover consciousness at any moment. Right. Uh, Otis, how would you look in a blonde wig? Huh? Come on, I'm going to put you to bed. Lieutenant! <coughs> Walt called in the reporters on the police beat and gave them the story. Then went over to Bellevue and set it up with the staff. All the rooms in one section of the second floor were emptied, and we took over 207. The boys came over from the station with the blonde wig, and Walt and I slapped it on Otis and tucked him away to go belly by. A screen was put up in the back of the room, and Walt and I sat down behind it to wait. I've got six of our boys dressed as interns on this floor, and a policewoman on the switchboard. McCarthy is making like the night physician. If anyone tries to see Mary... Bless her little heart. He's to show him up. Tell them they can't stay long. The minute anyone shows, they'll call us on... Oh, that might be it. Yeah? A girl, Lieutenant. Nice looking. Wearing a big mink and carrying a handbag. Right. Girl. Jean Willis. Might be. Be here in a second. Keep well behind this screen. You can only stay a minute. I'll be outside. Thanks, Doctor. Mary... She's digging into her handbag. Let's take her. What? what? Let's have the sister. Take your hands off of me. Hang on to her, Walt. What's the meaning of this? Ah, you hey. always carry a gun, Jean. She was going to kill me. Who's that? That ain't Mary. She was going to kill me, Lieutenant. Shut up, Otis, or I'll give her back the gun. You can't pin anything on me. I think we can, baby. Holy cow. More company. Yeah? You can't do this. Dear, shut up now. Yeah. Okay. 
More company? Yeah, Holman's gorillas. Said they were around. Louie. Oh, no. Honey, I no. warned you. Keep it down, no. lady. I won't let him get caught. I don't want him to get caught. Shut her up. I don't want him to get caught. Sorry, baby. honey, but I, I have to. I don't want him to, to get caught. <sighs> okay. <sighs> lift her over behind the screen. All right. Yeah. There, there. All right, let me back there. Shh. Who's making noise? You can only stay a minute. Okay, Doc. You stay out here, Tony. Right, boy. Mary. <laughs> Mary, baby. I'll get the guy who done this. All right, Louie. Who's there? The police, and you're covered. Okay. Try anything, and the guy in the bed will start shooting. The guy in the... A frame. Give me your gun. Then, Mary, she's... She's... She's really dead, Louie. I guess maybe I wish too much. I ain't smart. Here's your gun, Shamus. You had the right gun, all right, but the wrong boy. Here, Walt, give it the ballistics. We got Jean Willis over behind that screen. She came up here with some crazy idea of protecting you. Janie, she think I done it. Yeah, the crazy kid, she ain't got no... It's getting crowded. Yeah? What's going on? Trying to run down a killer, Louie. Okay. A guy just came in. Mm, wearing a beard? No, he asked what room Mary Bellman was in and then left some flowers, walked out. Uh, oh. oh, we better get that girl out of here. Get her out in the hall. All right. Come on, honey. Eloy. Oh, yeah. Eloy, I didn't mean to... I'll talk. give you a hand, Lieutenant. Hey, Lieutenant. The fire escape. Somebody out there. Oh, Louie, I only wanted to help you. I... Quiet. Don't honey. move, anybody. Maybe without the light, he won't see us. Look out. He's going to shoot from there. Get that light. Who got it? I didn't even have it, time to get my gun out. I, I didn't. I was too scared. Well, I thought he'd at least get in a rum. Lieutenant, you okay? Yeah. Keep everybody out of here. Where'd you get the other gun, Louie? I only give you yours. Remember, Shamus? Let's have that one, Louie. I done what I said I was going to do. I don't know who the guy is, but I guess he's the one to kill Mary. Can you see the guy, Rick? Is it Webb? Yeah. Alias Raymond R. Walton, attorney at law and very dead. Hmm. New outfit, Helen, baby? Uh huh. You like it? Make a silkworm lose his mind. <laughs> I fix some sandwiches. Thought you could eat them in here in the study. Oh, beats the kitchen. How can I see what I'm eating? A moth would crack up if he had to land by one lousy candle. Thought it was kind of romantic. Soft lights, music. Oh, honey, honey, honey. My rear old stomach has been neglected all day. Food should make it happy. I hope so. Hard day. Yes. Mm, what's this? Mm. Oh, very toothy. Peanut butter and caviar. You, you make them? Of course. No... Yes? Walt, Helen, right there. Feeding his face. Wait a minute, Walt. No. Here's the way it breaks down. Walter or Webb decided to kill three birds with one stone. Oh, the big pig. He wanted you for sending him up. He wanted Mary Bellman because she was blackmailing him. Seems she threatened to tell the police that he was the one who got that payroll. Oh, that's why she asked for an envelope. She thought I was bringing the payoff. Yeah. Well, Louis Hall was the third bird... For stealing Webb's girl while he was doing time. That's it. You've been a living doll. What do you eat? I think this one's cheese and liverwurst. <laughs> How are you going to sing? I haven't thought about it. Me, 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 me. <laughs> You'll never make it. Don't bet on it. I will bet on it, a double sawbuck. I know you haven't got it, but you're on. hoop de doo hoop de doo I hear a poker and my troubles are through. Hoop de do, hoop de dee. This kind of music is like heaven to me. Hoop de do, hoop de do. It's got me higher than a kite. Hand me down my soup and fish. I am gonna get my wish. Hoop de do in it tonight. When there's a trombone playing, I get a thrill. I always will When there's a concertina I always smile 
Cause that's my style When there's a fiddle in the middle And it really is a riddle Plays the tune so sweet that I could die Lead me to the floor And hear me yell for more Cause I'm a hoop-de-doin' kind of guy Hoop-de-doo Hoop-de-doo I hear a polka and my troubles are through hoop de do hoop de dee This kind of music is like heaven to me hoop de do hoop de do It's got me higher than a car Hand me down my soup and fish I am gonna get my wish hoop de do in it tonight Now, honey, doing that phone. All right, Fatty, what do you got to say now? Didn't think I could sing with a mouthful of liverwurst. It was worth the 20. I bet you feel awful. No, but I'm sure glad I wasn't eating spaghetti. Why? Well, I strained so much on that last note, I would have knitted a T-shirt for my tonsils. Dick Powell will be back in just a moment. And now, once more, here's your Rexall family druggist. It's the time of year for a friendly warning about sunburn. Remember that overexposure may cause serious and painful burns. But in case you do get a sunburn, I want you to know about Rexall Gypsy Cream. You'll actually be amazed at the immediate cooling, soothing relief you get with Rexall Gypsy Cream. And what's more, it's not a messy ointment, but a quick-drying, greaseless liquid. Easy to apply, harmless to close. Ask for Rexall Gypsy Cream at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. <whistles> Ladies and gentlemen, last year a great part of America's security went up in smoke. When traveling this summer, you can guard against forest fires by following these few simple rules. Crush out all cigarette, cigar, and pipe ashes. Break matches in two before throwing them away. Drown all campfires twice before leaving them. And always find out the law before using fire in wooded areas. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Good night, everyone. This program was transcribed. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and put the orange and blue Rexall sign on our windows. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall drug company. A good example of their quality is Bismarex, Rexall's popular antacid. Bismarex often relieves acid stomach within one minute. And because its scientifically balanced ingredients vary in the time it takes them to dissolve in the stomach, the relief they give is not only quick, but continuous and prolonged. Quality like that of Bismarex is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Come in. Uh, You, Mr. Richard Diamond? That's right, but keep it quiet and we'll split the reward. Well, my name is Tobias P. Briggs. 
He ducked as he edged through the door. If he hadn't, he'd have taken the whole wall with him. Nearly seven feet, going up with a pair of shoulders that made King Kong look like a before picture for dynamic tension. But being a guy who lives dangerously, I shook his hand, made a mental note to pick up my scattered knuckles, and offered him a chair. Thank you. Mr. Diamond, how much would it cost for you to help me? Well, I usually break my back for a hundred a day in expenses. Oh, that's a lot of money. I break a lot of back. Let's talk some more, though. Guys your size usually don't need help. Well, I got the money. Been saving. You see, I wrestled two, maybe three times a week at the Universal Arena. I promised Mike I'd put one purse a week in the bank. He was saving, too. Who's Mike? Mike Burton. He's dead, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Toby. Who was Mike? Well, Mike and me was buddies from the Army. He was a great guy, Mr. Diamond. A real great guy. What happened to him? Mike drove a truck for an outfit here in town. Cross State Trucking Company. We had enough money saved, we were going to get our own truck. Maybe two trucks. Do our own hauling. Be in business for ourselves, you know. Last week, he was fixing a flat on the highway at night. The car hit him and took off. Oh, hit and run, huh? Well, it's a lousy deal, Toby, and I know what you're leading up to. But the police will hunt the guy down sooner or later. I don't handle traffic accidents. Mr. Diamond, I feel maybe it was no accident. Oh? Well, then keep going. Well, last week, night before it happened... Mike says to me, Toby boy, I got a hunch we're going into business real quick now. He said we might be able to buy our first truck right after his next haul. Mike knew we didn't have that kind of dough ready. What did he say when you reminded him? He gave me a wink and a punch in the arm. You know, like guys do sometimes. Mm -hmm. He's a great guy, Mr. Diamond. Oh, well, I see. Now look, Toby, the afternoon's pretty well shot anyway. I'll poke around town a little, and if I can find anything to back up your suspicions, I'll take the case. If not... You owe me two tickets to your next match. Is it a deal? Yeah, sure. But tell me right away if you know something, huh? I'm in the gym every morning right behind the Universal Sports Arena, 8th Avenue. You know where it is. Oh, sure, sure, yes. Some of my best muscles grew up there. So long, Toby. So long. When he walked out, the office seemed to shrink back to normal. I counted my fingers, picked the one of the most circulation in it, and put it to work dialing Helen's number. I told her I might be late for dinner threw her a kiss over the pipe, closed the office, and headed to the 5th Precinct Police Station and Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Walt was out of his office, but the king of the jungle, Sergeant Otis, was plopped in his chair. Number 14's crossed and resting on the desk like he was expecting a promotion. Hello, Shamus. You know, for a guy who don't work here, you certainly hang around a lot. I could say the same for you, Otis. Where's the lieutenant? He ain't here. No. Well, he ain't. Isn't. Okay, he isn't. And you isn't as smart as you think you is. Oh, hello, Rick. What's up? Oh, hiya, Walt. Nothing, probably. But I'd appreciate a look-see at the hit-and-run files for the last week. Might be a case. Oh, now it's traffic accidents. Diamond, is there anything you won't do for a buck? Sergeant, ask me for the next dance and you'll find out. All right, cut it uh, out, you two. Uh, here you are, Rick. Take this note to Sergeant for our hit-and-run felony detail. It's down at the end of the hall. Thanks, Walt. You bet. Otis. Yeah? Sergeant Otis, do you mind if I sit down now? Oh, 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 yes, sir. Uh, sorry, Lieutenant. Farrar in Hit and Run gave me the case folder on Mike Burton. Except for a few details, nothing different than Toby's story. Only witness to the supposed accident was a man named Roy Cooley, Mike's driving partner. He had made the identification on the car when the police found it deserted the next day. A quick check on the license had shown it to be stolen. So another lead went down the drain. Only the fact that it had been stolen made me think that Toby might have been right when he said it wasn't an accident. I hit the street and grabbed a cab for the cross-state trucking company. From outside the wire fence, there wasn't much to see. A long line of diesel trucks parked side by side. I spotted something that looked like an office and went in. There was a girl inside. No, oh, maybe not just a girl. She parked her bubble gum and gave her blonde upsweep of hat. Can I help you? Well, if you couldn't, I'd kill myself. Listen, mister, if you've got some business here, you uh, better... Honey, honey, mm -hmm. I'm looking for Roy Cooley. Know him? That's a good one. Mr. Cooley's my boss. Believe me, I know him. He's not around right now. Cooley's your boss? Well, if you don't mind, I'll wait. What company are you with, Mr. Uh, uh, Diamond. Mm. Richard. I am, you should excuse the expression, a private detective. A private eye? Gee, I never met a private eye before. 
I thought it was just a kind of story thing. Well, it is, in a way. Uh, my name's Patty. For Patricia. I'm sort of a bookkeeper stenographer around here. Sounds like a big job for just one pretty girl. Oh, you're just saying that. I really was lucky to get such a job, especially when I had no experience. Just one week out of business school and Papa, I go to work for a big company at 65 a week. Hmm. And what is the secret of your success, Miss Carnegie? My second name's Jablonski, Patty Jablonski. Mm. Between you and me, Mr. Diamond, the job's a snap. See all those trucks out there? Well, mostly they just sit like that. We don't make more than ten shipments a week. You know something? The company's been in the red the whole six months I've been here. Really? Mm. Well, I like it here. I can dress kind of casual, sweaters and things. Yeah. Uh, tell me, dear, uh, did you know Mike Burton? Gee, I sure did. Did you know him? Mm-hmm. How come the boss, Roy Cooley, was driving with Mike the night it happened? He was, wasn't he? Well, I guess that's because Tim Lasko quit a couple of days before. Tim used to be Mike's regular wheel buddy. Mr. Cooley was filling in, I guess. Any idea why Tim Lasko quit? Search me. In times like these, when a guy with five kids quits his job, he must have had a good reason. You wouldn't have Tim's address lying around anywhere, would you? Right on my desk. I mail in his last checkout. I wrote down Lasko's address and paid her off with a few compliments before I left. Tim Lasko's place seemed like the next stop until I saw a couple of warehousemen loading crates into one of the trucks. The crates were marked sporting goods in a big black stencil. And just to keep busy, I found a piece of scratch paper and took down the address they were being shipped to. About that time, a hairy hand reached over my shoulder and made crumpled spitball out of my manuscript. I did a slow turn and saw that the hand was connected to a beer barrel with legs. It talked, too. Looking for something, mister? Who are you? I'm the boss, Cooley. Oh, well, my name's Diamond. The, the union... You can forget to... that routine. I spoke to the union guys three days ago. Beat it, scram. Oh. How come you were driving with Mike Burton the night he was killed? Mister, you're asking for it. There's a little sign on the front gate you can read on the way out about trespasses. This is private property. Now, are you going or do I call some of the boys? <laughs> It hurt me to admit that he had the law on his side, not to mention the lump under his jacket from what was probably the new look and shoulder holsters. I figured to do better after a talk with Tim Lasko. Twenty minutes later, I was climbing the stairs of a brownstone in Washington Heights. The Laskos lived on the third floor. I straightened my tie and put my best finger forward. Yes? Oh, uh, hello. I'm looking for Tim Lasko. Oh, come right in. My husband is shaving. Who is it, Mary? Amanda, see you, Tim. Okay. All right. Excuse me. Call me shaving. Sit down. Thank you. Tim, you used to ride with Mike Burton, didn't you? Hey, who are you? What do you want here? Well, I'm a private detective. Name's Diamond. Uh, now, Mr. Diamond, or whoever you are, uh, I don't know nothing. Nothing you hear. Leave my family and me alone. Will you go away? Please, go away. Why did you quit the cross-state trucking outfit? Honest, Diamond, I, I don't know nothing. Look, I've been a truck driver for 15 years. I didn't like Cooley's outfit. Uh, uh, most of the work is at night. Too many long hauls out west. I didn't like the job. Uh-uh, Tim. Won't buy it. Diamond, try to understand, will you? I got five kids. Give me a break, will you? There was no sense going around again. I told him I'd be back, which he took about as gracefully as a guy learning he had leprosy, so I left. I rode downtown, squatted on a stool in a coffee shop with a good view of the cross-state warehouse. The coffee shop had a waitress who was as ugly as the warehouse. Got a 75-cent dinner special. You interested? Mm-mm. I, uh... Oh, I'll have a little coffee and... A lot of donuts. Oh, well, then coffee and conversation. Is there any chance of you taking me away from all this? Uh, it wouldn't work out. I drink. I'll reform you. Want cream? No. One black. How come you're staring at that warehouse instead of me? Want to give me a complex? Now, did I say a dirty word? We kicked it around until the warehouse was empty, except for a muscle-bound night watchman who chained smoke behind the front gate. It was a short walk to the fence behind the loading dock. A garbage can and some fancy scrambling helped me over. And then I squirreled under the line of trucks until I reached the one they'd loaded that afternoon. The crates were nailed tight, and it took a lot of scratching and pulling before I wedged one open. About then, I heard three pairs of feet echoing down the loading platform. I ducked out of the truck, but that half-open crate must have missed me after all the time we'd spent together because it spilled over and turned loose a shower of baseball bats. 
I grabbed one since it seemed like a good idea and snuggled up against the huge tires under the truck. Who's there? Hey, Red, you let anyone in? Not me, boy. Whoever you are, Buster, you better come out with your hands up. We got guns. Okay, Red, you and Harry stay out in front of the trucks. So I'll go coax our visitor out. He was poking around gun first in each truck and then around it. Sooner or later, he was going to reach my truck. So I sprinted across an open ten yards until I got into a friendly shot of the next truck in line. All right, stay where you are. I can see you. He was lying, and I knew it because I couldn't even see myself. There were three more trucks ahead of me, three more open spaces. Then I'd be at the back fence. I closed my mouth so my teeth wouldn't shine like a beaver at a dentist convention and moved. I reached the last truck and waited. The glint of his gun barrel kept coming at me like a one-eyed cat. I held the bat ready. It must have been a well-balanced hunk of wood because it felt like a feather in my fist. The bat cracked wide open like an overboiled hot dog, but it stretched coolly out. I didn't wait for the others to find out what happened, but I took off over that back fence like a kangaroo with his tail on fire. Once I made the street, I caught a cruising cab and relaxed until my breath caught up with me. The broken bat handle was still in my hand. I was about to chalk it up as an inferior bat until a closer look changed my mind. The inside of the bat was as hollow as a politician's promise, and it wasn't for ventilation. It was there to hide something, something that had to be hidden. You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, brought to you by the makers of Rexall drug products and your Rexall family druggist. And here he is. A lot of people think that during the summer they don't need to worry about the dangers of vitamin deficiency. But the truth is, vitamin deficiency is no respecter of seasons. You mean we're just as likely to be low on vitamins during the summer as any other time? Exactly, ma'am. And that's why I tell my customers to continue supplementing their daily diet with Rexall plenamins. Plenum, what? Plenamins. Rexall's famous multivitamin capsules. You see, ma'am, just two plenamin capsules a day give you more than your daily minimum requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established. Say, that's really vitamin protection. But that's not all. Plenamins also give you valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other factors of the vitamin B complex. Oh, gee, they sound expensive. On the contrary... Plenamins cost you only pennies a day. But most important, Plenamins wear the Rexall label, and you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. So I had the stump of a hollow baseball bat in my hand and a half dozen theories about why it was hollow. But none of my theories proved any connection between a phony trucking outfit and Mike Burton being killed by a hit-and-run driver. I put the bat under lock and key in my office desk, then stopped at the Hall of Records where Pop McIntyre handles the night watchman chores. Under registered corporations, I found the Cross State Trucking Company and the up-to-now unknown name of Harry Fenner listed as its head. I thanked Pop, then went across town to check through the newspaper morgue at the Tribune. It was an all-night job because I had to dig back to 1926 before the name of Harry Fenner sprang off the yellow pages. He used to be a small-time bootlegger, but I couldn't hold that against him. Some of the biggest bootleggers had gone straight and become used car salesmen. I had breakfast before dropping in at the Universal Gym to see Toby. The king-sized client of mine was being mauled in the center of the ring while a chunky little guy in a black beret was hopping around full of advice. Oh, You're wrestling with King Kong Rabinowitz, not Snow White. Use your knees on his nose, on his nose. Okay. How's this? Oh. No, don't overdo it. You hide his face from the television camera too long. What's the good if no one hey. sees him suffer? Hey, uh, Toby. Oh, I am, Mr. Diamond. Hey, Ziggy, will be back in a minute. I know you're busy, Toby, so I won't waste time. You found out something about Mike, didn't you? I was right, huh? Well, let's just say that I'm taking the case. Toby, now think hard. 
Did Mike ever say anything about baseball bats? Anything. Baseball bat? Yeah. Mm. Sunday before Mike was killed. Yeah, he said something kind of funny. He said maybe he'd hit a home run pretty soon. And Mike never played baseball. Oh. Toby, when you get through here, meet me in my office. I'll tell you what I've got, and we can take it from there. Okay. See you soon. Good afternoon, Mr. Diamond. My name is, uh, Harry Fenner. Oh. Well, who are those two bullet-headed characters with you? They're my business associates. Well, you must be in a rotten business. How'd you get in here? I just had the exterminators over last week. Oh, well, I'm afraid I owe you for a new lock. I'll just add it to the retainer I'm going to pay you. Oh, you're going to hire me? I have here $500, which I place on your desk. Earning it will be easy. Under whose nails do I put the bamboo splints? I hope your good humor continues. Uh, the fact is, Diamond, I collect odd things, like antique furniture, marine life specimens, and uh, old bat handles. Someone stole one of my old bat handles. <laughs> Money's yours if you can locate it. Something like that would be worth more than money to me. An old bat handle would go just right with my collection of old saxophone reeds and croquet mallets. Is that your polite way of saying no? No, it's my impolite way of saying that a certain bat handle is going to win you the hottest seat in Sing Sing. And if you think I'm bluffing, let's see what they think down at the fifth person. Put down that phone. Ooh. He cracked me across the knuckles with a cane he was carrying, and my left hand took the day off. Then Fenner turned to his two happiness boys. Gentlemen, Mr. Diamond is stubborn. Unstubborn him. His two blood collectors came after me like there was a shortage of plasma. I dodged around the desk like a loose guinea pig in a biology class and finally managed to locate a stomach for my one good hand. I sunk it in up to my charm bracelet. But before I could enjoy the reaction, a fistful of dimes creased the back of my head and I came apart. I don't know how long it was before my eyes unglued. I was on my back enjoying a bug's eye view of the ceiling, but that's all I was enjoying. My head felt like a yo-yo being worked by a guy with a DTs. And then something big leaned over me. Mr. Diamond? Hmm. Mr. Diamond, hmm? you oh. okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, dandy, dandy, dandy. Oh, Toby, if I felt any worse, I'd be dead. Well, that's too bad. It's a good thing I got here. Those guys are doing a swell job on you for real. Oh. Things came back into focus. Fenner's muscle men were draped over each other in the middle of the floor, quietly unconscious. It was becoming. I had to get pretty rough with him. It was two against one. Them and me, I mean. What's it all about, Mr. Diamond? I gave Toby a quick resume about Fenner, Cooley, and the phony trucking business, including the hollow bats. As he listened, I saw new muscles growing on his old ones. He wasn't interested in details. Mr. Diamond... Did this Fenner guy kill Mike? Well, Toby, I I think Mike found out that Fenner and Cooley were shipping hot goods, probably jewels in the hollow bats. If he did, I think maybe Fenner killed him. Mm -hmm. Where does this Fenner guy live? Well, wait a minute. It's here on my desk. I was just going to give it to the police when I was crudely interrupted. No, don't call the cops. Give me that address. Well, what's the idea, Toby? We've got the score. It's a cop's job now. No, I say no. This Fenner, he got lots of dough. If he did kill Mike, he gets a big lawyer and he goes free. I don't want that, Mr. Diamond. I'll find out. I tried to cool him down, keep him in the office. And then I found myself airborne. He bounced me against the wall and I decided not to do anything until the room stopped circuiting. Sorry about this, Mr. Diamond, because you're an all right guy. But don't try to stop me on this. I got up and weaved over to my desk, phoned Walt, and gave him Fenner's address in Long Island. Why should I meet you there? Murder, Walt, and bring some friends. Fenner's house was a big white colonial with high French windows looking out on a big garden. The windows were closer, so I moved up and looked in. The room was a library, or what was left of it. Toby had torn it apart and was now concentrating on Fenner. He had him backed up against a tall bookcase, holding him by the front of his smoking jacket. High enough so Fenner's toes pointed down, trying to touch the carpet a good foot beneath. Toby had the jacket pulled tightly around Fenner's throat, and Fenner was trying for the $64 breath. Hey, what you kill him for? Yeah. Yeah. What you kill him for? Hey, Toby! Hey. Toby, let him go! Oh, he's gonna tell me. 
You say that. Uh, He's going to tell me or I break his fat neck. He's too choked up, Toby. Couldn't answer you if you wanted to. Now let him down. Let him down. Okay. Now talk, fucker. Talk. Diamond. Diamond, get this maniac away from me. Well, ask me something simple, like moving the Empire State Building. You better talk, Feather. I, I, I don't know what you want. You're a liar. No, 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 you're not. All right, all right. That's better. No. Why'd you kill Mike? He was, he was loading some of the bats. When one broke open and... Come on. Oh, yeah. The diamond spilled out. You wanted, you wanted a cut. Big cut. So, so I had Cooley make the last trip with him. I was following in a hot car. That's it. Now let me go, will you? Kill a nice guy like that. He would have framed me. You're a liar. Now I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Toby! Toby! <laughs> Toby grabbed Fenner and I grabbed Toby. But it was like trying to put the brakes on a charging elephant. Toby hung on to Fenner's throat and shook me loose. Fenner was dying fast. And it looked like I couldn't do much about it until the door opened and trouble sneaked in from left field. Cooley. Break it up! Break it up! Cooley! Cooley, help me. Help me. You better relax, Toby. That gun in Mr. Cooley's hand gives him the floor. He's the other one, ain't he, Mr. Diamond? Cooley. Cooley, give it to him. Right in the middle. And then I heard the heavenly sound of flat feet. Cooley half turned for a moment, but it was enough for me to push Toby behind the couch and dive in after him. Quick! Cooley, let him have it. Cooley spun back around and tried his luck anyway, but missed. He and Finner made a rush to the window, but some of Walt's men were waiting for them. They tried to shoot it out. Ah! Cooley never got more than one foot over the windowsill. Fenner did better, but he was dead when he hit the ground. Rick, are you all right, Rick? Oh, if it wasn't, you'd never hear the end of it. Mr. Diamond, you don't really believe what that punk said about Mike, do you? Mike was a straight guy all his life. Toby, this clean-cut gentleman standing right next to me is Lieutenant Walter Levinson of Homicide. Oh, right. Ah. What I tell him is official, so you listen. Look, Walt, Fenner and Cooley were part of a fence setup. Bought stolen goods, sold them out west. The cross-state trucking company was just a blind. Well, that just about cleans it up, Toby. You see, Mike probably suspected something, and they were afraid he'd go to the police. That's why they killed him. Sure, I knew it was that way. Thanks, Mr. Diamond. Well... I'm going to get back to town. Ziggy's got me matched tonight. Good luck, Toby. Yeah, thanks. Say, uh, Mr. Diamond, I'd sure like to have you and the lieutenant come watch me wrestle tonight. Uh, thanks, Toby. Maybe some other time. Oh, it'll be a great show. Tonight's my turn to win. Yeah, well, we'll see. So long, Toby. So long. Um, Rack, yeah? that connection between Mike Burton and this racket didn't sound kosher. Uh, was that for the record? Uh, no, Walt. But Toby will never see the record. Oh, Helen, honey, please. Cut that Victrola off, will you? Rick. You still didn't tell me if Mike really intended to get mixed up with Fenner and Cooley. Well, he did. That's where he was getting the extra money he spoke about to Toby. Mm. Oh, excuse me. Rick, where are you going? I'm just going to shut this guy off. He's putting me to sleep. Oh, I suppose you could do better. Well, you think not? Honey, just sit on and listen to me. Mm. Pale hands I love. Beside the Shalimar uh-huh. Where are you now? Now tell me, honey, how do I raid alongside that suffering crooner on the record? That record happens to be an original release. The suffering crooner is Enrico Caruso. Oh, oh. Where does a guy go to slash his wrist? <laughs> Dick Powell will be back in just a moment. And now, once more, here's your Rexall family druggist. No faster-acting aspirin made. That's Rexall aspirin. Yes, when taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin contained in every Rexall aspirin tablet 
are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. So next time you have a headache, remember Rexall aspirin. There's no faster acting aspirin made. Ask for Rexall aspirin at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Ladies and gentlemen, for those who recognize it, the future is for sale. You can buy it now, today. You can buy it by saving. And there's no sure, more profitable means of saving than through the purchase of United States savings bonds. In the first place, United States saving bonds are safe, guaranteed to your country. Moreover, they put your saving dollars to work for you. For every $3 invested today in Class E bonds, you'll receive $4 back in just 10 years when the bonds mature. So make sure of the years ahead with United States Savings Bonds. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's script was written by Harold Jack Bloom and Joe Morheim. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. And this is Dick Powell asking you to listen in again next Wednesday at this same time when we do it all over again. Please listen in. I'm going to hit somebody on the head. Good night, everybody. You have just heard transcribe Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Family Druggist, speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names, and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company, like Rexall MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular and versatile mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs almost instantly, yet will not harm the delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Gee, Diamond, I'm sorry. Did I hurt you? Oh, no, 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 Seymour. I feel great. Oh. Who needs seats? Come to think of it, though, I might be more comfy down here if you'd lift this desk off my chest. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh. Uh, there you go. Oh, oh wow, well, thanks, thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean to knock you over. Oh, so forget it. Forget it. I, I enjoy having my chest crushed as much as the next guy. Okay. Now, the throw I'm going to show you now is called a Japanese shoulder throw. Uh, look, uh, Seymour, you've convinced me. Judo is a wonderful sport. I I didn't realize what I've been missing all these years. I, I, I love this sport, judo. Now, what'll it be, canasta or old maid? What? How about hopscotch? Oh, come on, come on. Uh, let me show you just one more throw, huh? Not even if it was with a beanbag. And hey, maybe some wrestling holes in. I know a lot of wrestling stuff. Must be some trick you'd like me to try. No, 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 Seymour. I, I, I really don't believe I... Well, come to think of it, yes, I... There is a wonderful little trick. Huh? You get yourself a nice long rope, throw it high up into the air... Yeah? And then real quick you climb way, way up to the top and just disappear. Oh, uh, that's nuts. Oh, I defeated it, huh? What? Well, no. Diamond Detective Agency, brains, experience, enthusiasm, delirium tremens. Rick, don't be so silly. I might have been a prospective client. Oh, hi, sweetie. Hi. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. But you'll have to admit, I, I have got brains and enthusiasm and good looks and a dynamic personality. And my father can beat up your father. Rick, you're incorrigible. 
No, I'm right here in New York. Oh, that's just dandy. Now, will you please tell me what we're doing tonight? Oh, that, honey, is a long story. I'm comfortable. Well, remember the day we walked into Gimbel's basement and I bumped into an old schoolmate of mine who was demonstrating barbells? <laughs> I remember how funny you looked when he goaded you into picking up that big weight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And how hysterical it was when he had to carry me upstairs to the chiropractor. I carried you just like a baby, too, didn't I? Who's that? Now, that's him, Muscles. He bicycled all the way over from Jersey just to tell me his ideas on self-defense. He bicycled? Oh, he was dressed for it. Top hat, tail, sneakers. Well, what are you talking about? One of his cleverest ideas was that I'd treat him to dinner tonight if he could knock me to the floor in less than 30 seconds. So? Gave him the battle of his life. Seven seconds. The point is, where can we eat where they'll poison his food? Hey, I heard that. It's all right, Seymour. You can order small helpings. Rick. Let's make it Leon's, baby. Okay? Must we? Will you be an angel and meet us at Leon's? I'll meet you at Leon's. Eight o'clock sharp. Rick, if you keep me waiting. If I keep you waiting, you have a lock of my hair. Eight o'clock. Sharp. Well, I'll see you at Leon's at eight o'clock, huh? I'll bring lots of money, because I'm a guy that can really eat. Oh, I'll bet you are. Well, if you arrive there before I do, Seymour... Starting on the ferns by the front door. Seymour was too stupid to go away mad, but at least he went away. I settled back in my chair and made a half-hearted attempt to figure a face out of the water spot on the ceiling. When I woke up, it was five o'clock, and I hated myself for the indulgence. As I sat there, thinking how much my mouth tasted like an old motorman's glove, I heard a noise in the hall on the other side of my door. Well, good afternoon. Something I can do for... <sighs> Juice bar. Juice bar. Hey. He fell face forward into the pool of blood at his feet, like a wino who'd stumbled into a fountain of muscatel. Funny, isn't it, how an ice pick loses all its homey appeal when it's sticking out of a guy's back? The ice pick this guy was wearing was no exception. I didn't know how long he'd been leaning against my door, but one thing was certain, it was long enough to die. I put in a call to 5th Precinct Police Headquarters and Lieutenant Levinson. And ten minutes later, my office was full of badges. And you have no idea who he is, huh, Rick? Not the Vegas, Walt. Well, the checkup shows you're the only office in the building that's been open after two. So he must have been on his way to see you when he got it from behind. Uh, maybe he was delivering ice and just happened to fall on his ice pick. Otis. Yeah. Otis, now that you've solved it, why don't you go down to the glue factory and let them put you up in nice little glass bottles? Oh. Well, anyway, here's a billfold in his pocket. That ought to tell us something. How about a look, Fatty? Huh? Oh. Oh, sure. Here. Hmm. Quite a card collector, wasn't he? Quite. Gold furriers, the copper room, O'Toole's diner. Lousy food. Got told me once from that cheesecake. I remember. I got told me just watching you eat it. I resent that. And I accept your apology. Yeah. Huh? Where's that green card from? This one? Yeah. Mm, the Apollo Health Club. Hey, that's right down the street. Nothing with the old boy's name on it, though. Afraid not. However, something tells me you'll get that from the old boy's fingerprints. Let's hope so. Afternoon to you, sir. Welcome to the Apollo Health Club. May I be of assistance? I'd like to get a massage. Splendid. <laughs> Performs wonders after a fatiguing day. A veritable balm to the chafe tissues of the body. But will it cure snow blindness? I beg your pardon? No, oh, just ignore me. I'm a little chewed up today. I assume you're referring to a state of mind. Well, not altogether. Got a kink at my back that isn't entirely metal. Well, at least you've come to the proper place. A measure of skillfully applied anatomical science will regenerate the damaged musculature in no time. O'Brien, Mr. O'Brien, front, please. One of my best masses. Oh, you're the owner, huh? <laughs> I am, sir. Let me introduce myself. Emerson Van Arthur, Doctor of Anatomical Science. Richard Down. A pleasure. A uh, nice layout you have here. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Five years of assiduous study in Switzerland under the illustrious Dr. Von Seppelville. Give me a boundless knowledge of the human mechanism. As a consequence, of course... Uh, Are you for me, Doctor? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Oh, by, oh, by all, I did. Uh, Mr. Diamond here wishes a massage. Sure, fine. I'll speak to you later, Mr. Diamond. I guess, sir. Remember, the blood toward the heart, always toward the heart. Well, 
A real private detective, huh? A too private, judging from last month's receipts. <laughs> hey, you know you really rubbed that kink out of my back? Good. Don't know if you noticed it, but I was doing all my rubbing with my right arm. Tore a muscle on my left shoulder this morning. Really put it out of commission. Oh, that's too bad. Speaking of things being out of commission reminds me. There's a body down at the morgue I'd like you to take a look at. Guy might have been a client of yours. Oh, what makes you think that? Had a card from the Apollo Club in his billfold. Oh? Uh, when could you come down? Uh, how about tonight? We close here at 10. Fine. Make it, uh, what about 10.30? Know where the morgue is? Yeah. Now, how'd this guy die, anyway? Somebody hit their ice pick in his spinal column. No, kidding. Yeah. The corpse is a little dark-complexioned man. Kinky hair, glasses, bald spot on the top of his head. Hey, that description fits a guy who comes in here every night around closing time. Fanatic on diet, he buys wheat germ from us for the case. Know his name or where he lives? Oh, I know that he's... Uh, pardon me, those gentlemen, but I'm afraid I'll have to ask Mr. O'Byron to hire you down to the gymnasium. Oh, sure, right away, sir. Uh, here's a fresh tom, Mr. Ben. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt like this, but we're a trifle under staff. The next the night in the evening rush is something of a problem. Well, all right. Talk to you later tonight, Mr. Diamond. All right. Oh, hey, in case you can't make it, give me a buzz at Leon's restaurant. I'll be there till a quarter of nine. Right. Ah, Monsieur Diamond. Hello. Hello. Hello, Leon. Parisi, Parisi. Which translated in English means? Right this way. <laughs> Both my guests arrived? Oui. First the young lady, then a few minutes later the uh, gymnast. Uh, but, uh, uh, Mr. Diamond, a telephone call is waiting for you. Oh, thanks, thanks, Leon. Hello, Diamond speaking. Hello, Mr. Diamond. This is Red O'Byron down at the Apollo Club. Oh, yeah, O'Byron. Hey, listen, you got to come down here right away. I really stumbled into something. Yeah? What's that? Can't tell you over the phone. Just get down here. Drop everything and get down here. Hurry! Look, uh, uh, Red, I'm right in the middle of the... Hello? 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 Oh. Hey, kids, I gotta run. Be back in a few minutes. Just where do you think you're going? Place called the Apollo Club. Yeah? Well, how about my dinner? Uh, go, go right ahead and order. I'll be back. Oh, uh, by the way, Seymour, that potato salad on the child's plate is a real deal for a quarter. And Helen? Yes, Rick? Shoot the kill if he even suggests wrestling. I walked out of Leon's, flagged down a cab, and spent the trip back to the Apollo Club, wondering what Red O'Byron was so worked up about and why he hung up on me. As my cab started to swing in toward the curb, I got that lousy feeling again, and I decided... Definitely, it was not one of Leon's martinis, but rather the large white ambulance parked in front of the Apollo Health Club. I was halfway up the steps of the club when Dr. Van Arter appeared in the doorway. Oh, oh good evening, Mr. Diamond. This, this is terrible, terrible. Well, what is? We, we've had an accident. Red O'Byron? Uh, yes. Oh, terrible. I, like losing a son. Losing? He's dead? Yes. He, he, he was performing a handstand on the rings in the gymnasium, and he slipped and fell. Walk his neck. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Last week, a customer told me that... Something I really like about Rexall Milk of Magnesia is that one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it. And the next one, thin and watery. Somehow, Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity, or it won't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by viscosity? Well, an easy definition would be the degree of thickness in a liquid. Now, Rexall scientists conduct scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall Milk of Magnesia to make sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity, because that's one big reason why you'll always get a uniform dosage from every bottle. Oh, and I thought it was all just an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact you can always depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. <laughs> 
tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, hello, Otis. Is the lieutenant around? Yeah, he's around, so what? Otis, did you ever think how silly you'd look hanging from your thumb? Ah, oh, go soak your head. You mean that's how you shrunk yours? Ooh. Well, now, isn't that a coincidence? Is it? I was just thinking how peaceful it is around the precincts when you're not. Yeah. You shut up, you. Uh, you tell him, Barry. How would you like to... I'd like a little information, if you don't mind. I'd like you to see what facts you can scare up on the guy who runs the Apollo Health Club. His name is Van Arthur. If I remember right, the stiff we hauled away in front of your office today had a card from the Apollo Club in his billfold. You remember right. And we found out his name was Rudy Lubin. Narcotics has a file on him that goes forever. How about the ice pick? Any fingerprints? None. Well, that's always a help. I should say. Personally, I think Otis did it. Think I did what? You see, Walter, typical pathological reaction. What do you mean? Oh, don't worry, Otis. We won't let them hang you, right, Walt? Right. Not as long as we have a rope and a tree. No. Hey, what's up? Who are you calling? Leon's restaurant. Ellen's over there breathing with a diaphragm. And Seymour. Oh, you don't know him, but he's carrying phone books apart. Good evening, Leon. Oh, hello, Leon. This is Richard Diamond. My friend's still there? We. Oui. They are waiting for you, no? They're waiting for me, yes. Let me speak to the noisy one with the biceps, will you? Oui, bien entendu. What's all this about? It's about a guy who got stabbed in front of my door. I'm a sore named old Byron who got his neck broken doing tricks on the rings and something that old Byron mentioned earlier. Hello, hello. Uh, Seymour? Where are you, anyway? We've been waiting an hour. That's not the point. The point is, I want you to listen to me. Could a guy do a handstand on the rings if he had a torn muscle in his shoulder? Are you kidding? I'm very serious. Heck no, he couldn't. It's impossible. Shoulder muscles are the ones that do all the work. Deltoids, trapezius, upper pecs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Look, Seymour, you got to do me a favor. Beat me in front of the Apollo Health Club as soon as you can get there. Well, how about your girlfriend? Tell her to wait there till I come for her. Oh, okay, then. Only, what are we going to do? Trap a murderer. <laughs> I hung up, assured Lieutenant Levinson that I was just going to do a little reconnaissance work and then left for the Apollo Club. Seymour was waiting when my cab drew up in front. I explained to him the part I wanted him to play. Just leave it to me. If this doctor's a phony, I'll find out for you. Let's go. <laughs> Hello again, Mr. Diamond. Doctor? I just talked to the O'Brien boys' family. Oh, it was heartrending, absolutely heartrending. I... <laughs> Almost broke down. No, you will before it's over. Hmm? I'd like you to meet a friend of mine, Seymour Caper. <laughs> a pleasure, sir. What do you say, Doc? Seymour's been having a little trouble with his chest lately. I told him you were a doctor of uh, uh, anatomical science. Yeah, and that you could undoubtedly do him some good. Very kind of you. There's something to do with my muscles here. You know anything about them? Muscles? So what an anatomical scientist knows most about them. Oh, swell, swell. The doctor studied all about muscles in Switzerland. Oh? Uh, just what seems to be the trouble. Well, here's the deal, Doc. It all started the other day when I was working out with my barbells. I was doing an exercise for my trapezius when all of a sudden I got a spasm in my tensor fascia. So I bent over to set the barbell down on the floor, and that's when the pain hit me. First in my pectoralis minor, then in my intercostals, and finally in my diaphragm. A kind of spasmodic contraction like when you get the hiccups. Only, no hiccups. You know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. A, a spasmodic contraction. Of the diaphragm. Yes. Only no hiccups. And then my abdominals began tightening until I could hardly expel my rib cage. Oh. That's when I called Diamond here. Uh, I see. Yes, yes, quite naturally. Uh, if you'll pardon me a moment, I'll see if I... Uh, can... Yeah, but wait a minute. I haven't told you about my rhomboids. His rhomboids seem to be completely out of whack. Thank you, pardon. Well, it must be either my rhomboids or my dorsal spinalis. Awful pain right between my shoulder blades. What do you figure it is, Doc? Well, actually, a hasty diagnosis isn't uh, feasible. Huh? I, I really couldn't... Oh, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, you just put your hand on my left rhomboid and feel how naughty it is, huh? Hey, left rhomboid. Yeah, go ahead, feel it. It's right under the middle of trapezius, Doc. You know where that is. Please, please, Seymour. Don't insult the doctor. Any old quack knows where that is. <laughs> yes, certainly. Middle trapezius. <laughs> oh, oh, great Scott. I'd almost forgotten I left a client under the sun lamp. <laughs> Pardon me, gentlemen. I'll be back in a, month, uh, a moment. Hmm. 
Have a hunch he's heading straight for an anatomy chart. Yeah, you're not kidding. That guy's as funny as the title he uses. Doctor of anatomical science, my gluteus. Mine too. Come on. I took Seymour by his rhomboid and led him out onto the street, down to the middle of the block and up three flights to my office. While I did my thinking, Seymour did his push-ups. Three hundred and two. Three hundred and three. Well, Seymour, we know three things. Oh, Byron couldn't have been exercising on the rings with an injured shoulder. Five right. And the doctor's a phony. Six right. Then the doctor is a, is a front for something that's important enough to kill people over. Three hundred and right eight. As a consequence, you and I are burglars. And right. what? Starting as soon as the Apollo Club closes. But you mean we're going to bust into the joint? We're going to bust into the joint or flatten your head in the attempt. Seymour, you opened that window beautifully. Uh, thanks. Remind me to autograph your biceps later. I, uh... This detective business is dangerous, ain't it? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. But think of the advantages. Long hours, no time for meals. And on a good day, a guy can pick up as high as two or three hundred bullets in his back. I don't like it. Go on, crawl in. Okay, okay. Don't push! I followed Seymour in, and we waited a minute for our eyes to get accustomed to the darkness. Then we moved cautiously down the stairway to the first floor... I had no idea what I was looking for, but Dr. Van Arthur's office was the first place where I tried to find it. I had a door's locked. You want it open? Well, of course I do, Seymour. Use your head. Okay. <laughs> Seymour would be pulling plywood out of his scalp for the next week, but it got us in. I took the place apart, but came up with a big fat nothing. So he left the office and headed down the hall toward the back of the building. Hey. Look. What's the matter? It's a fruit juice bar. Oh, boy, am I thirsty. Well, go mix yourself up a... Juice bar. Juice bar, that's it. Yeah, good stiff bell of celery juice. No, man. no, no. This is what the little man who was stabbed outside my office was gasping about when he died. A juice bar. Come on. Sure. Nothing but juice. Oh. I wonder what's in this cupboard under the counter. Is it locked? Yeah. Think you can pull it open? Uh, just watch me. Ah, uh, you see? Seymour. Yeah? Will you marry me? I'll give you a belt in a solar plexus. Later, huh? Right now, let's see what's in this cupboard. Uh, you got a match? I don't smoke. That's all right. I found one. Well, what do you know about that? Nothing but cans of wheat germ. Hey, uh, you know what that stuff is, don't you? I know that the masseur who got killed here told me that the guy who died in front of my office bought it up by the case. Hand me a can, will you? Sure. Here. This stuff is full of vitamins, you know. You want a handful? Oh, no, thanks. Yeah. Well, it must be some extra special brand. Never tasted anything like this before. Chew a little out of Seymour. We can dance to it. Hey. <laughs> Hey, that really hits the spot, man. Hey, you want to wrestle? Oh, quiet, Seymour. <laughs> you know, my boy, I can fly. Seymour. I can fly, tell you, see? Oh, man, do I ever love to fly. While Seymour stood there flapping his arms, I stuck my nose into the can he was holding. Uh-huh. Once you've smelled opium, you can always recognize the aroma, even when it's mixed with wheat jam. I was trying to decide what to do with Seymour when he slid slowly to the floor under the counter and rocked out. I loosened his collar and then started for a telephone. Leaving, Mr. Detective. Uh, wow, well, doctor, working late? <laughs> I'm glad I arrived in time to offer you a drink of fruit juice. Well, thanks loads, but I'm driving. Where you're going, Mr. Detective, the weather is too hot for driving. Now, isn't that a nasty thing for a guy who sticks ice picks in people to say? Oh. That was the most unpleasant experience, I assure you. It's just that Mr. Lubin began demanding a little too high a percentage for us to be my uh, health foods. He even went so far as to threaten me with exposure. So you grabbed up an ice pick from your juice bar and followed him out of the club. Mm -hmm. I doubt if he ever knew what hit him. Oh, I bet he had a hunch. Well, 
I, I perceive that you've sampled my wheat, sir. No, I opened a can or two. Personally, I never touched the stuff without bananas and cream. You've made the same unfortunate discovery the Red O'Byron made. Oh, that's why he called me at Leon. Yes, yeah. and that's also why I had to resort to the unsportsmanlike expedient of luring him to the balcony of the gymnasium and then pushing him over head first. I was about to call the doctor a particularly dirty name when Seymour's hulking shoulders loomed up behind the juice bar, not over three feet from where the doctor was standing. Doctor, you're wrong. Seymour is not a sissy. What? I don't think you could beat up Seymour with one hand. That's why. Mr. Diamond, I'm afraid you're asking to be shot. Yeah, well, just to try it. Who said... <laughs> yeah. I don't teach him to call somebody who knows how to fly a sissy. <laughs> We, we, but very angry. Look, Leon, you got to do something for me. Angry? Tell the violinist to get his big fat strut of various over to where she's sitting. And quick, quick, immediately. Hello, Miss Asher. Oh, come on, sweetie. I've had a rough night subduing murderers, opium eaters. The least you could do is say hello. Hello. I, uh, like that song, don't you? Look, I know all about you and your little violin bit. Huh? I saw Leon pointing us out to the violinist. He did? Mm-hmm. And where, may I ask, is little Seymour? Little Seymour ate too many goodies. He's having his stomach pumped. Oh, now that's sweet. I think so. I think the song is nice, too. I think you should sing it, too. I think I should, too. Hold me close and hold me fast. The magic spell you had. This is La Viano. When you kiss me, heaven sighs. And though I close my eyes, I see La Viano. When you press your heart.
Richard Diamond, private detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Harvey Easton with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Arthur Q. Bryan, Wilm Herbert, Bill Conrad, Jay Novello, and Dan O'Herlihy. Richard Diamond, private detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. evening. This is your Rexall family druggist, welcoming you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we believe in the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company and confidently recommend them to our customers. A good example is Plenamins, Rexall's famous multivitamin capsules. Handy, economical Plenamins give you more than your daily minimum requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established, plus valuable liver concentrate and iron. Ask for plenamins at Rexall drug stores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, guard against throat scratch, enjoys smoother strangling. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, I'm disgusting. No, only when you're too busy to stop by and see me. Well, I was just going to call you, Helen, baby. Oh, I'll bet. Cross my heart. Hope to lose my skate key. You mean New York's gift to the detective world was really thinking about rural me? Rural you is a mighty interesting subject for rural me to think about. Well, why don't you stop being so spiritual and give your thoughts the benefit of some action? And just what exactly do you suggest? Spend the bottle? Mm. Post office? Mm. A romantic ride through Central Park and a hansom? Yes. Hmm. How would you like to go to the theater tomorrow night? Inside, or are we going to stand out in front and get a between-the-acts description from the usher? I only made you do that once, and from all reports, it was a pretty bad play. What's the one we're seeing? Very bad, but I was given two tickets. I refuse to sit in the back of the balcony again. I keep getting the bends. Oh, fourth row center. Mm -hmm. Must be a bad choice. I got a couple of friends working at it. Going to close in two days. Mr. Diamond? Uh, hold it, Helen. People are running in. My name is Diana Campbell. Brian? Well, I... Uh, Rick? It was hard to say. That's a wonderful thought. I'll see you tonight. I'll bet it's an attractive girl. Mm. You win, hands down. Bye. Now, uh, Miss Campbell, what can I do for you? Mr. Diamond, you've got to help me. Something terrible has happened. I don't know if I'm doing the right thing by coming here, but I... Well, I had to do something. I'm sorry, Miss Campbell. Now, if you'll put the symptoms in alphabetical order... You must promise not to go to the police after I've told you. Oh, one of those. It's for her sake, not mine. Whose sake? Promise me first. I promise to say goodbye if I'm not interested. Mr. Diamond, my aunt is Mrs. Martha Campbell. You've probably heard of her. Martha Campbell? Oh, isn't she the old gal who sells all that silver to Fort Knox? Yes, that's right. Martha Campbell is my aunt. Well, goody for you. She's been kidnapped. Why didn't you go to the police? Well, no, no, we can't do that. They threatened to kill her. I received the ransom note early this morning. They want $50,000 left at a location in Central Park tonight. Why'd you come see me? My fiance, Ira Stewart, has offered to deliver the ransom. Oh, I see. You're afraid that Ira might try to get his name in the papers and wind up under obituaries. Is that it? Yes, I'm afraid. He has a gun permit and... 
Well, I- I've never seen a man get as furious as Ira did when this happened. I want you to go with him and see that he comes back safely. Yeah, but tell me, why is this Ira so concerned over Aunt Martha's welfare? Well, you don't understand. Ira loves Aunt Martha as much as I do. And now that he's practically part of the family, will you go with Ira and see that he does nothing foolish? You no, know, the truth is, the whole thing is a little foolish. Miss Campbell, if you told all this to the police, they'd reserve a few cells and sing sing, and the rest would be routine. I'm not interested in the money or catching the kidnappers, Mr. Diamond. Can't you understand? I just want Ira and my aunt safe and alive. I'm sort of shy around people who aren't interested in money. In fact, when she dropped five new $100 bills on my desk, I positively blushed. She briefed me. I was to be at her aunt's home by midnight, ready to squire Iris Stewart around Central Park. Then she explained exactly where the payoff was to be made. Of course, I had to promise all over again not to tell the police. I promised. (laughs) Diana Campbell left, but her perfume lingered on. I could have sat around and let that order drive me to a cheap neurosis, but there were things to do. And the first thing I did was to break my promise to Diane. Well, well, well. If it isn't Sergeant Otis, and I'd be happy if it wasn't. Hmm. So it is. Wake up, Sergeant. Up with the buttercups. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh-huh. Hmm. Oh. Oh, oh, hello, Shamus. Otis, you'd make a hibernating bear look like an insomnia victim. Well, I'm tired. I've been working hard. Oh, I guess you got a right to be tired. If I had to drag those two feet of yours around all day, I'd have a nervous breakdown. No. Hiya, you, fatty? Who's dead? Well, there's been a nasty rumor going around about your sergeant. Now, now, stop clowning. It's too hot. What's on your mind? No. Well, it's not your department. I need somebody I can trust. Kidnapping. Martha Campbell. The Martha Campbell? Yep. She's been snatched, and the retail price is 50000 The old dame's knees hired me to take care of her boyfriend when he makes the payoff tonight. Where? Central Park, two in the morning. Come as you are. Otis. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Bring me a map of Central Park. Get Lieutenant Davis. Tell him I want every detective available tonight. Prepare a special message to all units uh, of... Hey, wait a minute. Prepare a special message to all units uh, of... Hey, wait a minute. What should I do first? Resign, Melonhead. Get that map. <laughs> Walt and I went to work on the map. We circled the payoff area and set up watch points for an army of plainclothesmen. Nobody going into the area before 2 a.m. would be stopped. But anybody coming out after that time was going to need a good story. It looked great on paper, but Walt was sadder than a Scotchman being held up. If anything went wrong and the news broke, the kidnapping of a woman with Mrs. Campbell's prestige would really upset the commissioner. I left Walt, taxied over to Park Avenue in time to have half of Helen's dinner, spent the rest of the time before midnight with her, and then left to keep my date at a Greystone mansion on the west side. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm glad you're here. Come right in. My fiancé's in the study. What did he say about my coming over here? I, well, I haven't told him yet. I, I thought it might be better if... if... So don't you ever do anything the easy way? Ira, I'd like to have you meet Mr. Diamond. What? Oh. Diane, tonight of all nights to have a guest over. Uh, Mr. Diamond, I'm very glad to meet you, but... uh, Well, you'll have to go now. I'm sorry. Ira Stewart was a blonde, well-built young guy in loose brown tweeds. He seemed to have trouble finding a place for his hands, and I half got the idea he'd like to try my jaw. Ira, Mr. Diamond is here to help us. What? I hired him to go with you tonight. He's a private detective. Even my best friends don't know. Glad to meet you, Mr. Stewart. Diane, have you gone mad? Do you know what would happen to Aunt Martha if those men found out? Oh, relax, Stewart. Nothing's going to happen to anyone unless you force me to make an exception. Diamond, I... Please, darling. I couldn't stand the thought of you going to see those men alone. We didn't know how many there are or what they might do. I've got all the protection I need right here in my pocket. Famous last words. Look, Buffalo Bill, I'll give you a clue. The kind of guys you got to date with tonight don't take ten paces before the turn and shoot. You could be buried in that suit, gun and all. Now, look here, Diana. Uh, it's getting late. Uh, I'd better get the money. We followed Diane up a winding staircase and into Mrs. Campbell's bedroom. This little nook was somewhat smaller than Grand Central Station with an acre of bed in the middle. The bed had talent because all Diane had to do was push a little button 
and it slid about a yard away from the wall and exposed the neatest little wall safe this side of the First National Bank. Diane fingered the combination, and a minute later, I found out whose picture is on a thousand-dollar bill. There were 50 prints. Here, Diane. Put the money in this bag. It's 1.30, Stuart. I'm ready. Ira, please be careful. Please, both of you. Glad I made the team. Let's go. Central Park by moonlight. Bad night to be stag. Well, we're almost there. I'll have to park here. Must be among that clump of trees up ahead. Now, keep close to it. And don't get any ideas about shooting anybody. It might turn out to be me and I'd squeal on you. We both went into a crouch and edged forward. There was a small clearing between the trees which the moon had turned into a silver pancake. I might have enjoyed it, except that Stuart was as nervous as an old maid looking at a calendar. Uh, did you hear anything? Oh, sounds like a revolution in the insect world. You stay here. I'll go through this hedge and have a look. Uh, maybe I'd better come with you. No, 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 no. You stay here. Diamond! Oh! Something caught me hard and neat behind the ear, and I jackknifed into a face full of Mother Earth. Don't let anyone tell you it's nice to get away from things for a while. I didn't like it a bit. I was far, far away. I don't know how long my beauty nap lasted, but the first thing I felt was an elevator starting around my heels and roaring up. When it burst through the top of my head, I awoke. For the next few minutes, I felt like my head was a ball and the rest of me was a drunken seal trying to keep it balanced. Then I saw Stuart stretched out the way I had been. The copycat. He was bleeding from what was going to be a nasty scar on his forehead. A hunk of pipe was lying nearby. I went to work on him. Oh. All right, all right, Stuart. Rise and shine, rise and shine. Oh, oh come on. You're just not used to it. I make it a point to have my head cracked at least once a week. Oh. What happened? Oh. Last one out talks first. That's you. Yeah. Now I remember. There were two of them. One started for you and I yelled, Jack. Then I heard one of them say, get him, Bob. And then you were shaking me. Diamond. The bag. The money's gone. So it was. It was time to give Walt part of my headache. Stuart and I stumbled back to the car. There was someone in the front seat. I pulled the door open and found myself face to face with a kidnapped Mrs. Martha Campbell. She was dead. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. There are two important facts I'd like you listeners to remember about Rexall aspirin. First, each Rexall aspirin tablet contains five full grains of pure aspirin. And second, there's no faster-acting aspirin made. Well, but what exactly do you mean by fast-acting? Well, ma'am, aspirin itself is too fine to hold together in tablet form. So it has to be bound with an ingredient that will quickly disintegrate. That is, break up the tablet. So the aspirin itself will immediately be free to do its job. You mean the aspirin doesn't do any good until it's free from the tablet? Right. And that's why Rexall scientists developed a binder so low in moisture content, it begins to break up the very second it touches water. Now that means that when swallowed with water, the aspirin in a Rexall tablet is free to go to work for you, even before it reaches your stomach. Well, that's fast enough for me. And it's fast enough for 10,000 family druggists. Quality like that is what we're talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Finding Mrs. Campbell dead in the front seat was the ugly end of another beautiful day. 
I had known the little gray-haired woman personally, but from her reputation, I had the hunch that some of this town's best charity groups would be in mourning come tomorrow. And just in case I wasn't feeling bad enough, Stuart was right in there to help me. I never should have let you come. It's your fault she's dead. You did it. You did it. Thank you, Sherlock Holmes. Now, shut up. You were going to protect me. <laughs> you were going to... I slapped five fingers of artificial sunburn into his face and shut him up. Then I checked Mrs. Campbell's corpse. She'd been murdered at least 24 hours before. I lifted her featherweight body and stretched her out in the back seat. Ira was still rubbing his cheek when I pushed him into the car. <laughs> Now, what about those two guys, Stuart? Oh, now I slapped you back there for your own good. Did you get a look at those guys? It was too dark. One was big and heavy, the other was thin. Could you identify them if you saw them again? Yes, I think so. What's that on the road ahead? Someone's waving a light. That's the police. Just step from that car quietly, you. Otis. It's me, Diamond. Rick, that you? No sign of any kidnappers yet. Not kidnappers, Walt. Murderers. Huh? Exhibit A is on the back seat. Come on, Otis. Open the door. Oh, oh. Bitches. Head bashed in. What are the police doing here, Diamond? I thought... Don't brag. You didn't think. Otherwise, you'd have gone straight to the police in the first place. What about the money? I don't care about the money. Mrs. Campbell is dead, and that's all that matters. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Mr. Stewart. Uh, look... Might be a good idea for you to be with your fiancé, Miss Campbell, before she hears the news on the radio. Uh, we'll take care of things here. Oh. Yes, of course, Diane. Yeah, I'm sorry, Lieutenant, about my behavior. You understand? And Mr. Diamond, Oh, I... forget it. I've got a head that knows just how you feel. Once Stuart was gone, I gave Walt the lowdown, and we settled down to work. We gave the two killers an hour to try a break. And then Walt passed a signal along to his men and the ring began to close in. We beat the bushes, turned lights in the trees, and kicked over rocks, even the small ones. But by the time we reached the payoff spot, we found nothing out but each other. Now that's impossible. Are you men sure you didn't miss anything? Double-checked all down the line, Lieutenant. They couldn't have gotten through. Take it easy, Walt. Time now for cool heads and dull little dragnet. Otis, I want you to start picking up Muggs wholesale. Right, Lieutenant. Anybody who even thinks twice before he answers, bring him in. I want this town covered from the Harlem River to the Battery. Now do it. Otis waddled away, and I drove back to police headquarters with Walt. Soon, Manhattan Island was tucked under a blanket of blue as the biggest police force in the world went to work. The next day, I took a stroll through Central Park for another look at the spot where Stuart and I had been slugged. I found one possible witness, but he wouldn't talk. Probably because he didn't know how. He happened to be an English sparrow. Late in the afternoon, I dropped back to see Walt. He was in his shirt sleeves, hunched over a desk piled high with notes, reports, and cigarette butts. Neither of us had gotten any sleep the night before, but he was advertising it. Oh, Rick, I could kick myself. I ought to turn in my badge. We should have had those guys. Nothing in the lineup? No, oh, I've been looking at drunks, ex-cons, and two-bit hoodlums all day, and they're all clean. If someone tried to sell me an invisible man routine, I'd be willing to listen. Walt, if you keep banging your head against a stone wall, your eyes are going to register tilt. You need a breather on this case. Look, I got two tickets for a play tonight. What about it? Are you kidding? I've got work to do. Oh, but Walt, the play is a musical murder mystery. The cop on stage is bound to have more troubles than you. Uh, yeah, I bet. Well, maybe you're right. Sure, I'll go. Thanks, Rick. I'm glad Walt didn't ask any more questions because my supply of answers was down to one sorry shrug. However, this last maneuver didn't go over too well on Park Avenue when I dropped in to tell Helen she was being stood up. Rick Diamond, this time you've gone too far. Now, would it help any if I said it was business? No. Well, I suppose there's nothing I, I can do. I spent all day buying a new dress and getting my hair done, and then you walk in at the last minute oh, and tell me you... Oh, Helen, baby. Now, you stay away from me, Rick. Rick, let go of me. Now, in a minute. Rick! Rick! You dog. Walt was ready when I dropped in at the precinct and we took off to the theater. 
After the show was over, we meandered backstage to see my friends at the cast. Turned out to be an interesting evening. The next morning, I called up Iris Stewart from Levinson's office. Yes? Hello, Stewart. This is Diamond. I'm calling from the 5th Precinct Police Headquarters. Anything turn up? Well, it looks that way, yes. The police picked up two guys who may have killed Martha Campbell. Can you get on here right away? Certainly. I'll leave right now. Well, then run. Do not walk. When Stewart showed, we took him into the lineup room. The two suspects had their backs against the marked wall. Under the hot lights, they looked about as ugly as a draft notice on a honeymoon. Well, what do you think, Stuart? They look like the men, Lieutenant. We didn't do nothing. This is the parade. On you guys, it looks good. What do you want to do, live forever? Now, Stuart, these guys are Willie the Knife Foster and bloody Bob Ferguson. They've been indicted on three kidnap raps, but always managed to get off. Now, if you recognize them, you're an eyewitness and they're cooked. Well... Tell the big one to say, get him, Bob. Say it, Bob. What for? For the sake of your dear old mother in Alcatraz. Never mind what for. Say it. Uh, get him, Bob. Now the other. You heard him, Ferguson. Get him, Bob. That's the man, Lieutenant. I'm sure of it. Let me get my hands on him. I'll kill him. Now, Stuart, Stuart, calm down. State of New York will take care of them. It's a lousy frame. You can't pin this on us. He was babysitting that night. Okay, lock him up, Otis. All right. Book him on suspicion of murder. Stuart, come into my office. I want to get your statement. After getting his statement, Walt told Stuart the case was closed. We congratulated each other and shook hands all around. Then Stuart walked out. We gave him enough time to get into his car and start away. A moment later, Walt and I jumped into an unmarked police car and played follow the leader. Rick, this case turned right side up too quick to suit me. What made you tag Stuart and plant your actor friends in the lineup? Well, the trouble with you is that you're too modest. You set an airtight man trap for two unknown kidnappers and then blame yourself because the net came up empty. Well, he had you fooled, too. That's true, that's true. I'm ashamed to admit. But Stuart had a good plan. He kidnaps the lady himself, sends Diane a phony ransom note. Then with a reputable private tech detective present, <laughs> that's me... He gets the $50,000 and even bops himself on the head to make it look kosher. You'd have made a perfect alibi for him, Rick. But where did the old lady's body come from? Oh, he probably had it in the car trunk when we drove into the park the night of the supposed payoff. Hey, he's turning into the park. Mm -hmm. Soon comes the part we don't know yet. We should have nabbed him back at the station. I'd like to sweat him for a few hours. On what? The identification? So he claims it was a mistake. Could happen. The jury would think so. No, Walt. He's put on too big an act to fold under questioning. He's been acting ever since he made Diane believe he loved her, just to gain Martha Campbell's confidence. He's parking up ahead. Yeah. Now let him answer the $50,000 question. And where did he hide it? He's heading toward that same grove of trees. We took off at a fast trot until we reached the hedge not too far from where we expected to find Stuart. We saw him all right. He was standing around right under the same tree he'd led me to a couple of nights back. A family of picnickers were close by, so he was acting like a guy out for some air. We ducked behind the hedge to watch, though I had to hold Walt back a few times. Finally, Stuart tipped his hand. He reached up past the nest of my sparrow friend into a hollow of the tree. It wasn't eggs he was after. The stuff he pulled out had that fascinating color known as currency green. That's enough for me, Rick. Okay, Stuart. Duck, Walt. Oh. 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 Are you hurt, Walt? Yeah. One of his shots creased my shin. Hurts like blazes, though. Let's get that guy. He's running for the zoo. I'll get him, Walt. Put a tourniquet around your neck and sit tight. Oh, watch out for the crowd, Rick. <laughs> What the shooting did to that crowd, a skunk couldn't do in a bargain basement. They suddenly decided there was no place like home. Stuart was dodging between the animal cages now and still using his gun to discourage me. I sprinted after him, but he disappeared. That bullet went right through my only hat, but I saw him now. He was climbing along the rock barrier that backed up the bear pits. He made a lousy target because those jagged rocks and overhanging ledges gave him plenty of cover. He was trying to reach the road on the other side, and if I didn't do something about it, 
Exit, Mr. Stewart. I took aim. <laughs> My shot clipped a hunk of rock just as he was reaching for it. Stewart pulled back too quickly and tried to step on some air, which never does work too well. He went over and down. <laughs> He never hit the ground because down in that pit, waiting for him with open arms, was a giant polar bear that had never forgiven the man who brought him from Alaska to New York. I reckon glad you and Alan could make it to the cast party. Uh, thanks, Bob. Thanks also for the great acting job you and Willie pulled off at police headquarters. Oh, anytime, Rick. Glad to help out. Yeah, that's a nice tune. Is that a song for the show? Nah, nah, just fooling around. After a show flops, there's nothing like a little get-together to bolster one's spirit. Well, I certainly like the taste of your bolster. So I'll mix myself another later. Rick, what are you doing by the piano as if I didn't know? You don't want to look bad in front of all this talent, do you? Oh, honey, not a chance. Just happens that Bob's playing around in my key. Well, let's do it. Well, let's do it then. Count every star in a midnight sky. Count every rose, every firefly. For that's how many times I miss you. Heaven knows I miss you. Count every leaf. On a willow tree Count every wave On a stormy sea Count every scar And darling, when you do You know the times I have cried For you Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, but due to previous commitments, I'm only available for stage, screen, radio, television, and parades. <laughs> Rick, you are becoming a ham. Me? Becoming a ham? <laughs> oh, my dear. Really? <laughs> Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you suffer from acid indigestion, remember that Bismarex often neutralizes excess acidity in less than one minute. But more than that, Bismarex gives relief that's continuous and prolonged. Its scientifically balanced ingredients work in sequence, easing gastric distress and leaving a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Ask your Rexall druggist for Bismarex. He'll tell you, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Joe Morheim and Hal Bloom with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Mary Ship, Dick Ryan, and Hi Averback. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Incidentally, Dick's turned writer this week. Pick up a copy of the August issue of Radio Mirror from your dealer tomorrow. Read The Adoption Racket by Dick Powell. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. 
This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company, like Rexall MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular and versatile mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs almost instantly, yet will not harm the delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, when it's murder or less and you're caught in a mess, if you can't pay my fee, my advice is confess. (laughs) Rick, you old son of a gun. (laughs) This is Frank. Frank? Oh, Frank Bowers? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's good to talk to you again, Rick. How you been? Well, no complaints, Frank. What's with you? Uh, doing great, Rick. Just great. Bought me a half interest in a gym here in town. Yeah? Sell all your fighters? Oh, but one. Boy by the name of Max Farmer. Say, he's going to the main event tonight. You want to catch him? Well, all depends. Who's throwing him? <laughs> no, Rick, no. This boy's really good. Say, why don't you drop by the arena tonight? Oh, sorry, Frank. I got a date. She hates the sight of blood. Ah, talk her into it, boy. I'll leave a couple of passes for you at the gate. Uh, passes? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I'm a sucker for a good argument. See you tonight, Frank. That night, I led Helen to our seats at ringside. She was dressed to kill, and from the look on her face, I thought I might be the first on her list. Rick. Yes, baby? Would you mind telling the man behind me to stop dripping mustard on my mink? Oh, sure, sure, honey. Hey, Buster, please do not feed the animals. That's the good boy. Rick, why of all places the fights? But, honey, these are $10 seats. Hey, Ricky, Ricky, glad you could use the passes. Boing. Move your feet, Rockefeller, and let the man in. <laughs> oh, gee, it's good to see you again, Rick. <laughs> say, say, I want you to meet Lorna Thorne. I, uh... Wow. Hanging onto Frank's arm, I saw why boys like girls. She was wearing slightly more than the fighters. Had so many curves, I got seasick just looking at her. As I stared, I suddenly felt a strange sensation in my legs. Helen was digging her heel into my shin. Come up for air, Ricky, dear. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, honey, uh, honey, I want you to meet Frank Bowers. Sally, I know you anywhere. Rick's told me a lot about you. Frank, yeah? that was five years ago. This is Helen. Oops, <laughs> my mistake. Huh? <laughs> Lorna, I want you to meet Helen. Hiya. Well, when in Rome... <laughs> Hiya. What a spot for a thesaurus. Hey, sit over there, will you, honey? I want to sit next to Rick. Oh, Rick, it's a shame I didn't tip you to this fight earlier. You could have put some dough on my boy and really cleaned up. Uh, you think he'll win, huh? No, I know he'll win. He's fighting Lou Scott, strictly a bum from upstate. The syndicate made the match just to build up Farmer's name and pick up some easy dough on the side. Now he tells me. <laughs> there. There's my boy getting in the ring now. I watched Max Farmer climb through the ropes, stop, smile at the television cameras, then at the crowd, and then at the cameras again. If the people at home thought they were seeing a reissue of The Hairy Ape, then television had improved. Because that's exactly how Max looked. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your main event. Ten rounds of boxing. In the white corner, wearing black trunks, Weighing 175 and hailing from Buffalo, Lou Scott! And in the black corner, wearing purple trunks, weighing 179 and right from our own New York City, Max Foreman! The boys met in the center of the ring, received some fatherly advice from the referee, shook gloves, and went back to their corners. Okay, Max! Okay, now, boy, give it to him! Come on, get him! Get him! Get him. Well, Frank was right. It certainly was a pushover. Two minutes later, the fight was seven counts from being over. Only it wasn't Lou Scott who was fast asleep on the canvas. 
The sleeping beauty was Frank's boy, Max Farmer. Max! Max, get up! Max, please, come on! Seven! Max! Eight! Max, get up! Nine! Get up, you bastard! Don't you teach your fighters to duck, Frank? Oh, I don't understand it. It's all wrong, Rick. Rick, how can that man sleep up there with all this noise? Oh, Helen. Just call me, Sal. Now can we go home? Sure, baby. Rick, Rick, uh, stick around, uh, will you? I may have a job for you. Oh? Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm going down to the dressing room. Meet me there in ten minutes. Come on, Lon. From the look on Frank's face, I could tell he was worried. So I took Helen outside and put her in a cab. She was a good sport about going home alone, though. Didn't say a word. Not even goodbye. Then I went back inside and made my way to Farmer's dressing room. Come on, come on. Inside, I could hear Frank's angry come on, come on. voice. All right. All right, so you won't tell me who. But she ain't gonna get away with the snacks. I'll find out, and when I do, you'll be back there. Frank! I'll be right out, Rick. Now remember this, you bum. We're through, see? Through! Uh, hello, Rick. Aren't you a little tough on the guy just for losing a fight? Farmer lost that fight before he ever got into the ring. It was fixed. Well, that's strong talk, Frank. Got anything to back it up? Look, I know this boy. I trained him myself. He could have won tonight's fight with his eyes shut. Somebody paid him to take a dive. Maybe it was his own idea. Uh, Max, don't get ideas. He's too dumb. Whew. Rick. Rick, I want you to find out who is behind this fix. Well, you make it sound simple. Got any leads? Maybe. Stop by the gym the first thing in the morning and we'll start from there. First thing next morning, I went on to Frank's gym. They say the early bird gets the worm, and I guess it's true. For standing right inside the door was none other than Sergeant Otis, Pride and Joy of the 5th Precinct. Uh, pardon me, but aren't you Jack Dempsey? Uh, no, my name is... Uh, oh, Diamond, you here? Very observant, Otis. You're improving. Learn to blow a whistle yet? Oh, why do I always have to run into you? Aren't you afraid to be out without your keeper? Where's Walt? Frank, what are you doing here? Oh, hi, Walt. Hi. Well, I've got a client here. What's your excuse? Routine check on a suicide. Guy by the name of Frank Bowers leaped from the Brooklyn Bridge. What? Frank Bowers? Yeah, know him. Yeah. Well, are you sure about this? It's open and shot. Three witnesses saw him do it. We pulled his body out of the river this morning. Oh, I can't believe it. Frank had no reason to kill himself. I was with him all last evening. That's a good reason. Shut up, old yes. Sorry, Rick, but these things happen. No, not to guys like Frank. He was no quitter. You sure about those witnesses? They're ordinary citizens, Rick. We took their statements this morning. That still sounds phony, Walt. Look, Rick, I know it's hard to believe a friend would take the easy way out, but in this case, it's a fact. Walt, Frank was a good friend. Before I believe he killed himself, someone's got to convince me. All right, all right. Otis, drive Diamond out to those witnesses' homes. I'll walk back to the office. Oh, Lieutenant, why do you always pick on me? Fate, Otis. Don't fight it. It's bigger than us. Come on. Otis drove like a madman, which was strictly in character. The first witness, a butcher named Henry Burton, was at work. But the butcher's wife, a typical homemaker, gave us her version of Frank's death. And just like I told the police, off went the overcoat and over he went. Oh, it was awful. The woman trembled, Otis gloated, and I grabbed my hat. Her husband worked at a nearby market and their stories checked. That took care of the first two witnesses. Then we drove to the home of Bill Voss, the third and final witness. Well, uh, I was coming home from a late movie and I started across the Manhattan approach to the bridge. Uh, this guy, uh, Bowers, was about ten yards in front of me. I was foggy, and I couldn't see him very well. But I could make him out when he stopped. He threw off his top coat, climbed the guardrail, and dived in. I, I yelled, but it was too late. Uh, I'm the one who called the police. The story's all checked. But I still wasn't convinced. So I had Otis drop me off at Frank's gym. If Frank did kill himself, then there had to be a reason. I decided to check on Frank's partner, one Ben Lamb. I found him in his office. It's too bad about Frank. Lamb, what about the business here? Any trouble that might explain why Frank did it? No, everything's running smoothly here. Of course, it was last night's fight, but... Ah, that's out of the question. Well, then maybe it's an answer. Keep talking. Well, the syndicate is looking for whoever fixed last night's fight. Uh, they play kind of rough when they're mad. And, well, maybe Frank was afraid of what they might do to him. You mean he'd kill himself just to save them a bullet? 
Ah, that's false economy. It's just the thought. Forget it. I have. But I take it you think Frank was behind the fix. I didn't say that. The farmer couldn't plant it himself. He's too dumb. And Frank was too smart. I said it. It's just a thought. That you may be partly right. Maybe Frank's death does have something to do with last night's fight. Is Max Farmer around? I saw him outside earlier. Thanks. Now, Mr. Diamond, might I ask what makes you so interested in Frank's suicide? Was it suicide, Mr. Lamb? Well, wasn't it suicide? I ask you first. See you around, Lamb. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Last week, a customer told me that... Something I really like about Rexall Milk of Magnesia is that one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it, and the next one thin and watery. Somehow, Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity or it won't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by viscosity? Well, an easy definition would be the degree of thickness in a liquid. Now, Rexall scientists conduct scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall milk of magnesia to make sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity, because that's one big reason why you'll always get a uniform dosage from every bottle. Oh, and I thought it was all just an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact you can always depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I stood in the center of Frank's gymnasium, certain that Frank's supposed suicide had something to do with last night's fight. But how? That was the jackpot question. In one corner of the gym, I saw Max Farmer hitting a punching bag with a methodical, monotonous rhythm. I walked over to him. Max? Yeah? My name is Diamond. Yeah? I was a friend of Frank Bowers. Yeah? Well, if you can spare any more words, I'd like to ask you a question. Look, if it's about last night, forget it, see? I don't know nothing about nothing. No argument there, but I came to see you about boxing. Huh? I don't get you. Well, Frank always said you were one of the best, and I thought you could give me a few pointers. Oh, you, uh, you're a fighter? No, no, no. I just like to show off at the Y. You know how it is. Oh, sure, sure. Well, you get some trunks from the shower, boy, and we'll go with you. You can learn plenty from me. Good, Max. That's just what I'm hoping to learn. Plenty. The shower boys gave me a pair of gloves and purple trunks. I felt like a self-conscious tulip as I entered the ring, but Max seemed quite impressed. Hey, you got a pretty good bill. I also go steady. You all set? Yeah, I'm ready. Put them up. No, not above your head. Max, we come from different environments. Okay, let's go. Hey, you're, you're not bad. Uh, just, just lucky. Hey, when will I tell my friends that, that I box with the Max Farmer? Yeah, they like that, huh? Like it. I'll be a hero. After all, Max, you've never lost a fight. Oh, oh, I, I, I forgot last night. Sorry. Oh, uh, don't no, think nothing about that fight. I'll be up there again. You'll see. Oh, no doubt. Hey, 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 wait a minute, wait. Let, let's take a break. I, I'm winded. Okay. You know, you, you, you fighters have a lot of perseverance. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's what we got, all right. Uh, I what guess... you said. I guess good athletes are just born, huh? Not made. Buddy, that's the truth. You know, I've been in sports since grade school. Uh, still at it? What, sports? Uh, skip it. I bet you were good even then, Max. Oh, boy, was I. I played football in high school. Made all state. Weren't always a boxer, huh? No, no, I've done everything. Hey, tell me, tell me. What's the greatest exhibition of sports in the world? Go on now, go on, think. Uh, Shriners Convention? Shriners? Ah, uh, nah. The, the Olympics. And I was in them, too. Would have won, but Marshall Wayne beat me on points. My, my. Won't I have a lot to tell my friends? You know, there's just one other fighter I'd like to brag about sparring with. 
That's Lou Scott. Lou no, What? That Scott's a bum. I could whip him with my eyes shut. Oh? I heard that's how you lost. Look, forget about last night. That fight was... Fi- uh, go on, Max. Oh, yeah. I had a headache last night. That's all. Now I gotta take a shower. See you around. It was the first time I'd ever gone fishing in a boxing ring. I was hoping to find out who was behind the fix. That might throw some light on Frank's death. But to coin an old phrase, the big one got away. Next on my list was the girl Frank was with at the fight, Lorna Thorne. She danced at the Silver Circle, a small nightclub not far from the gym. I went backstage, climbed the iron stairs, and found her room. Just a sec. Well, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Miss Thorne. Sit down. Care for a drink? It all depends. Are we drowning our sorrow or celebrating? I don't get you. Well, you don't seem too upset about Frank. Oh, that. I'm not the type to cry, honey. Ruins mascara. Oh, don't get me wrong. I liked Frank. Liked him a lot, but we were both in it just for the last. Mm-hmm. Tommy, did Frank come up here after he left the arena? Yeah. He came up and we talked till it was time for my number. He left about midnight. Did he seem upset? Now that you mention it, he did. Lorna, uh, how well do you know Ben Lamb? Only seen him around. Why? Well, Lamb thinks Frank might have been behind a fixed fight. Hmm, could be. He sure was nervous. Mm, I see. You and Lamb didn't compare stories by any chance? I told you, I've only seen him around. Uh Uh-huh. Hey, this is a nice mink coat. Been saving unemployment checks? I'm a working gal, remember? Oh, come now, honey. You don't earn enough here to buy this kind of coat. I'm a bookie on the side. Hmm, Patterson's Furriers on the label. That's real richy, kid. Thanks. Now I gotta change. Okay. Oh, don't run off. I'll only be a minute. Uh, some other time, honey. Suit yourself. I'll be around. I'll bet you will. I went back to my office, locked the door, put my ox buds up on my dusty desk and tried to think. There was no logical motive for suicide, but there was plenty for murder. Lamb would inherit Frank's half of the business... Farmer might have been afraid Frank would blackball him with other managers. And Lorna was the type who would do anything for a fast buck. But then there was that constant headache, the three witnesses. My thoughts were all jumbled up. I kept trying to remember everything that had been said today. I kept hearing voices in a jumbled sequence. Yeah, the syndicate plays rough. Frank may have been afraid. Why well, have been in sports since grade school? <laughs> It's an open and shut case, Rick. You're a hard man to convince, Shamus. Then over he went. Oh, it was awful. Frank behind it? Yeah, it was only a thought, damn it. I'm not the type to cry, honey. It ruins mascara. Then he climbed the rail and dived in. I don't want to, only Marshal Wayne beat me on points. Climbed the rail and dived in. Marshal Wayne beat me. Marshal Wayne. Wayne! Then he dived in, dived in, dived, dived. I had it. I knew how Frank was killed. Hello? Mr. Diamond, this is Francis. It was Helen's butler calling to invite me to dinner that evening. He said something about Helen expecting me, but I wasn't listening. I kept hearing that witness say Frank dived in. It was the answer to the whole thing. Mr. Diamond, sir, are you listening? Francis... Francis, if you were going to commit suicide... Sure, I beg your pardon, sir. Look, if you were going to kill yourself from the Brooklyn Bridge, what would you do? Oh, dear, I'd reconsider. No, 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 Francis. If you really were, would you jump or would you dive? Why, uh, I'd probably jump, sir. Yes, I'm sure I would. Well, of course. It's a natural thing to do. See you later, Francis. The pieces began to fall into place. I remembered something Max Farmer had said earlier. Marshal Wayne had beaten him on points. Marshal Wayne. I had associated that name with boxing, but now... I checked in the sports almanac. Listed under the 36 Olympics, I found Marshal Wayne won the high diving competition that year. And Max had competed with him. Now I was certain. First, I put in a call to Federson's Furriers for some information. So far, so good. Then I called Walt and told him to meet me at the gym. It was closing time when I got there and most of the fighters were leaving. 
But I caught sight of Max Farmer as he made his way out of the showers. How's the water, Max? Huh? Diamond. What's the matter? You don't look happy to see me. What are you doing here? The boys at the Y, remember? I came for some more pointers. It's closing time. Oh, that's too bad. That's the only reason you don't want to spend some time with me, huh? Yeah, yeah. You, uh, you're not too tired. Me? I'm never tired. Let's just close it up, that's all. Well, Max, old pal, I've got good news for you. I fixed it with lamb for me to lock up when we're finished. Huh? Well, I... Not, uh, scared by any chance. Me scared of you? Why, you... Get some trunks. You'll see who's scared. I wondered if my Blue Cross plan was still in effect as I changed clothes and followed Max out to the ring in the middle of the deserted gymnasium. Max had an ugly scowl on his face, and I knew that this time he would pull no punches. Ouch! Hey, playing rough, eh, pal? You got a lousy guard. That's all. Oh. Hi. You act nervous. Tired of boxing? Maybe you'd rather be swimming, huh? Maybe, huh? Oops, sorry. Now your guard is down. Of course, a, a born athlete like you would be happy doing anything in the way of sports, I suppose. Maybe even diving. Your guard, pal, your guard. You, you don't make sense. No, I think so. Oh. Your mind's wandering, Max. Keep your guard up. You know, for a real sport, like, say, high diving... There's really no place around here to practice. Unless, of course, you tried the Brooklyn Bridge. I'll bet a really good diver could make it from the Manhattan approach without a scratch. Now, listen, what's the... Ad- <clears throat> the guard, Samson. Better watch it. Hold it a minute. Hold it a minute. What's the big idea? Well, the big idea came when I figured out how three witnesses could see a suicide that wasn't a suicide. You're lonely. Am I? Those witnesses didn't see Frank because he was already in the river. You had pushed him in. You waited for some people to show up, and then you dived in. No. Yes, Max, yes. But you weren't alone in this. Someone had to talk you into taking a dive in the fight and a different kind later on. You'd have thrown the fight for any man's money, but you'd only risk your neck for a particular species. Female. Men are funny that way. It ain't true. It ain't true. Max, Max, Lorna confessed an hour ago. What? I'll kill you for this. That's your third and final dive, Max. <sighs> That's a nice right cross, Rick. Oh, I seen better. Ah, the little boys in blue. About time. Walt, when Joe Palooka here wakes up, I think he'll confess. He believes the girl already did. Yeah, so I heard. Rick, how did you figure her in this mess? Well, like most females, she couldn't wait for a mink coat. According to Fetterson's furrier, she bought an expensive coat the day after the fight. Paid cash for it. <laughs> These amateur criminals. Yeah, someone had to be the brains behind Max's action, so I put two and two together and got two. Max and Lorna. Yeah. Otis, go pick up Lorna Thorne. Well, stop fixing your tie and move. Oh, let him alone, Walt. First date he's had in years. What is it? Do you have to play so loud? Well, I can't help it, baby. It's the brute in me. Mm-hmm. And that shiner, darling. What happened? Fly out a doorknob. Young lady, I have been boxing. Just call me Kid Diamond, please. Oh, no. Boxing? You? Well, why not? It's so strenuous. Well, <laughs> well I'm in fair shape. What do you use for muscles? You just put up your dukes and I'll show you. All righty. Now get up and sing. I'm young and healthy, and you've got charm. It'd really be a sin not to have you in my eye. I'm young and healthy, 
and so you. When the moon is in the sky, tell me what am I to do? If I could paint you, I'd keep away. But that ain't my nature, I'm full of vitamin A. I'm young and healthy, so let's be bold. In a year or two or three, maybe we will be too old. If I could hate you, I'd keep away. But it ain't my nature, I'm full of vitamin A. Ooh, I'm young and healthy, so let's be bold. In a year or two or three, maybe we will be too old. Rick. I'm sorry I hit you so hard, but you're such a show-off. Now, look, honey, you got the wrong idea about this whole... Uh, uh, begging your pardon, Mr. Diamond, sir, but I just wanted to tell you that I've changed my mind. I would dive off the bridge. What, Francis? You see, I've always been afraid to dive, and, well, it would be fun just at once. Oh, no. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you have a headache, remember this about Rexall aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. So whenever you have a headache, remember that about Rexall aspirin. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember always, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Richard Carr and Marvin Marks with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, D. Tatum, Wally Mayer, Howard McNear, Hi Aberback, and Jay Novello. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Bismarex, for example. This famous Rexall antacid often neutralizes excess acidity within one minute. What's more, the ingredients in Bismarex vary in the time it takes them to dissolve in the stomach. And that way, relief from acid indigestion is quick, continuous, and prolonged. Quality like that of Bismarex is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, are you, Mr. Diamond? Oh, my goodness, yes. Come right in. My name is Wolf. Well, unofficially, so is mine. Sit down. Thank you. 
<laughs> oh, no, no, my pleasure. You must get a dividend from the nylon companies. It'd be terrible if there was a shortage. I'm well stocked. Yeah. What can I do for you? Start by calling me Edna. Well, then what? I'd like you to follow my husband. As a detective or a replacement? I think he's been seeing another woman. Why? Have you been running around the house in a diving suit and swim fence? I've always tried to keep myself attractive for my husband, Mr. Diamond. Well, then if your husband is seeing another woman, Mrs. Wolf, it's got to be an optometrist assistant. Well, thank you. I think you and I are going to get along just fine. Well, now that we're all agreed, tell me some more about your husband. What makes you think there's another woman? Usual things. The way he's been acting. Business appointments every evening. Nothing else? He received a call late this afternoon. I listened in on the extension. It was a woman. She called the house? George was very unhappy about it. Warned her never to do it again. She gave a name? She said, this is Nancy. I must see you here tonight at 8 o'clock. Hmm. She didn't say where here was, did she? No, George seemed to understand. Probably her apartment. Probably. If he's seeing another woman, I want a divorce, Mr. Diamond. And you need grounds. Yes. A hundred a day in expenses, Mrs. Wolfe. Edna. It's still a hundred a day in expenses. Here's... Two hundred. Hmm. I hope that's enough of a retainer. Oh, that'll keep me interested for quite a while. Now, uh, tell me, what does your husband do? Oh, I, I, I mean his business. He's in steel. How much in? Oh, very much. He's vice president of his company. What does he look like? Well, here's a picture of him. Hmm. Well, I'll start right away and see what I can find out for you, Mrs. Edna. Yeah. Well, look, after I found out just how unfair your husband's treating you, I might lend you my shoulder to cry on. And I'd just about have to call you Edna then, wouldn't I? By 7 o'clock, I was standing across the street from her house waiting for her wandering husband. By 7.30, a man stepped out on the sidewalk and hailed a cab. I recognized him from the photograph as George Wolfe. And I started the tale, following him east across town to an apartment house on 47th Street. By the time I got in the lobby, it was deserted. A list of names on the mailboxes showed the only girl named Nancy in the building was a Nancy Fowler. So I headed for her apartment. Her door was at the far end of the hall, and I was halfway to it when George Wolf bounded out and ran right into me. Let me go. Take your hands off of me. You forgot to close the door. Get out of my way. What's the matter, friend? You look like you ran into a yard full of snakes. Will you get out of my way or must I use force? Well, use all you like, but I think you better go back and close the door. No, no. Yes, yes. Stop it. You can't do this to me. Well, I hope you aren't always this wrong. No, no. Please. Now get in the room. <laughs> oh, swell. No wonder you took off like that. I didn't kill her. I swear I didn't kill her. Nancy Fowler? Uh, yes, I guess so. You guess so? Well, this is Miss Fowler's apartment, but... I've never seen Nancy Fowler before in my life. There was the 38 revolver lying next to the dead girl, so I took out my own gun and covered Wolf while I called Lieutenant Levinson of Homicide to get right over. Wolf yelled, screamed, and pleaded, and even offered me a nice fat bribe. But we waited for Fatty Levinson and his squad of New York's finest. He finally arrived, but New York's finest was poorly represented. Hello, Shamus. In trouble again, huh? Walt, did you have to bring Otis? I promised he hasn't used the siren in four days. Who's this guy? George Wolfe. Caught him running out of the door. Well, Mr. Wolf, what about it? I had nothing to do with it, but I'm not saying any more until I see my lawyer. He was crying all over the place before you got here, Walt. Claimed he got a call from a Nancy Fowler who asked him to come up here. That's the truth, Lieutenant. She said she had something important to tell me. Says he never even heard of Nancy Fowler before the call. That also is the truth. When I came to the apartment, I found her lying just as you see her. How'd you get in the door? She told me she'd leave it open for me to walk right in. Well, it came out the back just below the shoulder blades, Lieutenant. You on the gun, Mr. Wolf? I refuse to answer any more questions. Okay, take him down to the car, Otis. Come on, you... Rick, just how did you happen to be in this building at this particular time? Well, I was hired by that guy's wife, the tail M. He was supposed to be playing illegal footsies with a female named Nancy. The dead girl? Well, the wife just knew the first name was Nancy. The girl who's supposed to live here is named Nancy. Nancy Fowler. I've never seen her before. Maybe the dead girl is one and the same. Well, I'll get an identification and have the gun checked by ballistics. In the meantime, I'm going to give this apartment a good going over. Mind if I help? Now, what kind of an answer do you expect to that? You will anyway. He was so right. We started going over the apartment room by room. Closets, drawers, everything. In ten minutes, the coroner and the boys from the lab arrived. And in the bedroom, Walt found something. Take a look at this. Ah, jewelry box. Hey. Pretty expensive. Regal jewelers. Very classy establishment. 
There's a card in the box. For my darling love, George. <laughs> and the guy said he never saw her before. If this is his handwriting, he's as good as strapped in the chair. Well, it looked as if my client, Mrs. Wolf, had a killer for a husband. But a couple of small items still worried me. So I left Walt and went downstairs to find the switchboard operator. Oh, are you with the police? I just left them. Uh, tell me, dear, do you keep a list of the calls that are made through the switchboard? Sure, it costs the tenants ten cents a call. May I see the list? Yeah, I guess so. Here, handsome. Gee, nobody's called me that since I had long blonde curls and a gold yo-yo. I looked over the list of telephone calls and found the ones made by Nancy Fowler during the past three or four days. The last call listed from her apartment had been made at 7.45 that evening to a familiar telephone number. The same number Mrs. Wolf had given me when she left my office earlier. I left for the home of Mrs. Edna Wolf. Yes? Oh, oh, Mr. Diamond, you shouldn't come here. What if my husband... Your husband's spending the night out. What? In a cell, all alone. Oh, you'd better come in. Now, what in the world are you talking about? Well, it looks as if your husband killed a girl this evening. Oh, no. That's the way it looks. Oh, please, sit down, Mr. Diamond. Thanks. I uh, caught him running out of the girl's apartment, forced him back, and found the girl shot to death on the floor. Nancy Fowler? Yes, I think so. It was her apartment. The police are making identification now. Oh, it's just terrible. I wonder why he did it. Were you here in the house at 7.30 this evening? What? No, I was with a friend until about 8.30. Well, a call was made to your house from Nancy Fowler's apartment. She was charged for it, so the call was completed. But she probably talked to George. Your husband swears he didn't know the girl. Claims he got a phone call and she asked him to come right over. That she had something to tell him. He knew her all right. You remember, I told you I overheard them talking. Your uh, husband own a gun? Well, yes, I believe so. Hmm. You know what caliber? No. I don't know anything about guns. Uh, a bracelet was found in the dead girl's apartment. The card with it was signed, Love, George. Oh, it looks pretty bad, doesn't it? If it's his handwriting, it does. Well, I guess he deserves it, but I'll call our lawyer and see what can be done. I'll uh, keep in touch, Mrs. Wolf. I hope you will. Just because the case is finished. Well, there are still a few things that bother me, so I'll just kind of keep looking around until I'm satisfied. You mean you think maybe my husband didn't kill the girl? There's an awful lot of evidence that he did, but uh, there's still a motive to be found. You've got the grounds you wanted, so from here on in, anything I do for you or your husband will be on my own time. Anything you do for my husband, I'll be glad to pay for. Oh, well, now, that's, uh, that's real nice. Hmm. Well, I'll take a run down at the precinct and let you know what the lieutenant has found out. Good night, Mrs. Wolf. Still can't get used to Edna? It'll take a while. <laughs> But you'd be in bed by now, Rick. My landlord short cheated me. What did you find out, Walt? The dead girl was Nancy Fowler. Mm, figured. And George Wolf did do the killing. His gun? Yeah, we checked the registration. His gun, his fingerprints on it, his handwriting on the note in the jewelry case. What does he say about the bracelet and the note? He bought it all right. We checked. Regal Jewelers. Says it was for his wife. You expect him to say something different? No. What's the motive? We'll find it. Probably another man. Here's the report on the dead girl, Lieutenant. Well, isn't it a little late for you, Otis? Why aren't you out flying around some belfry? He's picking on me again, Lieutenant. Maybe you'd like me to tell him about the time I caught you sleeping in the attic hanging by your toe. Oh, not you too, Lieutenant. Otis, I hear you've been picking up some extra money posing for Charles Adams. I don't have to take this. I know my rights, and I ain't no bad. Hmm. Here's something on the dead girl. She works at the Gilded Cage, a nightclub owned by Eddie Young. Eddie Young. Wow. There's a nice little fella. He'd set fire to his grandmother if he thought it was too cold in the room. We'll have a talk with him tomorrow. Well, I guess I, I better be going. Sure. See you later. Yeah, I could sure use some sleep. Yeah. And, uh, Rick, when you get over to Eddie Young's club, give him my best. Smarty. <laughs> The gilded cage where Eddie Young ruled as proprietor and keeper for his flock of hard gorillas was only about six blocks away, so I decided to walk it. But like always, I start in one direction and end up getting sidetracked. Keep walking, Diamond. Don't hmm. turn around. Well, uh, you caught me when I'm right in the mood. You turn around, I shoot you. What's the matter? Don't you want me to spot your Tony? Over to that car. 
Okay. Quit poking. Your muzzle's cold. You drive. I'll get in the back. Oh, I uh, I forgot my glasses. Can't see three feet without them. Get in. But I have a restricted driver's license. You want it right here? I can wait. Where to? Just start driving and don't turn around. We headed east across town with a gun pointed at my neck. I tried to get a look at the guy in the rear vision mirror, but he was sitting too far to one side. I didn't know where we were headed, but I had a pretty good hunch why we were going there. Turn right. And take it a little slower. I don't want to have to shoot a cop. Well, if we're headed for the river, I've seen it. From the bottom? Don't you think we'd better stop at a bathhouse or something? I know a spot where you can go in, clothes and all. Okay. But if there's anything I hate, it's getting my money wet. Turn right again. We were headed for a cross street. I could only turn right or left. A big warehouse was dead ahead. I eased down on the gas and we picked up speed as we neared the intersection. As I started to make the turn, I stamped down on the gas high and at the same time threw myself toward the floorboard. His gun went off so close to my ear, I felt like my head had split wide open. Then we hit the building. <laughs> You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, brought to you by the makers of Rexall drug products and your Rexall family druggist. And here he is. Last week, a customer said to me... I wish I knew some way to be sure I'm getting enough vitamins. Some way that's easy. Yes, and inexpensive, too. Well, ma'am, millions of people have found the easy way to do that. They take Rexall plenamins. Plenamins? Rexall's popular multivitamin capsules. Just two plenamins a day give you more than your minimum daily requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established. Well, you can't expect much more than that. Yet plenamins do give you more than that, for they also contain valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other factors of the vitamin B complex. Say, they sound expensive. On the contrary, Rexall plenamins cost you only a few pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere, and remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. We had hit the building and pushed our way halfway through the brick wall. I was still on the floor, and the motor had been shoved through the firewall and was jammed into the front seat where I had been sitting a minute before. My friend with the gun was stretched out over the top of the seat, his legs resting on the horn and his shoulders through the windshield. I sat up, rolled him off the horn. He was very dead. Before a crowd could collect, I climbed out and got to a phone, called Walt. Are you sure you're all right, Rick? Yeah, I can hear things better now. I just said the other guy's dead. Very, uh, I, uh, I recognized him, too. Uh, Gus Winkler. Holy cow. You know who he's working for now? No. Eddie Young. Oh, that's it. Well, don't pick Young up, Walt. I, I know a few things I haven't told you about, and this almost puts a cinch on it. I, I, I want to talk to Young, and then I'll be down to see you. But if Young tried to have you killed... Oh, if he did, you can't prove it. Not yet, anyway, so sit tight and... When I get there, I'll show you how to catch a killer. Uh, you were going someplace, chum? Yeah, right through that door, chum. Uh, that's Mr. Young's office. Maybe he don't want to see you. Uh, maybe he don't. But he's going to be disappointed. Uh, uh, you, you ain't going in there, chum. I see. Everybody gets disappointed sooner or later, chum. Yeah, what? You... Aren't you in the wrong room? That's what your boy outside thought. I changed his mind. Are you sure you ain't looking for Bellevue, Shellis? You're kind of a mess. One of your boys, Gus Winkler, tried to give me swimming lessons. You can claim his body at the morgue. I don't know what you're talking about. Somebody else who works for you got killed tonight, too. Yeah, who? Nancy Fowler. What? 
Oh, come on, Eddie. I couldn't stand it if you started crying. Who killed her? The police are holding a man named George Wolf. Know him? No, I don't know him, but Nancy's talked about him a couple of times. Hey, boss, that guy just... Forget it, Lou. Well, the boss, he... Forget it, will you? Go on, beat it. Okay. You know, Sean must lose a pretty big boy for you to go pushing around. He's liable to stay mad. So Nancy said she knew this George Wolf. That's right. Rich old guy, from the way she talked, she was taking him good. Where were you between 7 and 8 this evening? Right here in this office. I got witnesses. Oh, I'll bet you have. Okay, Eddie, I'll see you around. I left the office knowing how close I was to the whole answer and called Walt at the precinct. I told him to meet me up the block from the gilded cage, and ten minutes later, he pulled the squad car up the curb, and I climbed in. You find out anything? Yeah, but I have to know one thing first. What time was Nancy Fowler killed? Garner's report puts it at 7.30. Well, that ties it. Now, would you mind telling me what it's all about? I'll do better than that, Walt. I'll show you. But we've got to wait until Eddie Young leaves the cafe and goes home. It was around 12.30, and we settled back to wait. And with an impatient cop sitting next to me, it wasn't easy. Around one in the morning, a boy brought Eddie Young's convertible up in front. We watched Eddie climb in. Okay, Walt, tell him. We stayed close, following Eddie Young across town until he pulled up in front of his apartment and turned into the basement garage. Give me five minutes, Walt. Then come on up to Young's apartment. Why can't I go now? Because what I'm about to do isn't quite legal. And I couldn't stand seeing you blush. Hold it, Eddie. Hey, what's going on? One yell and I'll kill you. Uh, look, look, Devin. Come on, put away that gun, will you? What do you want? Let's go up to your apartment. But please believe me, Eddie. I'll do something bad if you get out of line. We rode the elevator up to Eddie's eighth floor apartment. I shoved him in the door ahead of me and then made sure there was no one else around to get me into trouble. All right, all right. What do you want? Pick up that phone. Okay, we'll take it easy. With you. Well, who do you want me to call? This number and hurry. I'll tell you what to say. Okay, on that. I don't get this. Evergreen Street. What's the matter? Don't you like that number, Eddie? I don't even know the number. Come and dial it quick. Okay. And when you get an answer, just say, this is Eddie. Get right over here. I got to see you. And I'll look Shamus. You look, Eddie. I'm going to hold this barrel right between your eyes so you can see it coming if you make a mistake. I won't make a mistake. Hello. This is Eddie. Yeah. Get right over here. I got to see you. I, I can't talk. Goodbye. Okay, now, will you take that gun away? You look a little worried. What have I got to be worried about? I, I don't know who I was talking to. Oh. That should be the law, Eddie. What is this, Diamond? I'm sorry, I can't show you right now. Good night, Eddie. Wait a minute, you... Come on in, Walt. You said five minutes. Holy smoke, what happened to him? I just put him to sleep. We'll stay that way for a while. Now, Rick, you've got to tell me what's going on. I told you I'd show you. Now, go on in the kitchen and see if you can find some ketchup. Ketchup? Yeah, and then bring it out here and pour it all over Young. Have you lost your mind? Walt, I want, him to make, I want him to make him look like he's bleeding. Now, go find the ketchup or I'll just have to cut his throat. Walt found the ketchup and under protest poured it over the unconscious Eddie Young. Then I made sure the door was unlocked and we went out in the hall to wait. Please, Rick, what is this? It's the same way Nancy Fowler killing was framed, only she was really killed. Right, elevator. Okay. I'll play along with it. Let's go, Walt. <coughs> all right, hold it, Miss Wolf. Oh, Mr. Diamond, he's dead, he's dead. His head is all covered with blood. Why did you kill him? Kill him. I didn't kill him. I just got here. Who let you in? He told me the door would be open. I didn't know you knew Eddie Young. Well, I, well, 
Yes, I know him. He's an old friend. Why? This is Lieutenant Levinson, Mrs. Wolf. He's the man who arrested your husband for the murder of Nancy Fowler. <sighs> Lieutenant, I swear I didn't kill Eddie. Looks bad, Mrs. Wolf. I didn't. Why would I want to kill Eddie? Well, why would your husband want to kill Nancy Fowler? I don't know. What has that got to do with this? You told me you didn't know Nancy Fowler. I didn't. You know Eddie. Nancy worked for Eddie. Well, I didn't know it. I didn't know Eddie that well. You said a girl called your husband and said her name was Nancy. Yes, that's right. You told me you didn't know her last name, and yet when I came over and told you your husband had just killed a girl, you asked me if it was Nancy Fowler. Uh, that's a lie. You said that Nancy phoned your husband that afternoon. She did. She did. I swear and she did. And yet Nancy Fowler's hotel switchboard has no record of a call being made to your phone any time in the afternoon. They made a mistake. But at 7.45, a call was made from Nancy's apartment to your phone number. Then she must have called my husband again. According to the coroner's report, Nancy Fowler was dead at 7.30. Oh, Mrs. Wolf, I can swear your husband didn't go into that building until 8 o'clock. I was following him. Uh, I guess it doesn't make any difference what Eddie did. Did Eddie kill the girl? Yes. I called my husband. I wanted to get a divorce. And his money at the same time. Eddie knew Nancy, so we decided she'd be the one. She let Eddie in. He made her call my husband. Then he shot her. The gun and the bracelet. You just took them out of your husband's dresser drawer and planted them in Nancy's apartment? Yes. I found the bracelet in the drawer with a gun. I guess my husband was going to surprise me. Eddie. Eddie is moving. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, darling. What happened? You're hurt. You're bleeding. Bleeding? Stay still until we can call it. Wait a minute, will you? Hey, what is this stuff? This isn't blood. I'm covered with ketchup. Ketchup? Ketchup! Why, you dirty, no good! Uh, uh, uh. Eddie, we have been framed! Framed? They're all yours, Walt. Why? Good night, Mrs. Oh, I guess now is as good a time as any. Good night, Edna. Helen? Hmm? It's Rick, honey. Oh, isn't that sweet? I was just dreaming. Rick, it's four in the morning. Where are you? Oh, I'm helping Walt close up the gilded cage. Helping Walt close up the what? The gilded cage. Nightclub. I hear music. Hmm. Bud and his accordion will love you. Are you drinking? Honey, I'm with the police force. <laughs> what was that? Oh, that was Walt. He said, Rick... You stood me up this evening. Well, I'm going to make up for it, honey. Listen. Okay, eh? One, two. You made me love you. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. You made me want you. And all the time you knew it. I guess you always knew it. You made me happy sometimes. You made me glad. But there were times, dear, you made me feel so bad. You made me sigh for I didn't want to tell you. I didn't want to tell you. I want some love that's true. Give me, give me, give me, give me what I cry for. You know you got the kind of kisses that I die for. You know you made me love you. That's enough, Abe. How was that, honey? 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 Oh, well. She like him? Well, of course she did. She'll be dreaming about it for the rest of the night. Come on, Walt. Let's dance. <laughs>
Once more, here's your Rexall family druggist. No faster acting aspirin made. That's Rexall aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin contained in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Next time you need aspirin, remember Rexall aspirin. There's no faster acting aspirin made. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Hi Aberback, Stacey Harris, and Victor Perrin. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen, while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Plenamins, for example, Rexall's famous multivitamin capsules. Two Plenamins a day give you more than your daily minimum requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established. Plus, valuable liver concentrate, and iron. What's more, plenamins cost you only pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm a detective agency. We trail them, we nail them. If they're guilty, we jail them. No charge for poetry. Oh, no. Edgar Guest with a shoulder holster. Hello, Helen, baby. Rick, guess what's in town? Unless I win something, I give up. The carnival. Well, is the balloon concession tied up yet? Oh, Rick, I'm serious. I haven't been to a carnival since I was little. Let's go tonight. You mean peanuts, popcorn, cracker jacks, and all that? Yes. Sounds awful. Oh, now, Rick. Please. Uh, okay, honey. I'll be around at eight. Shall I wear my knickers? Rick. Bye. That night, I picked up Helen, and we went to the carnival. There were more people on the midway than Rexall has stores, and we got pushed so much, I felt like the tax bill in Congress. Helen decided she wanted a Cupid doll, so we stopped at the shooting gallery. That's pretty good shooting. Think nothing of it. Just three more bullseyes and you win a dial. Well, here's your dial. Where'd you ever learn to shoot like that? At the skeet club. Would you like to try a shot, Rick? Uh, no thanks. Come on. Oh, Rick, isn't this doll cute? I... And now, oh, your amazement and proof of my statement, I'll ask him to step out here. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Samson, the strong man. Step right up, folks. He'll thrill you with his amazing feats of strength. Now, crowd right in. Don't be shocked. 
There is no... Standing on the platform with the biggest collection of muscles I'd ever seen. Samson looked like an overgrown orangutan. And at least three tigers had contributed their all to the loincloth he wore around his middle. Samson, the great. And now our sensational offer. $100 to any man who will step up here and defy the mighty Samson to put him to sleep by squeezing his chest. Now, it is harmless, my friends. And if any one of you daring gentlemen think the mighty one cannot put you to sleep with a mere squeeze, then step right up. If Samson fails, then $100 is yours. Well, Rick. Now, I tell you, friend. You well, Rick, what? Hurt. Don't you want to show off? Stand, not my insides. You Rick, you mean dollars, you're afraid just to let him fellow. squeeze you? One of you Honey, you I'm afraid to let him breathe on me. $100 Come on, let's go see that fortune teller. I steered Helen toward the next booth before she could talk me into anything my bones would regret tomorrow. The sign outside the tent read, Madam Tanya, your past, your present, your future. And inside, we found Madam T staring intently into a crystal ball. She wore gypsy clothes and a heavy makeup that covered what might have been very lovely features. Welcome to the inner sanctum. Hmm. Haven't I heard you on the radio? She didn't crack a smile, and I didn't exactly blame her. She motioned us into chairs around the crystal. The room was decorated in about the same motif as the tattooed lady, and would have impressed a man with a bad case of DTs. Madame Tanya went back to staring at the crystal, so I followed suit. I couldn't see a thing in the glass ball, but then maybe she picked up television on clear night. The crystal grows dim. Ah. I can see that you are both very much in love. Well, go on. It is good. This man adores you. He worships you. He idolizes you. Wake me up when I propose. You are an unbeliever? Oh, let's be modern. I'm a cynic. The crystal does not lie. But to make certain, I will consult the cards. She picked up a deck that was too big for poker and too small for canasta. I should pay to watch a girl play solitaire? I nudged Helen and we were about to leave when a tall, thin young man pushed back the canvas flap and walked in. Hey, Tony, I just... Oh, I didn't know you were busy. Excuse me. The boy pushed back the flap to go out and then made a sharp, gurgling noise in his throat. He doubled with pain and fell to the floor. Even from where I was sitting, I could see the big, ugly bullet hole in his chest. Don't scream. We'll have the whole crowd in here. Stand back, Helen. Is he hurt bad? You don't need a crystal ball for this, honey. He's dead. Even under the heavy makeup, I could see her face turn pale. I sent Helen to call the police, and then I looked around outside. The killer had either used a silencer, or else the shot was not heard in the confusion. Twenty minutes later, Lieutenant Max Talbert arrived, followed by Sergeant Otis, wearing his Hopalong Cassidy badge. Hi, Rick. Well, hello, Max. Where's Walt Levinson? He's on vacation, Rick. I've taken over his cases. Also his problems, I see. Hello, Otis. Hi, Shamus. So there's been another murder, huh? And you just happened to be here. Sounds suspicious to me. Otis, why don't you stick your head through a piece of canvas and let people throw baseballs at it? And get my brains knocked out? Oh, no. Why not? You got nothing to lose. Rick, uh, Miss Asher told me over the phone what happened. It sounds like we'll be looking for a needle in a haystack. You want to work on the case with us? Not particularly. I just happen to be here, that's all. Yeah, I still think that's awful funny. Otis, I'll send you my confession in the morning. So long, Max. It's not that I wasn't interested in the case, I was. But in my business, you can't poke your head into murder on a gratis basis. So I took Helen home. The next morning, I went to my office as usual, and then around 10 o'clock, I had a visitor. Mr. Diamond, I need your help. Well, thank my lucky stars. Sit down. Thank you. She looked like a well-dressed Lady Godiva, minus horse. I stifled a drool as she sat down, and then I realized that I'd seen her before. This was Madame Tanya, minus the heavy makeup, gypsy garb, and the phony accent. It's about last night's murder. You see, it's not the first. Four men have been killed within a year. And all because of me. Go on. My real name is Tony Lawrence. About a year ago, a boy I knew asked me for a date, and we went out. Next day, he was killed. There were two more after that who showed an interest in me. They both died, too. It's getting so every time a man looks at me twice, he's murdered. Well, it's a pleasant way to die. But uh, what about this kid last night? Well, he 
He'd asked me for a date at a small party we had after the show one night. He worked in the show, but I hardly even knew him. I see. Did you tell Lieutenant Talbert all this? Oh, yes. He says he'll have to make a systematic check on everyone on the show. That could take months. Yes, it could. Talbert's a good cop, though. Why'd you come to me? I want you to go back to the lot with me. I'll arrange to get you a job there. Honey, I got a job. I'm a private detective. Oh, I know. I'll pay you what you ask. Oh, well, that uh, understanding will just continue. Well, maybe working undercover, you'll be able to find out who's behind all this. Well, I, uh... Oh, I'm sure it'll work. I'll get you a job as Barker for the girl show. Hmm. You know, I've always wanted to run away with the girl show. We drove back to the carnival, and I became Rick Diamond, boy Spieler. The kid who was murdered last night had asked Tony for a date at a small party. There were only three other people at that party, and it seemed logical that one of them was the killer. First on the party list was Chuckles, the clown. Tony took me over to his trailer. Here we are. I think you'll like Chuckles. He's got a great sense of humor. Well, Tony, come on in. Can't stay long, Chuckles. I want you to meet Rick Diamond. He's the new barker on the girls' show, and the boss wants me to introduce him to everyone. Well, any friend of Tony's is a friend of mine. Glad to know you, Rick. Yeah. How are you, Chuckles? Yeah, oh, just fine. <laughs> so you got the job at the Shakers, huh? You ever barked before? Only at pet shows. Oh, well, you'll do a good business over there. All the old fogies go to see Karen. She's the head shaker. Is that all she shakes? <laughs> hey, hey, that's pretty good. Put some gags in your pitch. The crowd eats it up. We'd better go, Rick. You start to work soon. Yeah, well, drop around any time, huh? <laughs> Number two on the suspect list was Samson, the strong man. I remembered him from last night and took a last look at my fingers as we shook hands. Glad to meet you. Do you wrestle? No, but I'm a demon with jacks. Oh, I can't find no one around here to play with. Oh, you poor kid. Have you tried the lion cake? Rick's going to pitch the girl show, Samson. Oh, boy, that's no fun. Hey, look, kid, you work out with me, and someday you can be a strong man, too. Well, that's a tempting offer, but I'm afraid I'm just a natural-born sissy. Well, if you change your mind, come around and... And uh, you'll change my posture, I know. Glad to have met you, Samson. So long. Playful little character. He's really very nice. Hey, let's stop here for a hot dog. Good. My favorite meal. Give the man a cooked one, Maisie. Sure thing, Tony. Uh, loaded with onions, honey. No date tonight. Aren't you hungry, Tony? Uh-uh. I've got to change for my act soon. Tell me, uh, how did a pretty girl like you get tied down to a crystal ball? Oh, I don't know. I grew up on shows. Mom and Dad were wire walkers. Well, I don't like high places, so I decided to be an actress. Mm-hmm. Well, after a few feeble stage attempts, I came back here. Now you do your acting in a tent. That's right. If these murders aren't solved soon, I'll be on the move again. Those, uh, those two characters we just met, you think one of them might be the killer? Gee, I don't know. They've always been friendly with me, but... Well, they did overhear that boy ask me for the date. Karen was there, too. Oh, yes, uh, the shaker, as Chuckles put it. You'll probably meet her later on. She's always quick to discover a new man. Well, I can hardly wait. Say, I'd better get back. I'll see you after the show tonight. Yeah, are, mister. It's got enough onions to keep you out of circulation for a week. Tony walked away, stopped, turned, and gave me a smile that made me feel warmer than the hot dog I began munching. She was a very pretty girl. Pretty enough for someone to kill any man she got interested in. And that someone was either a clown, a strong man, or a hula dancer. Yeah, it was quite a mess, and here I was in the middle of it. But as P.T. Barnum always said, there's a sucker born every minute. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you develop a simple headache, what's the first thing you think of for fast relief? Why, aspirin, of course. Right. But it's also smart to think one step further and choose Rexall aspirin. <laughs> Give me three good reasons why. Okay. First, every Rexall aspirin tablet contains five full grains of pure aspirin. Second, there is no faster-acting aspirin made. What do you mean by that? I mean that when taken with water, a Rexall aspirin tablet is ready to go to work for you even before it reaches your stomach. 
Sounds swell so far. What's the third reason? Just this. In the economy size 200 tablet bottle, Rexall aspirin costs you little more than three tenths of a cent per tablet. That I'll remember. And remember this also. You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right up and see Karen and her friends. Come on, boys, don't be bashful. Put your wives on the Ferris wheel drawn in. Get away from me, son. You bother me. Only one-tenth of a dollar plus 15 cents in your old set. You'll see Karen, the blonde bombshell. That night, I yelled my head off. The crowd was heavy, and the men poured into the tent until there was panting room only. I looked at my watch and saw that I had four more hours to go. So I warned my tonsils and kept right at it. My mistake, mister, go on in. Four hours later, I felt like a politician and had a voice like Andy Devine. Tony met me after the crowds had left, and we had a Coke. Tired. Tired? Me? No, oh, no. 37 hours sleep and I'll be as good as new. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Oh, do I have to? I thought the girl show would be great, but they're inside. I'm outside. Well, you'll meet Karen soon. Uh, that's some consolation. No, I'm saying, while I think of it, maybe we'd better not be seen together so much. I got a great affection for life. Yeah, I've thought of that. You'd better go on from here alone. But, Ricky, be careful. I gave her my for-you-I-will look, and then she left. I had been assigned a bunk in one of the trailers and was about to head toward it when something grabbed my arm. At first, I thought one of the snakes had left the charmer's neck, but this one had long blonde hair. Hi. My name's Karen. You got a match? I'd heard the match line in a movie, but what this gal carried around could never pass the censor board. I'd been singing her praises all evening, and now I could see that I'd been guilty of understatement. Thanks. Oh, that's all right. I'm loaded with them. <laughs> hey, you're cute. The last guy had a lousy voice, but you're cute. What's your name? Diamond. You can call me Rick. You want to buy me a Coke? Sure. Well, never mind. I just wanted to see if you wanted to. Well... Any more party games up your sleeve? Oh, sure. Lots more. Uh, I've seen you with Tony. You like her? Well, shouldn't I? I don't know. Only the way things have been happening, it ain't so healthy. Yeah, so I heard. You like her? She's all right. Burns me, though. She makes more dough than I do, and she's strictly no talent. She just makes up them stories. Now, me, I give the boys the money's worth. Well, uh, I'll bet you do. You know, I bet we get along real swell, you and me. Well, I I hope we do. You know, there's nothing but jerks around here. You look sort of like a gentleman. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm just tired. <laughs> oh, I like it. You uh, want to take me into town and go dancing? Well, I'm all worn out tonight. Oh, but... I don't really want to go. Just want to know if you'd like to take me. Oh, we're back at that. Yes, I would like to take you. Good. Oh, gee, it's a nice night for a walk. Oh, would you like uh, to... Let's not go around again. <laughs> Say, you're awful cute. Good night. That night, I went to bed with a lot on my mind and an ice pack around my neck. I was after a murderer who left no clues. The only apparent motive was to keep men away from Tony. Chuckles or Samson? Maybe they were in love with Tony. On the other hand, Karen might be jealous enough of Tony to commit murder. I didn't count sheep that night, just characters. Next morning, while I was roaming around the carnival grounds, I found Chuckles sitting on the steps of his trailer, sewing a bright-colored costume. Well. Hi there. Sit down. Uh, thanks. Hey, you're pretty handy with that needle. Oh, you gotta be. How did it go last night? Well, I'm a little better, but I'm in no condition for a cigarette test. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to yell my lungs out every night. I just stand around and let people laugh at me. I have a friend named Otis who does the very same thing. Say, you should have been around yesterday if you like excitement. Guy was murdered. Oh? 
What uh, happened? Somebody shot him. Seems like the only reason was because he liked Tony. You mean the girl who showed me around yesterday? Yeah, that's her. Ah, oh, I guess not many guys give her the eye. No. <laughs> yeah, there's one fellow that kind of likes her, though. A guy by the name of Leonardi. Oh? Yeah, he don't work here no more. He's on another show. Tony and him write a lot, though. I'm always mailing letters for him. Well, maybe they're just friends. Yeah, that's what she says. He worked on this show before I came over here. I don't really know him, but I bet there's something between those two. Maybe he's the one behind all this. Could be. Well, it's not good to poke your nose into other people's business. You're telling me. Well, I guess I'll look over the show. Yeah, well, drop around any time. <laughs> I left Chuckles and wandered on up the midway. About half past the merry-go-round, I ran into Karen, the curve cram kid. Hi, handsome. Hi, yourself. You know, I dreamed about you last night. You do wonders for my ego. Mm, you do wonders for my dreams. Uh, care if I walk along with you? Not at all. Uh, Karen, do you know a guy named Leonardi? Oh, sure. Used to work here. Why, why do you ask? Well, I've heard he might be interested in Tony. That's risky business, you know. Tony and Leonardi? Oh, no. Now, somebody's pulling your leg. Oh, why Rick, you... I've been looking... Oh, I didn't know you had company. Hello, Karen. Hi. I... I just thought I'd see if you were getting along all right, Rick. He's in good hands. That's all a matter of opinion, dear. Uh, look, why don't you girls amuse yourselves while I make a phone call? Karen, you do the shimmy while Tony tells your fortune. I'll be right back. Both girls were exchanging icy stares as I pulled up my coat collar and walked away. So far, I'd accomplished nothing, and the case was still as mixed up as a chef's salad. I called Max to see if he'd uncovered anything on the latest murder. Homicide, Lieutenant Talbot speaking. Max, this is Rick. How are you coming on that circus murder? Oh. Get screwy every minute. Yeah, I know. The fortune teller hired me. Oh, well, then you know almost as much as I do. Uh, there's one new development, no? Well, don't be greedy, Grandpa. Shoot. That's what someone else did last night. Got a guy by the name of Leonardi. Leonardi. The guy Chuckles told me about. The one who liked Tony. Max filled in with the details. The killer had written a letter to Leonardi and told him to come to a hotel room in the city because Tony was sick and had been asking for him. Then the killer rigged up a gun trap so that when Leonardi opened the door, the gun would go off and kill him. Only Leonardi was still alive. The killer had made one mistake. I thanked Max and went back to Tony's tent, certain I could use that mistake to my advantage. Hello, Rick. Hey, where did little Miss Wigglehips go? I don't think she liked your leaving her. She went back to her trailer. Mm, good. Now, Tony, you told me that only three people were present at the party when Bruce asked you for the date. Are you certain of that? Why, yes. Just Samson, Chuckles, and Karen. They dropped in after the show, and we had coffee. Mm-hmm. Well, I want you to invite our three friends over again after the show tonight. Will you do that? Well, yes, but I don't understand. I went back to the girls' show and began my afternoon pitch. That evening, I went through it again, and then around midnight, I went to the party in Tony's tent. They were all three there when I entered. Sit over here, honey. Thanks, Karen. Hi, you weakling. Oh, please, Samson. I'm sensitive. <laughs> Say, you should have seen the matinee today. We did a bang-up routine and the crowd ended up. We did the old one where we all pile into a car. You know... You... They were all relaxed and I decided it was time to try my long shot. Chuckles was just finishing his story as I took a deep breath and crossed my fingers. Back, and then we all pile out of this little car. Oldest trick in the book, but they loved it. Uh, Chuckles, remember that guy you told me about the other day? I think his name was Leonardi. Sure, what about him? Well, nothing. I was just curious. Did you know him, Samson? Know him? Why, Leo and I used to room together where we worked here. Him and me is the best of buddies. And you, Karen, you said earlier that you knew him, right? Yeah, but I didn't think he was so great. He was nothing but a pest. Hey, you can't talk that way about my buddy. Oh, Samson, please. This is a party. Yeah, take it easy, Muscles. Now, let's see. You both knew Leonardi. That lets you out and leaves only Chuckles. You said earlier that you joined the show after Leonardi left, didn't you, Chuckles? Yeah. <laughs> Say, why all these questions about Leonardi? Because you tried to kill him last night. You thought there was something between Tony and him. What's this? <laughs> it's a joke, that's all. Yes, clown, but the joke's on you. You're the only one who didn't know Leonardi. 
The only one who would rig up a gun trap the way you did. What are you... What are you getting at? When Leonardi opened the door, the bullet went over his head. Oh, well, over his head? That's right. You rigged the trap to shoot a normal-sized man. You're the only one here who didn't know Leonardi, didn't know he was a midget. Well, you, you're kidding. <laughs> he, he's a midget? That's right. Well, Still feel like laughing? Well, I... I... Well, it, it, it's on me. <laughs> the joke's on me. <laughs> you tried to kill my little pal. And, and there wasn't anything between Tony and him, huh? <laughs> and just friends, like she said. <laughs> oh, what a laugh, a midget. <laughs> Why, you dirty... <laughs> Take it easy, Samson. Little Leo's my pal. I'll kill this bum when he wakes up. Never mind, friend. That's the job for the state. And so, dear Helen, my life at the carnival ended and I have come back to you. Beaten, perhaps, but ready to continue my valiant fight against the forces of evil. Justice must prevail. Truth must march ahead to... Oh, Rick. Quiet, I'm auditioning for Portia Face's life. Rick. Hmm. Was that Karen person pretty? Mm Mm-hmm. What kind of a dance did she do? Well, she started by, uh... And then she... Well... Oh. One of those. Mm Mm-hmm. Only more so. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Helen, you're so thoughtful. Rick. Yes, baby? I wonder how I'd be doing that. Doing what? Helen, please. This is more your type. Sweet and lovely... Sweeter than the roses in May Sweet and lovely Heaven must have sent her my way Skies above me Never were as blue as her eyes And she loves me Who would want a sweeter surprise When she nestles in my arms so tenderly There's a thrill that words cannot express In my heart a song of love is taunting me Melody haunting me Sweet and lovely Sweeter than the roses in May And she loves me There is nothing more I can say Oh, that's my type, is it? Come here. Mm, wow. Well? Oh, I guess a man's entitled to change his tune. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Tonight, I'd like to say a special word to users of mineral oil. I know that what you search for is one with an extra heavy body. Well, Rexall mineral oil is refined by a special process to obtain just that. And because it's so exceptionally pure and bland, Rexall mineral oil is non-irritating and non-habit forming. What's more, it's tasteless, odorless, colorless. Next time, try Rexall mineral oil. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Richard Carr, with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Bill Johnstone, Wilms Herbert, Lucille Meredith, Parley Bear, Joe Duval, and Joe Gilbert. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. (laughs) 
Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist, speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names, and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall MI-31, for example. Rexall's popular and versatile mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs almost instantly, yet will not harm delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. Yes, for a dependable, refreshing mouthwash, remember Rexall MI-31. And remember also, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we never say die. Mr. Diamond? That's right. How would you like to make $1,200? Do I have to name the mystery melody? This is not a quiz show, Mr. Diamond. I have a proposition for you, a business arrangement by which you may profit to the tune of $1,200. Oh, well, that's my favorite tune. My name is Evans, Dr. William Evans. I have an office in the Grant Professional Building, Suite 409. Grant Professional Building, Suite 409. Yes, I, uh, I'd appreciate it if you would come right over. Well, it's after six now. I I'll don't... stay in my office until you get here. And so as to save time with explanations... On your way over, pick up a late afternoon times and read the article on page three, column two. A story about a man called Farmer. I locked the office, went downstairs and out on the street where I purchased the late afternoon times. And in the cab, headed for Dr. Evans's office, I read the article on page three, column two. George Farmer burns to death. And the picture of the deceased. According to the article, Farmer had been on a vacation in the North Woods. He'd gone to sleep smoking a cigarette, and that was that. Mattress caught fire, and before anyone noticed, the whole cabin was burning. My cab led me out in front of Dr. Evans's building, and one look at the large crowd, plus the very familiar black sedan in the passenger loading zone, tied my stomach in a knot. All right, now, get back, you. You! Evening, Sergeant Otis. Lieutenant! What are you yelling about, Mellonhead? Oh. Evening, Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, no. I hope you were just passing by, Mr. Don. I saw the crowd, Lieutenant Levinson, and came over to find out if you and Otis were playing hopscotch or possibly kick the can. This is a swell time to make with the jokes. Some guy took a dive out of the fourth floor window. Fourth floor? Dead? Very. Name was Evans. Had offices in the building. Dr. William Evans. <laughs> Guy named Evans. Offices on the fourth floor. Doctor. Some guy. Just 20 minutes before, he'd called me with a $1,200 proposition. And now it looked like the only thing I was going to get out of the deal was a late afternoon paper and a story about a guy named Farmer. Farmer? Burned to death and bad? Oh, yeah. We got a report on the case. Well, this Dr. Evans was hooked up with it in some way. He offered you $1,200? He asked me if I was interested. <laughs> Silly boy. There's the doctor's office. And uh, there's the window he went out of. Who saw him jump? Bill Mitchell, cop on the beat, saw the body come out of the window feet first. Said at least it looked like he jumped. No sign of a struggle? I'll have the boys give the room a good going over. Well, we're pretty sure of two things, Walt. First, there's a strong possibility that Dr. Evans didn't commit suicide. Also, that he knew something about George Farmer, the guy who got burned to death. Might have been Farmer's doctor. Well, there's one way to find out. This uh, Times article says that Farmer left a widow. While you're checking things here, I think I'll go see what Mrs. Farmer's views are on dead husbands and dead doctors. (laughs) 
Yes? Mrs. Farmer? Yes, what is it? I'd like to talk to you about your late husband. Are you from the police again? Well, I just left them, but this is my own idea. My name's Diamond. I'm a private detective. Oh? You working for the insurance company? No. Well, then just what do you want? I'm tired of questions about my husband's death. I've told the police and insurance company everything I know. Well, I know it's been difficult, but I won't take long, and there are a few things I, I'd really like to find out. Well, what are they? Do you know a Dr. Evans? Dr. Evans? No. No, I don't know any Dr. Evans. Your husband never mentioned him, said he knew him? No, he didn't. Besides, what has this doctor to do with my husband? Well, I don't know yet. You mentioned an insurance company. Was your husband insured, Mrs. Farmer? Yes, with the National Mutual. But if you're not working for the insurance company or the police, who are you working for? Me. You? Look, would you mind telling me what possible interest you could have in the death of my husband? Tell you the truth, I really don't know. But there are $1,200 mixed up in it somewhere, and that's enough to keep me well interested until I find some answers. Thank you, Mrs. Farmer. Hello, Walt. Hello, Rick. You see the wife? Yeah, lovely girl. Type you'd like to bring home to Mom. You find out anything? Nothing in the room to indicate the doctor was pushed out of the window. Mrs. Farmer didn't know the doctor. Said her late husband didn't either. But uh, she thought at first I was from an insurance company. Well, what company? Oh, a national mutual. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Got the names of the officials in national mutual? Yeah. Bring them in. Right. Why all the action? We checked with the dead doctor's nurse. She said aside from his regular practice, he worked for two or three big insurance firms. National Mutual was one of them. I didn't think of a connection then, but I made the check just in case. Well, George Farmer was burned to death. Dr. Evans knew something about Farmer. Farmer was insured with the National Mutual, and the doctor worked for National Mutual. Might be a tie-up. Well, the vice president of National Mutual is Arthur Peterson. It's not too late. Let's take a run over to his house and see if he knows anything about it. Well, gentlemen, in answer to your questions, yes, we did insure the late George Farmer, and Dr. Evans does work for us. As to whether or not he was the doctor who examined Farmer, I really couldn't say. I'd like to check the files. Lieutenant, aren't you satisfied? You think there's something wrong? We don't know. Dr. Evans jumped or was pushed out of his office window this evening. Good Lord. He called Mr. Diamond here and indicated he knew something about Farmer's death. Have you settled the claim with Mrs. Farmer yet? No, but it's to be settled within the week. $25,000 policy. Mm. If someone could show your company that Farmer's death was no accident, there'd be a reward, wouldn't there? Yes. 10% of the policy. In this case, $2,500. Oh, half of that would be about $1,200. You uh, think we could look at your records tonight, Mr. Peterson? It's uh, very important. I, of course. I'll just get a coat and we'll go right down to the office. We left with Mr. Peterson and headed for the offices of the National Mutual. A quick look through the file showed us what we wanted. A full report on the state of George Farmer's health. Okayed for insurance by the examining physician, Dr. William Evans. It's too bad the first claim on an accident policy has to be a death. Well, that ties that up. Now what have we got? Enough to keep on looking. I think I'll go have a long talk with Farmer's wife. Our company detectives checked that. She was right here in the city when her husband died. Well, a little talk won't hurt. Who sold Farmer the policy, Mr. Peterson? Um, well, um, according to the files, the insurance man was Mark Names. You have his address here? Yes. Here you are. Good man. One of our leading salesmen. While you're talking with Mrs. Farmer, Walt, I think I'll run over and see this man, Ames. Maybe he can do us some good. <laughs> If the late Dr. Evans hadn't offered me $1,200, I would have okayed his four-floor dive as an act of suicide. But the way things were shaping up, he was going to split an insurance reward. And knowing doctors to be pretty practical people, I just couldn't imagine him giving up that kind of money for a fast trip to the sidewalk. The home of Martin Ames was an apartment on the Lower East Side. His wife answered the door. No, my husband isn't here. I was just leaving. Uh, you know where I can find your husband, Mrs. Ames? It's rather important. I don't know what you want, but if you want to see my husband, that's where I'm going now. I just got a call. He's had an automobile accident. 
Miss? Yes, I'm Mrs. Ames. I was told my husband. Oh, yes, Miss Ames. If you'll just have a seat, I'll call Dr. Tully. He's in charge of your husband's case. But I want to see my husband. Can I see him? You'll have to see Dr. Tully first. But I want to know how serious it is. I should be with my husband. If, if you will just be patient for a moment, Miss Ames, I'll get Dr. Tully. Come on, Mrs. Ames. Let's sit down over here. Now, just sit down right over here and try and relax. Dr. Tully, third floor right. reception room, please. Uh, uh, hello, Alda. Dr. Dr. Tully, come no, to the third No, this is a police floor officer, Miss Ames. Room, please. Police officer? Dr. He's Tully. a friend of mine, Miss Ames. Nothing about my husband. Dr. Tully's the man you want to see. Uh, can I talk with you, Rick? Oh, sure. Will you excuse me, Miss Ames? Oh, yes, of course. You'll be all right? I'll, I'll be all right. Okay, well. Well, this is far enough. About her husband? Yeah, I was questioning Mrs. Farmer when I got the call over the hot shot. I remembered, so I figured you'd wind up here. Have you heard how he is? Died five minutes ago. Oh, no. Accident? Hit and run. Before he died, he told us a car ran him off the road. Went down a 20-foot embankment and right into a cement retaining wall. The wall stopped him from going any further, but broke his neck. Any lead on the other car? No, a lonely stretch of road. No one else saw it. It happened too fast for Ames. Now, wait a minute. That must be Dr. Tully going over to Mrs. Ames now. Yeah, Mrs. That's Ames, Tully. I'm afraid that... He I'm did everything he could. I don't envy him. Your husband is dead. Oh, no. Mrs. Ames. Oh, dear God, Mrs. Ames, no. please control yourself, Mrs. Ames. Oh, Come on, Walt. This is turning into a rotten case. <laughs> Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. I often think that perhaps the most common under-the-weather complaint in the average family is either acid stomach or plain old sluggishness. Well, you certainly hit the nail on the head as far as my family is concerned. And I'm also sure that's why there are literally millions of bottles of Rexall milk of magnesia on hand right now in family medicine cabinets. Why, that sounds almost unbelievable. No, ma'am. Not when you know that Rexall milk of magnesia is both a quick-acting antacid and a thoroughly effective yet gentle laxative. What's more, Rexall milk of magnesia has none of that unpleasant, earthy, gritty taste. Say, my family would really appreciate that. Then why not let them see for themselves just how creamy smooth and actually pleasant tasting Rexall milk of magnesia really is? Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. A little after six, I got a phone call, and by 6.30, the man who called was lying on a sidewalk, broken in two from a four-story drop. Two hours later, an insurance salesman named Ames was run off the road and ended up with a broken neck. Coincidence? Not a bit. Walt found the location of the place where George Farmer had burned to death. Then we climbed in the squad car and started the long drive for the Catskill. Around seven in the morning, we turned off the main highway and onto a dirt road. A sign reading, Sportsman's Retreat, two miles, pointed the way. And 20 minutes later, we were pulling up in front of the lodge. Morning. Morning. Welcome to Sportsman's Retreat. Morning. Well, Police car, ain't it? I'm Lieutenant Levinson, 5th Bracing, New York Police. This is Mr. Diamond. Oh, howdy, howdy. How are you? Are you up here about Mr. Farmer's death? Unofficially. You run the place? Yeah, yeah, I'm the foreman. My name's Pop, Pop Sloan, but everybody just calls me Pop. We thought we'd stay a while, Pop. Can you put us up? Well, sure, sure. How long you figured on being around? Oh, not long. We only brought one change of clothes. Well, come on in. Breakfast was an hour ago, but if you're hungry, I can have the cook rustle up some bacon and eggs. Oh, sounds good. Many people staying here, Pop? Oh, about 14. Yeah, 14. Same crowd comes up every year. Sort of a club, you might call it. Uh, uh, how many years did George Farmer come up? Oh, Mr. Farmer come up about, uh, oh, for the last 10 years. Hey, who owns the place? Mr. Phillips. He ain't here now. 
But he phoned and says he'll be in sometime this afternoon. Say, how come you fellas are interested in Mr. Farmer's death? We had the police and the insurance up here for three days. You're a little late, ain't you? Well, uh, there are a few things we haven't cleared up. Sure appreciate some help, Bob. Yeah, yes, sure. I'll give you all the help I can. I'll go get some breakfast for you, and then we can gab a little while. Hmm? Pop went back to the kitchen, and we relaxed in a couple of big leather chairs in front of a large window that looked out on a row of cabins. That last cabin must have been Farmer's. Yeah, nothing much left of it. Ah, it's beautiful up here. Look at those trees with the sun shining through them. Your soul is showing, Walt. Oh. It was a beautiful place, all right. The cabin stood in the clearing, fronted by well-kept paths and backed by tall trees. Pop came in a little later with enough bacon and eggs to feed a platoon of tapeworms, and we talked. Where is everybody, Pop? Out fishing. Get up about 4.30 around here. Many of the men bring their wives? Oh, some of them. Mr. Farmer used to bring his in up every year. Fine-looking woman, Mrs. Farmer. Didn't come up this year, though, and it's too bad, too. Why? Well, might have saved him. Used to smoke in bed all the time. Maybe if she'd been around here, she might have caught him at it. Um, who discovered the fire? Oh, we all saw it, but it was too late. By the time we got there, the whole place was burning. By the time we got the hose going, there wasn't much left. You say you all saw it. Where were you? Oh, we was up to Willow Peak cooking out. That's about three miles from camp. You can see from there. See? See that tall peak there to the left of them trees? Yeah. How come Farmer didn't go along? Oh, he never went on many hikes. Had trouble with his legs, you know. Anyone stay here in camp besides Farmer? No, no, no. no. Everybody was up at Willow Peak. Mm. Who examined the body? Doc Combs from Evanston come up and looked at the body. Where's Evanston? Mm, about 50 miles east. But if you want to talk to the doc, you'll have to wait till everybody comes in from fishing. Oh, God. Is he up here now? Yeah, yeah. Come up last night. Going to stay a week for the fishing. Oh, Pop. Oh, oh well, good morning, morning, Mr. Phillips. Good morning. I didn't expect you till this afternoon. This, uh, this is Mr. Phillips, the owner. Oh, I have some bags out in the car. Uh, will you get them, please? Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Well, I know. Uh, good morning. Yeah, there's some more police fellas, Mr. Phillips. Oh? Uh, about Mr. Farmer's death? Yeah, I've got to clear up a few things. Uh, would you please get those bags for me, Pop? Bags? <laughs> oh, yes, bags. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, we bags. just wanted to ask a couple of questions, Mr. Phillips. I'm Lieutenant Levinson. This is Mr. Dyer. <laughs> well, how do you do? How, how do, do you do? Do? Uh, do you mind if I sit down? Well, not at all. Uh, I, uh... Thought the authorities were satisfied. No, I guess they are. Uh, where were you when the accident occurred, Mr. Phillips? Oh, uh, I was on my way here from the city. I arrived about an hour later. You live in the city, Mr. Phillips? Well, yes, I have a house there. I divide my time between there and the lodge. Tell me something about Farmer, Mr. Phillips. What kind of a man was he? Well, You I... fellas want any more breakfast? Uh, no, uh, no, thanks, sir. Oh, all right. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> Good old Bob. Uh, well, there really isn't much to tell. Farmer was a nice sort of a guy, rather quiet. As you know, he had a very bad habit of smoking in bed. You have any trouble with him smoking in bed before? Oh, yes, yeah, several times. Nearly started a fire two years ago. Well, uh, wouldn't that make you watch him a little more closely? Well, uh, you see, his wife came up with him every year, but this one, she was usually near enough to prevent any trouble. How long did he usually stay here? Oh, week, ten days, however long his vacation lasted. Mm-hmm. What was his business? I, I think he was in advertising. Make much money? <laughs> I have no idea. He certainly never spent much. He was tight as the devil. He was known for it, in fact. Coming up here was the only luxury he allowed himself. He'd tell everyone he'd save all year just to come up here and relax for a week or so. Hey, hey, Lieutenant, here comes Doc Combs. He must have got his limit. Oh, you gentlemen interested in talking to the doctor? Yeah, Pop tells us he was the one who examined the body. Well, what'd you get, Doc? Hi, Pop, I got my limit. Oh, good for you, good for you. Come on over here. A couple of fellas want to talk to you. Well, how are you, Phil? Hello, Doc. Uh, Pop said you weren't due in until this afternoon. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, this is Lieutenant Levinson and Mr. Dyer. Uh, no. How are you? Uh, police? Yeah, yeah, they want to ask you a few questions. We got to clear up a few things about George Farmer getting burned to uh, death. Oh, Pop, uh, that's hmm? enough, Pop. I was only trying to help. <laughs> well, certainly, gentlemen. Uh, here, will you take these fish, please, Pop? Fish? Hold oh, the fish. Yes, yeah, sure. I'll be right back. Well, I don't think I could tell you much more than I've already told the police. Did you know George Farmer prior to his death? Oh, yes. Over a period of ten years. Did you identify the body? Well, not at first. It was too badly burned. Not at first? You mean you did identify it later? Well, when they told me that George had a broken wrist, I found the broken section of bone and identified it. Broken wrist? Oh, yes, Mr. Diamond. Uh, you see, when George arrived, his lower arm was in a cast. He told us that he'd broken his wrist the week before. 
What day did he arrive? Uh, Tuesday of last week. Well, put in a call to Otterson. Have him find out where George Farmer had his broken wrist treated. Most of all, when the accident occurred. What are you getting at, Rick? Then have him find out the date the insurance policy went into effect. Doctor, uh, which wrist was broken? Uh, the right one. And it was in a cast, huh? Mm-hmm. Would you say he could move his fingers well enough to write? Well, depends on how recent the accident. Step on it, Walt. Okay, but I don't get it. I talked to Otis. He'll get the information. Call us back. Now, would you mind telling me what the devil this is all about? George Farmer had to sign the insurance policy, didn't he? Yeah, but he could have done that with his left hand. An accident policy would cover a broken wrist, wouldn't it? Sure, and what? Mr. Phillips, you said Farber was known to be careful with his money. Yes, that's right. No, I can vouch for that. I treated him for cigarette burns three years ago and had a devil of a time collecting. Thanks, Doctor. Well, so what? So what? So if Otis gives us the answers I want, I think I can show you George Farmer was murdered. Murdered? Yeah. And I think I can explain why an insurance salesman and a doctor were killed. So we all sat around and waited for my hunch to grow muscles. I kept turning the whole thing over in my mind, and the more I thought, the more the whole thing tied together. Around noon, a call came in from Otis, and Walt gave him the information I needed. There it is. George Farmer broke his wrist on the 26th of last month. He was treated at the Olive Hospital. About three weeks ago. He stayed one night at the hospital and went home. What day did he arrive here, Mr. Phillips? Mm, about the 4th. Uh, two weeks after the accident. He died on the 11th, according to the papers. Yes, that's right. He'd been here about a week. When did the insurance policy go into effect, Wall? The 22nd of last month. It went into effect. It wasn't taken out. I said, went into effect. Now, it would cost him a few bucks to have a broken wrist taken care of and spend the night in the hospital, wouldn't it, Doctor? Yes, it would. Remember what the vice president of National Mutual said, Walt? Too bad the first claim on an accident policy had to be death? Yeah. Well, if Farmer had an accident policy, why didn't he put in a claim for his broken wrist? Come on, Walt. We're going back to town and talk to Mrs. Farmer. <laughs> You got your men spotted around the building? Whole block surrounded. Peterson and Evers are covering the front. Cars in every corner. Is Otis going to play? Well, there's been some complaints about noisy cats in the neighborhood, so I stuck Otis and back in the alley. He'll drive every cat right into the river. You might have made a mistake. One yell out of Otis and he'll end up with all the shoes in the block. Yeah, here it is. Yes? Yeah. Oh. Uh, mind if we come in, Mrs. Farmer? No, I guess not. Well, what is it this time, Lieutenant? We think your husband was murdered. But, oh, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, no, you didn't do it, but you ran on it. You know who did. Are you serious? Very. We just had the lab make a check on the insurance policy. The signature and the fingerprints were from the right hand. Well, of course they were. So your husband didn't have a broken wrist at the time? Well, no, he, he did that sometime later. And you'll swear that it's his signature on the policy? Certainly. I went to the doctor with him. I thought you said you didn't know a Dr. Evans. Well, I don't. He was the insurance doctor. Well, I'd, I'd never seen him before or since. How could you expect me Your to remember Your husband the... didn't turn in a claim for his broken wrist. He didn't? Well, that was his business, wasn't it? Don't you think it's rather strange to take out an accident policy and not turn in a claim on your first accident? I don't know. I didn't bother with my husband's affairs. Is this your husband's driver's license? Where did you get that? Motor vehicle department. Is it your husband's license? Yes, I guess so. The signature on this license is not the same as the one on the insurance policy. What do you mean? He means that the signature on the insurance policy is a very clever forgery. Who forged it, Mrs. Farmer? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Who went to that doctor's office representing your husband? No one. Why in the world would I do that? Why would I have someone represent my husband? Probably because you wanted your husband out of the way. That's horrible. Get out of here. That's not true. Who was in on it with you? Who killed your husband up at his cabin at the lodge? Get out. Get out. It had to be someone at the lodge who knew what cabin he was in. No, 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 no. Did you get the papers your husband's picture? Yes. You're lying. The newspapers told us you claimed not to have a... Well, I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Oh, sure you do. 
You didn't want to give the papers a picture of your husband because you knew the insurance salesman and the doctor would identify it as not being the man who took out the accident oh, policy. no. You knew your husband was going to take his trip, so you planned his death and stayed home for an alibi. The picture came out, and the insurance man and the doctor had to be killed. A man killed them, Mrs. Farmer. Someone strong enough to run a car off the road and lift an unconscious man out of a window, feet first. Who killed them, Mrs. Farmer? Hey, you, stop! Stop! Lieutenant! Otis has got something. Well, let's get out on the fire escape. Stop, or I'll shoot! There's a new line. Somebody halfway up the fire escape. Look out, Otis! Move over a wall. Otis is going to hit a herd of elephants in the broom closet. Uh, uh, I got him, Lieutenant! He got him. No, make him happy, Wall. Climb out there and see what we got. Okay. <laughs> now, just take it easy, honey. Frank! Yeah? It's that guy Phillips. The one who owned the lodge. And he's dead. <laughs> well, Mrs. Farmer, that's it. Want to tell me about it? Oh, yes. It doesn't make any difference now. Phillips killed your husband and the other two men? Yes. We fell in love three summers ago. But he planted the whole thing was his idea. Oh, sure, sure, I know. But the state is pretty narrow-minded about those things, honey. <laughs> guy like that gets ideas and gets dead for it. You like his ideas, and you just got to get in some kind of trouble along the way. Go on, Melonhead. I'm in. You're not hurt that bad. I am too. You get shot, Otis? No. But I'd like to ask you something, Shamus. Did you throw a show at me? Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you're suffering the pain of a headache, remember, there's no faster-acting aspirin made than Rexall aspirin. When swallowed with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Ask for Rexall aspirin at Rexall drugstores everywhere. There's no faster-acting aspirin made. And remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards, with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Wally Mayer, Joan Banks, and Bill Boucher. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime de Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen, while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall mineral oil, for example. This is the mineral oil specially refined for extra heavy body. What's more, Rexall mineral oil is tasteless, odorless, colorless, non-irritating, and non-habit forming. Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Uh, just a moment. Diamond. Diamond, pick up the receiver and speak to me or I'll, 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 I'll... Wall, 
Walt, Walt, is that your blood pressure I hear bubbling, or are you calling from Niagara Falls? What's the big idea keeping me waiting like that? Well, the big idea is that it's a beautiful day, and I'm happy. When I'm happy, I whistle. And when I'm happy and whistling, I don't like to be interrupted. I'll remember that the next time you're unhappy and you ask a favor from me. You can whistle then, too. Oh, the great, big, important police lieutenant wants a favor from poor little old Richard Diamond. I want you to go to a funeral. Yours? No, it's mine. <laughs> Say, I'll live to dance the Charleston on your grave, wise guy. Oh, they're burying Bigfoot Grafton this afternoon. How do you know? How do I know? How do I know what? That it's Bigfoot Grafton they're tucking in. The way it read in my paper, the Harbor Patrol fished out a guy presumed to be Bigfoot Grafton, boy racketeer. We're satisfied with the identification. Huh? Fingerprints? Fingerprints. Look, the body was in the Hudson River for nearly a week. Oh. Then tell me, what makes you so sure the guy they're putting in the ground today is Grafton? Look, Diamond, you're beginning to exasperate me. Will you or won't you go with us to Bigfoot Grafton's funeral this afternoon? Why me? Maybe you can show the boys how to dig the grave. Oh, Walt, Walt, that's silly. I don't know a grave from a hole in the ground. So why me? Because you once told me about a little business matter you had with some of Grafton's gang out west. And because some of those same hoods may attend the funeral, and because if any of them do, you'll recognize them. And I can point them out to you. Say, you are a detective. Otis and I'll pick you up in about an hour. Goodbye, Diamond. Goodbye, Bright Eyes. Come on, come on, Billy. How many times have I got to tell you this is the only thing left to do? It's all wrong, Marge. I tell you, there's no need to call in a private eye. Well, hello, girl. Who are you? The name's on the door. Your diamond? Ah. Uh, you see something you don't like? Yeah, you. Oh, you'll never be lovely, be engaged, or get to use puns with an attitude like that. It's a waste of time, Marge, a waste of time. Lay off it, Billy. I know what's right. We came a long way to see you, diamond. All the way from West Frampton we came. We're duckling. Well, first impressions are so deceiving. I almost thought you were girls. Now, look, there's a psychiatrist just down the hall who... Get I'm... this, Billy. The guy thinks we're nuts. Well, maybe you are a couple of ducks, and I'm the one who's crazy. Not ducks. Duckling. Oh. Well, then if you have that kind of a problem, go to the Audubon Society. You never heard of the Long Island duckling? All we done was win the pennant last year. Pennant? Oh, baseball? Now it's coming. We're a girls' softball team. We got our own park out in West Frampton. I play third base. Who's on first? Me. Come on, let's get out of here, Marge. We'll stay. We gotta find Lottie, and he's gotta help us. Lottie? Lottie Wyracek, our second baseman. She's been missing almost a week now. We can't win without our second baseman. Oh, yes. I can see where it must leave quite a gap between first base and shortstop. We ain't gonna win the pennant again unless we get Lottie back, Diamond. We gotta have her. You're elected. Elected? I'm not even sure I accept the nomination. See, let's go, Marge. You don't want the job, Diamond? Well, I've never looked for a missing second baseman before. I wouldn't know where to begin. A fine detective. Here, you, you begin by looking at her snapshot. Oh, no, no, girls. Really, I'm terribly busy right now. I've got to go to a funeral and help the police department look with it. Look at her picture. But I tell you, I... 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 Don't tell me this is... Lottie Wirechick. You mean a girl who looks like this wastes her nights playing second base? Yeah. Wastes, he says. Diamond, stop drooling. You take the job? Well, I, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted, yes. I'm, I'm very tempted. <clears throat> now, let's, uh, let's get some answers first. Ask Billy. She's her roommate. All right. Now, think back, Billy, to a day or so before she disappeared. Uh, she seemed worried about anything? Nervous? Upset? No. Why, she even hit two home runs the very last night she played. She did, huh? Well... I wonder if... Oh, no, no, that isn't possible. The Dodgers do a lot of things, but they wouldn't kidnap people. You say she's been with the team two years? Yeah. Diamond, what sort of questions are these? Please, Lefty. It's my turn at bat. Now, Billy, what did she do before she became a second baseman? Who knows? You'll find her for us? For you? <laughs> oh, no. For me. <laughs> They gave me a pass for the game that night with the Amagansett Amazons, informed me how to get out to West Frampton the quickest way as the E-train flies, then exploded themselves out, leaving me with a snapshot of a second baseman who looked like Jane Russell, only more so. I wasn't able to dream too long because soon the door opened and I looked up to find the most beautiful gabardine suit I'd ever seen walking toward my desk on the frame of the ugliest hoodlum I'd ever seen. Hey, you diamond? To some people... To others, I'm Mr. Diamond. Oh, Diamond. Mr. Diamond. 
The late Mr. Diamond. Yeah, that's the one I like the best. All right, Parrot Puss. Who's been eating your crackers? All right, comic. I'm just a boy with a message. Well, spill it. You had visitors, huh? Yeah? Yeah. A couple of overgrown tomatoes. A couple of tomatoes that look more like they belong to the Russian infantry than to the human race. Well, you're not very much to look at yourself, Ugly. Get on with the message. The message is lay off. Don't go looking for no missing girl. You don't wake up with no bullet holes where your eyes ought to be. Huh? That's the message. The whole message. No signature? You don't need no signature, friend. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, uh just a minute, Repulsive. Yeah? I want to tell you about the last side of the mouth punk who brought me a message like this without a signature. Go on. Frighten me. Go on. Hey, just stand back there, Diamond. Don't come no closer. I'll let you... Don't reach into that pocket, punk. Oh, my arm! Now, oh, let arm. me get it for you. Ah, a luger. Oh, you... And almost as ugly as you are. We won't be needing it for this game. My arm! My arm! Oh, there's your arm. Now, put it up with the other one and I'll knock your head off. seconds later, when I picked myself up off the floor, I looked around for my spar mate, but he'd taken his arms and gone home, leaving me with an eye which for weeks to come would have me lying to people about walking into a door. Yeah, a door wearing gabardine. <laughs> How'd you get that shiner, Diamond? I walked into a door, Walt, a door with a fist at the end of it. Where is this cemetery, South Carolina? We'll be there soon. Bigfoot Grafton won't mind waiting a little longer. Assuming, Sergeant Otis, that it is Bigfoot Grafton they're planting. Oh, no, you're not going to start that again. I told you on the phone. We're satisfied with the identification. What identification? Laundry marks and Grafton shirt. Cleaning marks and Grafton suit. Go on. What do you mean, go on? Look, Walt, suppose you're wanted for murder. Two murder raps. You don't have a chance of beating and suppose that next to the mailman with the income tax refunds, you're the most looked-for guy in the country. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're going to say, Diamond. You think maybe Grafton finds a sucker with his same general build, shoots him in the spine, changes clothes with him, and then dumps him in the big bathtub. That's right, Walt. Well, us silly, confused, homicide cops figured that way, too. Until we checked up on what gave Grafton his nickname. His nickname? Bigfoot. Yeah. yeah. Fourteen and a half. We found his shoemaker. He verified the size. So? So it's possible that Grafton can find a guy that fits his general physique. It's even possible that the guy he finds not only is built the same way body-wise, but wears exactly size 14 and a half Brogans, too. Yeah, it's possible. But highly improbable. Yeah, maybe you're right at that. Well, on behalf of myself and all the other simple-minded fellas known as cops, thank you, Diamond, for saying what you just did. Thank you. There's the cemetery. It was just a simple little funeral. Except that the coffin cost maybe $10,000 more than mine will ever cost. And excluding the fact that there were enough flowers to make a couple of dozen floats for the turnip of roses parade. Yes, it was just a simple little funeral with maybe a thousand simple little mourners. Good conservative people like safe blowers, burglars, con men, petty thieves, and some not so petty. Big wheels, little wheels, chiselers, grifters, grafters, jip artists. Well, Diamond, you see anyone who used to run with Grafton's mob? No, not yet. Hey, now look. Now what's he doing here? Oh. The parrot nose in the stylish gabardine suit. I've been admiring that suit. Gabardine, huh? Too bad a poor little gabardine had to go give up its life just so a mug like that could have a suit. Where are you going, Diamond? Where's that guy? He's a messenger boy. I'll be right back. I edged my way through the crowd toward him, hoping that in view of the solemnity of the occasion, none of the pickpockets among the mourners would make use of the opportunity to swipe my suspenders. Five yards away, he turned. He saw me and started to run. I put my head down like a sprinter and turned to follow. There's nothing like a merry chase in a merry place like a cemetery. And just when I thought I had him... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Diamond! Diamond, what are you doing running into tombstones? Oh, well, I suddenly remembered it's been years since I had a collision with a tombstone. Ooh, what were you chasing that guy with a fancy suit for? I wanted to find out who his tailor is. Look, uh, Otis got a good look at that twerp I was chasing. Tell him to go through Rogue's Gallery and try to identify him for me, huh? Yeah, but where are you going? Me? No, I think I'll go to a ball game. 
It was a good game as games go, fast and exciting, and my girls did themselves proud. Eight three. Even though the girl who was playing second in place of the missing Lottie made three errors. After the game, I was in the corridor outside the dressing room talking to Billy, the first baseman. The one who didn't think I should have been hired to bird dog the missing girl. Look, Diamond, this is all for nothing. Lottie ain't missing. We never called on you. There's no case. Now, that's the same tune with a slightly different lyric and ugly in a gabardine suit sang to me. It's a good thing I'm stubborn. It's a bad thing, Diamond, for you. It's gonna maybe cost you your life. No. No! Don't! It happened that fast. By the time I turned around to see who did the shooting, he had disappeared in the crowd. Dirty heel. Diamond, what happened? I heard shooting. Stand back, everybody. Send for a doctor. Oh, my God. He grabbed me. I was on his team. Who, Billy? Who? I told him, Marge. Called on you to find Lottie. Who, dear? They'll kill Lottie. They'll kill Lottie. Billy. Uh, 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 Billy. Diamond. Is she? Is she? If anyone asks you who's on first, the answer is no one. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. I've discovered lately that a lot of people think they don't need to take any precautions against vitamin deficiency during the summer months. But the truth is, we're just as apt to be low on vitamins during the summer as any other season. Then you think people should continue right through the summer taking a vitamin supplement? Indeed I do, ma'am. And the one I recommend is Rexall Plenamins. Why exactly? Well, just two plenamin capsules a day give you more than your minimum daily requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established, plus valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other beneficial factors of the vitamin B complex. Say, with all that, they must be expensive. On the contrary, plenamins cost you only pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at any Rexall drugstore. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name... Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond, this department isn't in operation so that you can find girls. I don't care how she looks in her baseball uniform. Oh, but this is business, Walt. I tell you, she's been kidnapped. Another girl on the team was just murdered. Another murder? Where? West Frampton. West who? Frampton, out on Long Island. City limits? No. Uh, that's the quickest case I ever marked closed. What do you want to waste my time with imported homicides for? Don't I have enough to do right here? Oh, but what? Don't but got... bot me. They've been knocking each other off like flies this week. We're so jammed up, I got three sifts that don't even have a place to lie down. Four, if you include Otis. Oh, just for that wise guy, I ain't talking. Oh, if I could only be sure of that. I mean, I ain't talking about the guy you played tag with in the cemetery. I found him in the picture book, all right, Diamond. It took me two hours. And just for making cracks at me, I ain't telling you his name. Whose name? Joe Gabardine's, that's whose. And I ain't telling you what else I found out about him in the picture book either. Why not? Because you think you're smarter than the whole police department put together. That's why not. Oh. And so if I go spill to you that this Joe Gabardin used to work as a gunsel for the late Bigfoot Grafton, you're going to right away say Bigfoot Grafton ain't dead after all. And that I'm a dope. Walt, you hear that? The guy that threatened me if I went looking for Lottie Wirecheck, this Joe Gabardine, is one of Grafton's boys. Say, who told you? Was one of Grafton's boys. Grafton's dead. No, but maybe not. Maybe all these shenanigans are part of Grafton's plot to put some sucker in his coffin and stay undercover. Sure, sure. Maybe Lottie Wirecheck knew in some way or other that the guy they fished out of the river and buried today wasn't Grafton. Look, Walt, you got a... Uh, 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 Diamond, tell me. Uh, That name you said, the the one that sounds like something spelled backwards. Wirecheck? That's funny. What's funny? That's the same name as this dame's in the file missing person sent over. Only this one's name is Lottie Wirecheck. So is this one, you dope. You mean there's two dames with a name like that? Yeah, just like there are two heads on a sergeant named Otis Loveloon. 
Now, listen here. Who reported her missing? Just for being a fresh guy, I ain't gonna tell you. You ain't gonna tell him what? That it says here on the file card that this doctor reported her missing. Who said anything about a doctor? Huh? You sick, Otis? You need a doctor? I ain't sick. Besides, he ain't that kind of doctor. He's a dentist. Who's a dentist? This Dr. Alman. Dr. Percy Alman. 223 Park Avenue. So? What do you mean, so? What about him? What do you mean? What about him? Well, you brought him into the conversation. Dr. Percy Alman. You said 223 Park Avenue. What made you mention him if you don't have anything to say about him? He's the guy who reported this laddie whatchamachek missing, you dope. Gee, Diamond, are you dumb? <laughs> Dr. Percy Alvin's home for decrepit teeth at 223 Park Avenue was a fancy schmancy establishment where bad little molars and becuspids went in for punishment. I could tell even before I met Alman that he was the kind of drill artist who assured the customers there'd be no pain. No pain at all, and there usually wasn't. Until the customers got their bills. The office was a ground floor professional suite that opened directly on the street, and when I pushed open the door and went in... This kind of nice middle-aged guy greeted me with, Yes? I'm uh, looking for Dr. Alman. I'm Dr. Alman, but it's after my office hours, young man, unless it's an emergency. Well, it's, uh, it's about Lottie. Lottie Wirecheck. Lottie? You're from the police. You found her. Well, not yet, no. And I'm not from the police. Not the... Who are you? My name is Diamond. I'm a private investigator. Oh. <laughs> you gave me quite a turn for a moment. Well, I'm sorry. Doctor, I'd like you to tell me a few things. What sort of things? Lottie Wirecheck. What's she to you? Oh, presently just a friend. Uh, formerly the best dental assistant I ever had. An extremely nice girl. Yeah, yes, I, uh, I saw her snapshot. A dental assistant, huh? Yeah, lovely, lovely girl. Um, I hated to lose her. But this baseball thing had been burning in her for a long time. Look, Diamond, just how much do you know about all this? Oh, I know that Lottie's missing. Maybe in trouble. Well, uh, I do need help, and perhaps I'd better tell you everything. I'm game. But I think I should warn you, the information I'm going to give you is dangerous. It may mean your life. Well, I'm uh, still game. Maybe not as much as a few seconds ago, but... Yeah, very well. A year or so ago, I had a patient, a man who called himself Dunn. George Dunn. And then you found out that Dunn wasn't Dunn at all. That he had very big feet and he was a racketeer named Grafton. Yes. You were very clever, Diamond. It was a gentle chart he wanted. He threatened me. I felt that if I ever gave it to him, he'd feel the necessity for uh, for killing me. So I gave the chart to Lottie to keep... It happened so fast, I barely had time to leave behind a chair. One second, the doctor and I were talking. The next, everything was bedlam and confusion. And blood and death and anger. My anger. The doctor had caught one smack between the eyes. And I got mad, shooting mad. I charged out of that office maybe ten seconds behind the killer, just in time to see him get into a car and melt away into the traffic. He headed east, then south, and east again, then stopped at a crummy-looking building and went in. And that's when smart, shrewd, clever private detective Diamond climbed a drain pipe, tore his pants, looked inside a second-floor window, saw a girl tied to a chair, and like Lockenbar, broke in to rescue the fair second baseman in distress. Lottie? Look out! Oh, oh, this was getting monotonous. The billy caught me on the back of the neck, and while it didn't knock me out, it didn't make me feel like dancing either. The first thing I was aware of when I oriented myself to my new condition was the biggest pair of feet I'd ever seen. And the next thing I saw was the gabardine suit containing in its bright, clean folds the filthiest little murder artist I'd ever seen. So I made like a possum and pretended I was asleep. So... Say, Grafton, I told you the shamus followed me. I won him. He's all yours, Joe, I promise, but later. Why later? Why wait? Because I gotta get that dental chart, that's why. Now that you've rubbed off the dentist and that goofy Billy the ball player, that chart's the only thing in the world that can prove Bigfoot Grafton's still alive. So why does that have to hold up Diamond's execution? Because maybe he knows where the dental chart's hid. I'm giving up on the dame here. She'd have told us long ago if she knew. If Diamond knows, he'll talk. Even if he don't know, he'll talk. And scream, too. Later, Joe. Now put that pig sticker back in your pocket. I don't hear you, Grafton. This Diamond made me unhappy, and I don't like to wait. I said put that knife away, Joe. I still don't hear you. All right.
right, Joe. I knew this was the only chance I'd get. They were too busy showing each other their fangs to give me their undivided attention. And so the possum stopped playing possum, made a stab at playing tiger. The act started with a well-aimed kick to what the fight reporters call the midsection. And the gabardine suit folded limply and sagged to the floor like it didn't even have a man inside it. And that's when Grafton pulled the gun, and that's when I made a grab for his knees. And you guessed it, there was a shot. And then there was a punch that made a mess out of a jawbone. And I'm happy to report that this time it wasn't mine. Oh, you're wonderful. What's your name? Well, honey, my name's Diamond. Diamond? Yes, dear, and believe me, a diamond is a girl's best friend. Hadn't anyone tell you I was a lonely one Tell you I used to lie awake and wonder If there could be A someone in the wide world Just made for me Now I see I had to save my love For you I never gave my love Till you And through my lonely heart demanding it, Cupid took a hand in it. I hadn't any war till you. You're so romantic, even with a black eye. Oh. Oh, Ricky, darling, it must have been dreadful. Oh, it uh, it had its moments, Helen. Yes, I saw that photograph. The second baseman. What's the matter with the second baseman? Well, Ricky, if she were any good, wouldn't she be a first baseman? Honey, honey, I don't think you understand too much about baseball. Teach me. Oh, it takes years, baby, years. Well? Hmm? Well, uh, well baseball's a game that's, uh, that's uh, divided into innings. Nine innings. Inning? What's an inning? Maybe I better teach you how to play post office. No, no. Ricky, please. Well, uh, uh, let's see now. An inning is a, a sort of a division, a, a stanza, a, a, a frame. Yeah, that's right, a frame. A frame? An inning's a frame? Hey, you're digging it. No, I'm not, Ricky. Not really. Maybe we'd better forget it. All right, all right. And... Inning is a frame. That's right, dear. An inning is a frame. Mm. Ricky, was she nice? Lottie? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll say this for her. She sure had a beautiful inning. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Don't wait until you're already suffering from acid stomach and then wish you had Bismarex on hand. Buy a bottle tomorrow. This famous Rexall antacid often neutralizes excess acidity within one minute. More than that, Bismarex gives relief that's continuous and prolonged because its scientifically balanced ingredients work in sequence, easing gastric distress and leaving a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Ask your Rexall druggist for Bismarex. He'll tell you, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Michael Camroy with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. 
Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, John Daner, Bill Conrad, Virginia Gregg, Gloria Blondell, and Sidney Miller. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall aspirin, for example. There's no faster-acting aspirin made than Rexall aspirin. When swallowed with water, Rexall aspirin is ready to go to work for you even before it reaches your stomach. Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. <laughs> No, 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 no. Oh. Yeah? Well, what's the matter with you? Oh, hello, Helen. Nothing has gone right all day. I called your office, but you left an hour ago. What took you so long getting home? Well, I had to stop by the laundry. Didn't have any clean shirts. Are you forgetting we're supposed to be at my mother's at seven? No, honey, I'm not forgetting. What time is it now? A little after six. No, nuts. What in the world's wrong? Well, first of all, I haven't seen anything that looks like a client for two weeks. That's unusual. I only got two hours sleep last night. You're complaining? Oh, no, 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 honey. Then what is it? Well, that stupid laundry gave me the wrong bundle. I can't go over to your mother's with my bare chest hanging out. Well, can't you go back and get the right bundle? Well, it closes at six. Oh, be practical. It was the laundry's fault, so use one of the shirts out of the wrong bundle. They'll have it clean. No, what if it doesn't fit? Make it fit. Now, I won't have you being late again. No, well, all right, all right. I'll see you at seven. I still love you. Then tell your mother not to suggest Monopoly again. I have to get some sleep tonight. The shirt wasn't bad. A little short in the arms, but with my charm bracelet, no one would notice. I shaved, cussed a little, showered, cussed some more. Really let loose with some choice ones while I got dressed and kept it up all the way over to Helen's. She walked out in the green number that plunged so far it could have been arrested for attempted suicide. Sure cure for cussing. Like it? The guy who went off the Golden Gate didn't have half a drop. Oh, stop perspiring and come on. Helen's mother lived in a 40-room vault on Long Island. We had a wonderful dinner. Soup, salad, pheasant on the glass. The only thing missing was cracked crab. Until Helen's mother suggested Monopoly, then I nearly shelled her and ducked her in the mustard. About one o'clock, my eyes felt like two, three-minute eggs lost in a sand pile, so I gave up and went to sleep right in the middle of a tricky trade for my railroad. Helen apologized, looked at me hatefully when I suggested a piggyback ride to the car, and by two o'clock, she dropped me in front of my flat on 53rd. You were horrible. Oh, well, how did I know your mother had the electric company, too? Oh, no. I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. Kiss. You can't even keep your eyes open. This is going to stop me. I do my best work with my eyes closed. No. All right. Honey, are you growing a beard? That's my mink coat. Oh. Night. Good night. Good evening, Frank. Hmm? 
Your name's Diamond? Yeah. What do you want? I got some laundry that belongs to you. Well, that's nice. Nothing like getting your laundry at two o'clock in the morning. You got mine. We'll stop around about noon tomorrow and we'll swap. I'd like it now, friend. I gotta leave town. Oh, look, I'm a little tired, friend. I want the laundry. Yeah, well, you're dealing with a bad customer. I just traded Pennsylvania Avenue for one lousy railroad. What? Come back tomorrow, friend, and I'll give you your laundry and a detailed explanation. I want the laundry now. Now, look. You look. Well, if anything could have opened my little old sleepy blue eyes, it's that lovely gun. You look divine together. Now, let's go up and get the laundry. What's the matter? You got the only long underwear with sequins? Move. And I moved. Up to my little flat with the laundry man sticking close enough so I wouldn't forget the big gun on his hot little hand. We went in and traded bundles. You opened it, huh? Well, what did you want me to do? Put it on a table and offer up prayers? You're a little too wise for your own good, but I got what I wanted. No hard feelings. Yeah, well, I hope your socks fall down. You just stay put until I'm out of the building. Thanks, friend. Well, any other time, I might have done something ridiculous, like chasing the guy or calling Walt up and complaining about the inadequacy of the old police department. But this wasn't any other time. It was after two in the morning, and I was tired. Sure, it was unusual to trade laundry at that hour, but I was in no condition to try and figure it out. So I brushed my teeth, left my clothes in a neat pile in the corner, and stumbled into bed. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I'll never get any sleep. I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah? Mr. Diamond? Yeah, who is it? This is Mr. Green, Mr. Diamond. Well, thanks for calling, Mr. Green. Good night. Oh, wait, wait, please wait, Mr. Diamond. This is Mr. Green, the man who owns the Bluebell Laundry. Well, how's business? Can you come over to my apartment right away? Why? Someone's going to try and kill me. What time is it? Three o'clock. Look, can't you hide in a closet or something until noon? I tell you, someone's going to kill me. Oh, get in a closet and close the door. If anyone opens it, take a bite out of the nearest coat and head for the closest bright Dude, light. This is serious, Mr. Diamond. I haven't got much time. Well, if you don't think you can look like a moth, maybe I'd better drop around. What's your address? Savoy Arms, Apartment C. And hurry, I'm desperate. Well, if you're just half as desperate as I am sleepy, you're really in trouble. I'll be right over. <laughs> I stumbled back into my clothes and downstairs and a quick walk down to the park where I could grab a cab. Then ten minutes later, I was knocking at the door of apartment C. No answer. I was about to try the door when it opened. Uh, Mr. Green? You're too late. Mr. Green. He opened the door all right, but that was as far as he got. He just slid down and stretched out on his stomach, head turned sideways, thick glasses pushed up at an angle... His weak eyes trying hard to see everything there was to see before they closed for good. I kneeled down beside him. Jones. Wrong laundry number. Jones. Green. Green. Well, everybody dies. He'd been shot just under the heart from the back. A warm breeze made me turn and look out the open window on the far side of the room leading out to a fire escape. I went over and looked out. Nothing. But it was a good bet that the killer had shot Green from there. I put in a call to Walt, and in ten minutes he was standing over Green. And this is the guy who owns the laundry and gave you the wrong bundle. That's right. How do you always get mixed up in things like this? Well, it's a talent. Did he say who he thought was after him? Oh, he just told me that he was in fear of his life. Now, what about the guy who shoved the gun in your face and took away the bundle of laundry? Oh, about my size. Had a hat on, light gray suit, brown eyes, heavy eyebrows, high cheekbones, very sharp features. Well, let's go down and run through the gallery, see if we can get an identification. Okay. But first, let's take a run down to the Blue Bell Laundry. Might be a good idea to find out what this is all about. <laughs> Uh, here it is, Lieutenant. Blue Bell Laundry. Oh, he read the sign. Mm. If a guy with fangs and a long black cape answers, drive a stake through his heart. Or shoot him with a silver bullet. You keep your suggestions to yourself, Sergeant, or I'll open this door with your head. Uh, these keys are a better shape. I tell you, we can't use them. 
If no one answers, then we got to get a search warrant. Why? Because that's the law. What is? That we got to get a warrant to search the laundry. Well, what do you want to search the laundry for? What do I want to search it for? Because a man's just been killed. Okay, so what? What's that got to do with the laundry? The guy who was killed was the guy who owned the laundry. You told me yourself it had something to do with getting the bundles mixed up and that guy who stuck you up tonight. Okay, but you can't just go busting into a laundry just because of a stupid little old hunch. What do you mean, stupid? You could be wrong, you know. Just because you think you might solve this case, that's no reason for you to go busting into a laundry. Well, why not? The answer to this whole thing might just be in that laundry. Well, you've certainly been right in the past. No, not always. Oh, well, most of the time, Wall. Well, just lucky. Well, if you think it's best, here are the keys. Well, you understand, right? Oh, sure, sure, Wall. Lieutenant. Yeah? Oh, nothing. You stay out here, Sergeant. Well, we're in. I hope the commissioner doesn't hear about it. About what? Breaking and entering. Breaking up. What? Why, you... You... Fiend? Yes. Walt hopped around for a while until he ran out of steam, and then we went to work took the laundry apart. The way it stacked up, I had gotten the wrong bundle of laundry. The guy who'd stuck me up in two in the morning had gotten mine. So the bundle that I had gotten by mistake figured to be pretty important. There must have been something else in there besides clean shirts. So, Green, the owner made a mistake. Oh, but that's kind of hard to do, Walt. You've got to have a ticket to get your laundry. Ticket with a number on it? Well, sure. It should correspond to the numbers on those bins. Hey, wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. Before Green died, he said something about a wrong number and a name. What name? Uh, uh, uh Jones, Jones. Now, look, when I brought my laundry in, Green wrote my name and number down in a book. Let's see if we can find that book. Walt took one side of the shop and I took the other. Inside of ten minutes, we had the book. We turned to the page with deliveries dated the day before and found my name. Now, here it is. Richard Diamond. Uh-huh. Laundry number 99. That's right. That was the number on the ticket I gave him. Then Green didn't make a mistake. But he'd have to to give you the wrong bundle. He couldn't get mixed up with the bins, Mark. Walt, turn that book around. Turn it around? Upside down. Ah. Now, if that number was on a ticket and I handed it to you upside down... 66. Yeah. Who's listed under 66? Say it's not on this page. Uh, here. Well, I'll pick... Be... John Jones. No address. <laughs> John Jones. Green had said Jones before he died. Jones had the laundry ticket marked 66. Green had evidently looked at my ticket upside down and given me Jones's bundle. Green couldn't have known anything important was in that bundle or he wouldn't have made the mistake. And then why was he killed? Doesn't figure. Well, if he was just a go-between, it does. He didn't put the important something in the bundle. Or he would have just held the bundle until Jones arrived and given it to him. Then the bundle came wrapped with the something in it. Now, now look, Walt. You know how these small places work. They, they send their stuff out to a large laundry and cleaning plant. Yeah, but which one? Hey. Yeah, I got a shirt on it from that wrong bundle. I bet it's got a laundry mark. Should be on the collar. Let's see. Well, let's not strangle me, huh? Let me unbutton a few buttons. Oh, Scott. Well, go ahead, Grabby. Let's see. Yeah, there's some writing on the collar. I'll read it out, and I'll write it down. Uh, eight, six, A, four, five, L. What kind of a laundry number is that? Find out, and you might have the guy who slipped something in that bundle and was responsible for Green's death. <laughs> We went through the rest of the place, but found no evidence to show us what big plant Green sent his laundry to. I bowed out as gracefully as possible and went home to get some sleep. It was 4 a.m. when I stumbled into my flat with just one thought in mind. Sleep. And I got it in a hurry. Come on, now, snap out of it. No. Come on, come on, sit up. No, leave me alone. Somebody sapped you. No, I don't care if you split my head in sections. I went to sleep, didn't I? What happened to your shirt? My shirt? All right. Oh. Oh, so that's it. What's it? The shirt. That's what the guy was really after. Suppose it was Jones? Well, sure it was. Walt, when he, when he traded bundles with me, 
He didn't have any way of knowing that I'd taken a shirt out of it. That shirt was what made that bundle important. Those numbers on the collar. I checked. They weren't a laundry mark. Uh, you still got them? Yeah. Well, they sure mean something. Let's see if we can figure out just what. <laughs> I gave Walt a pencil and paper, and we put our two brilliant minds to work trying to figure out the numbers that had been written on the collar of the shirt. Just numbers with two letters, A and L. Easy problem for two brilliant students of criminology. I got it. You have? Let's take the numbers down to the decoding department. Oh, that's what I like. Perseverance, a sharp mind, and nothing's too tough for us. Well, come on, come on, Art. You've been working on those numbers for nearly five minutes. Well, I've been sick. Could this be a code for some kind of a pickup? Ah, yes, it could be. Well, let's use times and dates. First number is eight. No, well, today's the eighth day. Well, the letter A could stand for AM. 6A, 6AM. Could 88, 6AM. And 46L could be the where. Hmm, 46th in any street beginning with L. Out of the way corner. 46th in Lexington, and that's not out of the way. Oh, I'm sure glad you broke that code, Walt. Ah, experience and a little common sense. Come on, you and me are going over to 46th in Lexington. You and I, Walt. I could stand for idiot. That's another <laughs> code, Arch. Fourth letter in Levinson. Oh, come on, we haven't got all morning. <laughs> You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, brought to you by the makers of Rexall drug products and your Rexall family druggist. And here he is. Every woman will tell you that the ideal home antiseptic is one that will serve as a mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant, all with equal effectiveness. And that's exactly what Rexall MI-31 does. Well, now, how did you know that? Because I read all about it in your big ad in this week's issue of Life. Say, isn't that a good ad? A whole page crammed full of top-quality Rexall products. Some of them at special bargain prices, good all this month. And every one of them just as reliable as Rexall MI-31, America's popular all-round mouthwash. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of MI-31 at the same price as other leading brands of smaller quantity. That's why I've learned to watch for your ads. I learn all about these wonderful money-saving values. And they always remind me of so many things I need, too. Then maybe I'd better tell our listeners that this same full-page ad is appearing in current issues of Collier's, Look, Saturday Evening Post, and Country Gentleman. Check it carefully. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah, this is a good spot. No one on the corner of 46th and Lexington yet. What time is it? Uh, five minutes to six. No, I hope we figure this out right. Car 86, car 86. Oh, that's us. Car 86, Levinson, go ahead. Sergeant Otis wants to speak with you, Lieutenant. Oh, go ahead. Lieutenant, I checked and found out where the Bluebell Laundry sends its cleaning. Two companies, Monarch and the Superior Cleaning and Dying Works. Uh, Mr. Ralph Collins owns Monarch and... Uh, Mr. Arthur Levin on Superior. Find out the addresses of the plants and the home addresses of the owners and then put a stake out at the homes of the owners. Don't pick them up, but stop them if they're trying to leave. Wilco, Roger and out. Oh, I'm surprised he didn't get tired of Roger and use McGillicuddy just to be different. Hey, Walt, there's our boy. Huh, Jones? Yeah, across the street on the corner. Same guy who got the bundle from me. Let's go. No one else yet. He's waiting for something. It's about two minutes to six. Yeah. A car pulling up. Jones is going over to it. Get going. Guy in the car gave Jones a package. They spotted us. You get the car, I'll take Jones. Stop! Stop that car! Stop, Jones! Jones! Okay. Uh, Car got away, but I put some bullet holes in it. Drop the gun, Jones. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm hurt bad. Don't don't shoot again. Get me an ambulance, will you? Walt, he's got another bundle with him. I'll get back to the car and get the wagon. I think, I think he got me in the stump. 
You want to talk? Yeah, yeah, okay. What's in the bundle you got from the car? Junk. A hundred thousand in morphine. How did Green figure? Just a go between. He worked for the big boy. Took our money. Sent it in with an order for the stuff. Instructions in the collar of one of the shirts. Yeah. You killed Green? Yeah. yeah. Who's the big boy? Jones. Jones. The wagon's on its way. Uh, He's dead. What was he picking up? Narcotics. Well, Walt, we know the code was put in the laundry bundles at one of the cleaning works. Well, go to both of them and check. Yeah, and you can never tell what else might turn up. We waited until the wagon pulled up and carted Jones off, then we headed across town toward the first of two stops, the Superior Cleaning and Dying Works. 7.30, when we pulled up in front and let ourselves in with one of my pass keys. This is the only one we can check quietly. They open at 8, don't they? Yeah, got a half an hour to make a noose for a pretty big operator. <laughs> So we went to work on the superior laundry. Guys like Jones were caught every day, but the big boys, the ones who dished out the stuff from the top, the big syndicate operators were tough to catch. And here was a chance to catch one. We got into the office and found the order books. Jones appeared in nearly every one. This was the place where Green sent Jones's laundry. But it still doesn't prove enough. We've got to prove that the code was slipped in the bundle from this plant. Then we've got to find the guy who does it. Well, come on. We've got to work fast. This joint opens up in a half an hour. Hey, Walt, hold it. Car pull up outside. Yeah. I can see it out of the window. Rick, it's the same car that passed the junk to Jones. The one I put the bullets in. Hey, he's coming in. Hey, he's... He's coming up here. Get in the other room. Yeah, leave the door open. Hello, Mr. Levin. Yeah, hey, Charlie. Well, there was some trouble. Cops were waiting. Yeah. I'm down at the place. Nah, I got away clean. Uh, Jones had the bundle, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'll blow. Let's take him. Hey! Hold it! He's making a break! Stop! That's your cover! He's got a gun! Blow him up! Well, he's had it. Yeah. Know him? Charlie Asher. Narcotics record. This shirt turned into a mess. Yeah. Let's go see Mr. Arthur Levin of Superior Cleaning and find out what kind of cleaning works he's been running. Hi, Lieutenant. You got the whole place surrounded. Levin hasn't tried to leave. He's been out of the house once, went to the garage. Have anything with him? Well, now, when he came out, went in with a big box. All right, let's take him. You better get out of sight, Otis. You'll see that uniform and get jumpy. Get down there in the end of the porch. All right. Yes? Police, Mr. Levin, we'd like to talk to you. Oh, well, uh, come in. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to my office. Where is your office, Mr. Levin? I own the Superior Cleaning and Dye Works. You do laundry for Mr. Green's Blue Bell Laundry? I do work for a lot of laundries. I believe that Mr. Green happens to be one of them. You know a man named Jones? I know more than one Jones. How about a man named Charlie Usher? Charlie? No. No, I don't know him. He called you 20 minutes ago. (laughs) No, he didn't call me. You're very much mistaken. Now, would you mind telling me what this is all about? How many workers do you have at Superior, Mr. Levin? About 40. Any of them have police records? (laughs) No, not to my knowledge. And you don't know Charlie Usher? No. No, I told you I do not know him. Well, he had a key to the front door of your laundry. Use your office phone. I can't help that. He called a Mr. Levin. But I have never talked with a man named Charlie Usher. I swear I... What was in that box you brought in from the garage? Box? Books. Books. I brought some books in. Where are the books, Mr. Levin? I already... I put them in the shelves in the library. What did you do with the box? I I, I burned it. Uh, I I don't like dirty boxes lying around the house. You went outside and burned it? Yes, yes, in the incinerator. My men said you only came out of the house once, Mr. Levin. Then your men are mistaken. I went out twice, once to get the box, uh, the books, and the second time to burn the box. Look, what right have you got to hide outside my house and watch it like a bunch of burglars? I know my rights. I want to call my lawyer. Oh, sure, sure, Mr. Levin. You go right ahead and call your lawyer. 
In the meantime, we'll see if anything was burned in the incinerator. It would be burned out by now. That was uh, 20 minutes ago. About the time Charlie Usher called He you. did not call me. I don't even know him. Well, even if you did burn the box 20 minutes ago, Mr. Levin, there'd still be some smoking ashes. And if it wasn't burned in the incinerator, Mr. Levin, we'll take this house apart piece by piece until we find it. I'll go check wait, a lot. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, yes, Mr. Look, Levin. Look, I'm, I'm not sure I, I burned the box. Then you didn't go outside the second I, time? I, I don't know. I, I don't remember. I, I'm all mixed up. Look, you've got to give me time to think. Well, if you didn't go out the second time, the box is still in the house. Look, please, please do this. Give me time. What's me... in the box, Mr. Levin? Books, I told you. Books. Where is it? I don't know. Leave me alone now. Now, will you leave me alone? I know my rights. Start taking a house part. No, wall. no, no, please. Where's the box? Please. The box, Mr. Levin, the box. Yeah, where's the box? Uh, under the sink. Where under the sink? There's a sliding paddle under the kitchen sink. Narcotics, Mr. Levin? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm ruined. You marked the shirt collars and sent Charlie Usher to deliver the stuff. That's right. I had ten laundries working for me. Green was one of them. Uh, ruined. Ruined. Oh, relax, Mr. Levin. You can be happy about one thing. Jones and Usher didn't cooperate like you did. And they're both dead. <laughs> Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you're often troubled with acid stomach, or if you're looking for a gentle, non-irritating way to achieve regularity, try Rexall Milk of Magnesia. Pure, mild, creamy, smooth, and with no unpleasant earthy taste. Rexall Milk of Magnesia is justly popular. Buy the economy size quart bottle. It costs only 69 cents at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Clayton Post, Sidney Miller, Virginia Gregg, and Stacey Harris. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen, while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Plenamins, for example. Rexall's famous multivitamin capsules. Two Plenamins a day give you more than your daily minimum requirements of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established plus valuable liver concentrate and iron. And yet, Plenamins cost only pennies per day. Ask for Plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, Andy Hintz on Happy Homicide. I beg 
beg your pardon? I said Diamond Detective Agency. Handy, handy. Yes, yes, I heard the last part, but I just wanted to be sure there was nothing the matter with my phone. Uh, Mr. Diamond, I wish to hire you. I'm touched. One hundred dollars a day in expenses. I'm touched. Well, if the figure depresses you a little, I suggest getting out in the fresh air. Exercise. Play a little golf. If you could use a dandy caddy on Sunday... I can easily afford the fee, Mr. Diamond, but to be frank, it wasn't exactly what I expected. Isn't it a little high? Well, frankly, yes. But if you hire another detective, you won't be getting the prettiest. I see. Uh, Can you come to my house at six this evening? Name, address, and reason for hiring me? George Lexington. Golden Strand, Long Island. And I'm in fear of my life. I'll see you at six, Mr. Lexington. On the dot. Please be prompt. Just have a substantial retainer ready. Aside from my blue eyes, greed and promptness are my two most outstanding features. Well, that's the way a buck's made in my business. I sit around the office for a week, passing the idle hours, playing old Welsh mining tunes on a comb. Then someone gets in trouble, opens the phone book, and naturally the first thing that must catch their eye is my very gaudy full-page advertisement on the Diamond Detective Agency. After that, a phone call, and I'm in business. At six sharp, I was ringing the doorbell at the home of Mr. George Lexington, client in fear of his life. Yes, sir? Mr. Diamond, to see Mr. Lexington. Mr. Lexington is busy at the moment. Does he expect you? I have an appointment with him at six... Oh, I see. Please step in. If he'll wait in the library, sir, I'll tell Mr. Lexington you are here. Uh, uh, What was that? Unless you keep a car in one of the upstairs rooms, that, my friend, was a gun going off. Come on. With the butler right behind me, we took the long, curved staircase three steps at a time. The butler managed to pant out that Mr. Lexington was in the study at the head of the stairs. So that was the door we went through, only to be stopped cold on the other side. Standing in the middle of the room was a girl. The word girl in this case, to be identified with adjectives one might think of after having spent three lonely years on a life raft in the middle of the Atlantic. The only thing that kept my eyes from melting and running down on my shirt was the thirty-two revolver she held in her gloved hand. Miss Morris, no! Give me the gun, honey. No, no! Drop it, honey. You just scorched my money belt. She dropped it, and we all went to pieces. I helped her to a seat and let her cry it out. The gun I could have passed off as a whim or too many Hopalong Cassidy adventures, but the man sprawled across his desk on the other side of the room changed the whole picture. I called the 5th Precinct Police Station and got Lieutenant Walter Levinson started for Long Island. The police? You shot a man, didn't you? Yes. You tried to kill yourself, didn't you? <laughs> Well, they're both against the law. Want to tell me about it? He deserved it. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes? I just found something rather strange. Well, don't scratch it. Miss Morris shot Mr. Lexington, all right. I never denied it. Well, what's bothering you? The thought just occurred to me. Who also took the trouble of stabbing him? Stabbing him? He was shot. Then how do you explain this carving knife in his back? Oh, now, Diamond, you stop that. But it's true, Walt. Sure is, Lieutenant. Been shot in the chest and got a knife in his back. Now, how do I get in on these things? This is uh, Miss Morris, Walt, the girl who shot him. How do you do? Oh, you shot him, huh? Yes, Lieutenant. Well, who stabbed him? I have no idea. Swell. Miss Morris, why did you shoot this, uh, uh, what's his name? Lexington, George. Why did you shoot him? I refuse to answer. Okay, suit yourself. Where's the coroner, Walt? Should be here any minute. I didn't stab him, Mr. Diamond. When you came in, did you talk with Lexington? I just opened the door, saw him sitting at the desk, and I shot him. Did you talk to him? Oh, sure, sure, Walt. She played 20 questions with him while he was trying to paw the knife out of his back. I was just trying to trap her. Why? Why? Because if she said she'd talk to him, it would have been an admission that, uh, uh, uh... She'd talk to him. No, that he was still alive before she shot him. Okay, who stabbed him? How do I know? Well, if he was still alive before she shot him, she talked to him, then she must have seen who stabbed him, right? Yeah. Well, if she saw who stabbed him, she couldn't have done it, right? Right. And no one would have stabbed Lexington if he'd already been shot, right? No one would have stabbed Lexington if he'd already... Yeah, of course. You think I'm stupid? Uh, Lieutenant... You shut up! So if they stabbed him, he hadn't been shot and he was alive. Of course. Then if he was alive and they stabbed him, the girl didn't do it to confuse you. Huh? 
So if she didn't do it, she can go home. Go on home, Miss Mars. But, Mr. Diamond... You heard him. Go on. Uh, that's what I was trying to tell you, Lieutenant. Diamond's at it again. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant? Take the girl, the butler, and Diamond down to the car. And when the coroner gets here, we'll all take a little drive down to the station. Understand? Yes, Lieutenant. What are you yelling at? I don't know. I, uh, I mean, I don't know. Well, the coroner finally arrived and suggested an autopsy for the corpse and a bath and some hot mud for Walt. Then we all climbed into the squad car and headed for downtown New York in the 5th Precinct Police Station. On the way, I told Walt about my phone call from Lexington about 3.45 that afternoon and the few details leading up to finding June Morris with a smoking gun and the dead Mr. Lexington. At the station, we continued to question the girl as to her motive for the killing, but she refused to say anything. The butler could add nothing, so they were taken out to await further questions. She was allowed to call her lawyer, and we all settled down to wait for the coroner's report on the autopsy. Yeah? The dame's lawyer is here. Wants to see you first. Okay. Girl's lawyer. Mr. Farnsworth, Lieutenant. Hello, Lieutenant. What is this all about? Mr. Diamond, Mr. Farnsworth. How do you do? How are you? I just got a call from Miss Morris. Uh, Lieutenant. Uh, pardon me a minute. Well, what do you want, Hammerhead? I got the girl's personal effects. Well, give them to me. Okay. Gee, what did I do? Nothing, Sergeant, but your family sure botched things up. Oh, there you are, Lieutenant. Thank you. Gee, I don't know. Am I to understand that Miss Morris is being held here on a murder charge? That's right. Just whom is Miss Morris supposed to have killed? You know Mr. George Lexington? Why, uh, yes, he's the boy. Maybe you can tell us why she would want to kill him. I suggest you question the witness, Mr. Diamond. But let me warn you beforehand. My advice to my client will be to say nothing until I can find out more about this thing for myself. Now, about Miss Morris. She stays put. Lieutenant, I have a great deal of influence. Then get her rich. She stays put. What about this George Lexington's background, Mr. Farnsworth? Let me give you one more suggestion before I leave. Find these things out for yourself. I have a fair reputation in the legal profession. Good I... evening, Mr. Farnsworth. I'll have that writ, Lieutenant. Ah, oh, go to blazes. Mm, nice fella. A doll. Well, let's see if there's anything in these personal effects here. Take a look through the purse. Okay. Uh, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Bring in the butler. Right. Here's something, Walt. Well, what is it? A uh, typewritten note in the bottom of her purse. What's oh, that? Meet me at the house at a quarter of six this evening. Bring $15,000 and be prompt or you will regret it for the rest of your life. Signed, George. George Lexington. Mm, well, bully for you. Diamond, I swear. Out to the butler, Lieutenant. <sighs> Come in. Sit down. Well, thanks. My face... Not you, me. Melonhead. Get out of here. Oh, well, okay. I just thought... Otis. Yeah? When the coroner's report comes in, bring it right in and bring the girl along with it. Yeah, Lieutenant. How do you feel, Arthur? A little upset, sir. This has been quite a strain. Last name, Cameron? Yes, sir. How long have you worked for George Lexington? About four years, sir. Ever since Mr. Lexington came east. Did you know him before that? No, sir. You ever mentioned where he was from? California, I think. Had a lot of money? I presume so. I was paid regularly. He maintained a good-sized house and entertained frequently. To my knowledge, he never had any debts that weren't paid immediately. How long have you known Miss Morris? Well, she and Mr. Lexington were engaged two years ago. It only lasted a few months. But they still saw each other occasionally. Did you know Miss Morris was expected tonight? Yes, sir. She called and said she would be there at uh, 5.45. You sure about the time? Yes, sir. But you didn't expect me at 6? Uh, no, sir. Mr. Lexington said nothing about it. Hmm. Is there another way into that study? Uh, yes, sir. A back door leading down to the garden. Did uh, Lexington have any other visitors during the day? No, sir. Was he in from three to five? Yes, sir. Uh, I got the coroner's report and Miss Morris, Lieutenant. Okay, that's all, Arthur. We'll have to hold you until this thing straightens itself out. You go along with Sergeant Lovelorn. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Arthur. Yes, sir. Does Mr. Lexington own a typewriter? No, sir. All right. Come in, Miss Morris. Sit down. Uh, here's the report and the bullet taken out of Lexington and the knife. Take the butler downstairs. Right. Let's go, Arthur. Yes. 
When did you receive this note, Miss Morris? Oh, where? Uh, we found it in your purse. When you become a murder suspect, I'm afraid nothing's very private. This morning. It's from George Lexington? Yes. He have something on you. Okay, you're just hurting yourself. Miss Morris, did you know a man named Jack Short? No. Who's Jack Short, Walt? Just read this report. Here's what it says about the late Mr. George Lexington. Fingerprints check one Jack Short, arrested 1936, 38, 39, petty theft, suspicion of robbery, suspicion of possessing narcotics, three arrests, one conviction. Did a year and a day in Alcatraz. When did he have time to do his laundry? He was arrested again in 1942 for manslaughter. Went to trial, case dismissed for lack of evidence. Lovely boy. You mean George Lexington? Was, was really Jack Short a criminal with a record? But his house, servants, the money he spent. That's something we're going to find out about. What does the coroner's report say, Walt? The knife did kill him, not the bullet. Oh. And the knife has got your fingerprints all over it, Miss Morris. What? It's got a what? That's right. Ever see it before, Miss Morris? I, I don't know. It's a carving knife. One that might belong to a set. <gasps> something wrong? My carving knife. I missed it this morning. Sure. When was the last time you used it? Last night. I gave a small dinner party. Do you own a typewriter, Miss Morris? Yes, I do. Hello, June. You better come along with me. Oh, Mr. Farnsworth. Uh, just a minute. What's the idea of busting in here like this, Farnsworth? Uh, I tried to stop him, Lieutenant. You should have stuck out one of your big feet. Those things could trip a tank. I told you I would be back with a writ. Well, I'm here, and there's the writ. Come, June. She stays right here. Lieutenant, you don't seem to understand. No, you don't seem to understand, Mr. Farnsworth. You got that written and was sustained because I was nice enough not to issue a formal complaint. Also, there's a little matter of influence. You're darn right, and I'm going to show you how it works. I'm making a formal complaint right now, and the charge is murder. And if you don't think I can make it stick, I won't even bother to throw you out of my office. I'll let the commissioner do it for me. Now get out of here. Gee, you're wonderful, Lieutenant. You shut up! Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. One of the questions most often asked a druggist is this. What can I take for fast relief from acid stomach? I've often wanted to know that myself. What's your answer? Naturally, ma'am, it's Bismarex. Rexall's justly famous antacid. Well, why? What is it that makes it so outstanding? Well, the secret lies in the scientifically developed formula. You see, the active ingredients in Bismarex vary in the time it takes them to dissolve in the stomach. That way, the relief it gives is not only fast, but continuous and prolonged. Excess acidity is often neutralized in less than one minute. Then the other ingredients, dissolving more slowly, ease up that gastric distress. And finally, Bismarex leaves a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Well, I'll have to remember that. Bismarex. Is that how you say it? That's right, ma'am. B-I-S-M-A hyphen R-E-X. Bismarex. Ask for Bismarex at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, Farnsworth got the idea in a hurry and took off like a rabbit with his tail on fire. Walt lived up to his word. After making the formal charge and producing the evidence, the writ was dismissed. He then secured a search warrant for both Miss Morris's flat and George Lexington's house on Long Island. Our first stop was Miss Morris's apartment, and when we went in, I thought how much it looked like her. Small, beautifully decorated. We went over the whole place, nothing except in the small den. There's the party list she told us about. Hmm. Good 30 names here. Typed. And there's a typewriter. You got that note you had in the purse? Yeah, uh, here. Top of the E is blocked out like on the note. Same machine. No. Bring the typewriter, Otis. Right, Lieutenant. You're going over to Lexington's home? Yeah, aren't you coming along? No, I got an idea. Do me a favor, will you, Walt? Well, sure, why? 
When you get over there, besides checking that back door to the study, put in a call to the phone company and see if a call was made around 3.45 this afternoon to El Rado 1234. It's a toll call from there, and they'd have a record. Well, let me write that down. El Dorado, one, two, three, four. Yeah. I'll call you at Lexington's in about an hour. If that number wasn't called from there, check every name on that party list. Well, there are 30 names there. You want me to check each one to see whether a call was made to El... What's the matter? El Dorado, one, two, three, four. That's your office number. Well... Yeah. Bye. I left Walt turning that awful green and headed for the Times building. It was a little late when I got there, but an old friend at the morgue noticed the $5 bill I was wearing in my lapel and agreed to take care of it for me while I looked through the newspaper file. I dug up everything on Jack Short and his alias George Lexington. The stuff on Short wasn't much, except the trial for manslaughter had made the front page. The items on George Lexington could all be found in the society columns. From what I could gather, he'd started his social world in 1944. He'd been engaged several times, and each time to a wealthy woman. I even came across a picture of June Morris on the evening they had announced their engagement. Well, having all the information I could get, and with one little item dated California, June 26, 1942, tucked away in my pocket, I put in a fast call to Walt, who was at the home of the late George Lexington. Yeah? What did you find out? Well, someone could have gotten in the back door. There were some blurred footprints outside in the garden, but they won't help. If you had a key, you could let yourself in and walk right up the study. What about the phone call? There was no call made from here to your office, but uh, one of the names on the list paid off, a uh, Mrs. Julia Wright out on Long Island. Now, uh, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Now, you stay right there, Walt. I'm going out to see Mrs. Julia Wright. If she called your office today at 3.45, you certainly must have talked to her. George Lexington called my office today at 3.45. But he couldn't have. The butler said Lexington wasn't out of the house and the call wasn't made from here. Well, someone called. Maybe it was the right day. Maybe she got a low voice and told you she was Lexington. Walt. No. Oh, forget it. You wouldn't like it anyway. Diamond? Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Wright? My butler says your business is a matter of life or death. Well, that's a little exaggerated, but it's one sure way of getting by the red tape. Then what is your business, Mr. Diamond? I, uh, I'm from the police. Oh. Do you know uh, Mr. George Lexington? Why, yes, slightly. Are you married, Mrs. Wright? Very happily. What is your interest in Mr. Lexington, Mr. Diamond? Do you know June Morris? Mm, quite well. I've known her family for at least 20, uh, 10 years. She's being held for the murder of George Lexington. Oh, that poor girl. She was engaged to Lexington at one time, wasn't she? Yes. He was a beast. Believe me, Mr. Diamond, he deserved killing. I thought you said you only knew him slightly. Why, oh, I, I, June used to tell me how terribly he treated her. A phone call was made from your house yesterday at approximately 3.45 to El Dorado 1234. Mm, I don't believe I know anyone at that number. Are you sure? A man made it. I talked to him. My husband wasn't home yesterday. Oh, perhaps it was my lawyer. He was here about that time. In fact, I believe he did make a call. Said it was on business. A call from the library. What's your lawyer's name, Mrs. Ryan? My, Mr. Lucius Farnsworth. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I certainly don't like the guy, but his reputation's been spotless. It's just got to be, Walt. Here's the girl, Lieutenant. Uh, come in, Miss Morris. Thank you, Lieutenant. Hello, Mr. Diamond. June, the note you received was written on the typewriter in your den. What? Lab just sent up a report. You think I sent that note to myself? No, no, no. But can you remember anyone using the typewriter in the last two days? No. No one has used it but myself. What about the night of the party? Who uses the typewriter at a party? Anyone go in the den and maybe lock the door? What? Why, yes. As, as a matter of fact, Mr. Farnsworth said he had to make some business calls. He went in and closed... You don't think that... That Farnsworth did it? Why, it's absurd. He's been with my family for years. Did he introduce you to George Lexington? Yes, it was at a party at Julia Wright's. Did Mr. Farnsworth know that you owned a gun? No one knew it. 
Were you actually using that knife the night of the party? Yes, I, I sliced some turkey. Hmm. You remember what kind of a suit Mr. Farnsworth was wearing that night? He was wearing a dinner jacket. Lexington was blackmailing you, wasn't he? I can't answer that. Oh, honey, believe me. If you don't trust us and it comes out in a way, we'll have no way of stopping it. Oh, right, it was blackmail. I was going to marry George. There were some letters, some... A picture. He broke off the engagement and began demanding money. Last week he mentioned something about leaving town, and I received the note. I couldn't afford that kind of money, and I was just tired of paying month after month. I decided to kill him, and I was afraid to kill myself. I guess I lost my nerve. Let's go see Mr. Luke Farnsworth, Rick. June, you sit right here until we get back. Be careful. Uh, you can make a book on it. I'm going to drive you home. <laughs> Use your paw. All right, all right. There he comes. Yes, what is... Oh. What do you want, Lieutenant? I got any hot coffee? If this is your idea of some kind of a joke... Mind if we come in? I most certainly do. Thanks. How dare you break in here like this? I can cause you a great deal of trouble, Lieutenant. How well did you say you knew George Lexington? Only slightly. Hey, get a load of these fancy ashtrays, Walt. Yeah, but I don't go much for modern. Pretty drapes, though. Oh, the policemen are being casual. You only knew Lexington slightly, huh? Yes, and this is the third time I've said it. You must make a lot of money. I have wealthy clients. How much did Jack Short pay you to get him out of that manslaughter charge? What? You remember him. Sensational case. Made you quite a reputation. Of course, I remember it. This shirt was sure a handsome fella. Uh, did he uh, change his name later? I, I, I don't know. That, that was a long time ago. Didn't he uh, change it to Lexington? George Lexington? What is this all about? Mind if we look around the place? I most certainly do. Is that your bedroom? You have no right to go in there. Where's your water? Hmm. Nice bedroom. Get out. Get out. I'll call the commissioner. Why don't you do that? Uh, these your keys? Put, uh, put those down. Take it easy. I wonder if one of these fits a back door to George Lexington's study. Don't be ridiculous. I've only been to Mr. Lexington's house twice in my life. Arthur the butler will verify to that. You mean you've only been there twice by the front way? I mean exactly that. What are you doing in that closet? Nice wardrobe. This your dinner jacket? Lieutenant, I warn you. No, I'm going to warn you, Farnsworth, officially. Anything that you may say will be held against you. I'm charging you with the murder of George Lexington. <laughs> this is really one for the books. Would you mind telling me what proof you have? You call my office at 3.45 this afternoon from the home of Mrs. Julia Wright. Disguised your voice and told me you were George Lexington. Really? Hearsay. You were at a party given by June Morris. You stole a carving knife that she'd been using, probably wrapped it up in a handkerchief to keep her fingerprints on the handle. Did someone see me? For some reason, you wanted George Lexington out of the way. He'd been blackmailing victims that you introduced him to. You made sure that Miss Morris would be at his home at exactly 5.45. You wrote a note on her typewriter telling her to be there. You called me to be sure that someone would catch her. Interesting theory. You went up the back way into the study, probably with one of these keys. You stabbed Lexington and got out just before the girl came up. You made one mistake. You didn't figure that the girl might try to kill Lexington. What? Yeah, she shot him. But she shot a dead man. She shot him? After he was dead. You don't know it, Buster, but you just missed the perfect crime. Now prove it. The girl said you were wearing a dinner jacket the night of her party. This the coat? Yes. And to get the knife out, you had to put it in a pocket or someplace on you. She'd been carving turkey. Ever hear of a spectrograph? Of course. Sure. Have the pockets analyzed, and if we find traces of turkey, we'll know you swiped the knife. And if the key to Lexington's back door is on this ring, it'll cinch it. I'm afraid not to. Come back here, Barnsworth. He's going for the window. Barnsworth, stop it. Let me go. Let me go. Not on your oh. life. Not on your life. Me... You don't take it the easy way. Get hold of his head. No, oh. no. Got him. No, 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 no. Why didn't you let me jump? What difference would it have made? Well, it sure would have saved the state some money. But a quick trip to the sidewalk doesn't make up for a killing. That's the easy way, Farnsworth. You forget when you commit murder, there's a little thing called society. 
And if you can't live with people, they'll decide what to do with you. Oh, that last mile is a Lulu. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you're a user of mineral oil, remember that Rexall mineral oil is carefully refined by a special process to achieve an extra heavy body. What's more, because it's so exceptionally pure and gentle in its action, Rexall mineral oil is non-irritating, non-habit forming. You'll also like the fact that it's tasteless, odorless, colorless. Next time, try Rexall mineral oil. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Ted Osborne, Betty Moran, Howard McNear, and Virginia Gray. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall Milk of Magnesia, for example. Here's the milk of magnesia that's so pure and creamy smooth, so free from that unpleasant earthy taste. Even children spot the difference. Ask for the Rexall Milk of Magnesia at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency. With camels who know their detectives best, it's Diamond, two to one. Ricky? I won't admit a thing. Last person who called me Ricky saw me stuck in a bubblegum factory. Whole deal blew right up in my face. Ricky, this is Pat. I'm in trouble, bad trouble. Somebody steal your last name? This is Pat Stenz. Pat Stenz. An old friend of several years standing. Blonde, attractive, and the owner of a plan to eliminate cranium luster. To the aging juveniles of the world's biggest city, she might easily be called the mother protector of hairlines. In other words, like the sign says in the front of her uptown salon, she grows hair. You've just got to come down to the place. Honey, I've graduated, you told me so yourself. Another treatment and I'll be wearing a snood. Ricky, I'm on the level. I'm in trouble. Something's happened to one of my customers. What's the matter? Did he sprout feathers? Well, almost. He sprouted wings. He's dead. <laughs> Now, phone games with Pat weren't a hobby. She might kid a customer about the condition of his scalp, but when she called me to say she had a corpse on her hands, I knew she hadn't been sampling her hair tonic. I told her I'd be right down, call Helen, broke my date, locked the office, set a few traps for impatient clients, and 15 minutes later, I was in Pat's office talking to a pretty frightened little blonde. Oh, Rick, I just don't know what to do. Now, honey, first calm down. Now, who's dead and where? 
A man named Wiley. John Wiley's on the vibrating table. Why didn't you call a doctor or the police? Because I think he's been murdered. Murdered? Looks like his neck's been broken. I didn't know what to do. I was afraid of calling the police. Well, baby, if one of your customers got his neck broken in here, you're going to get mixed up with the law sooner or later anyway. The publicity will ruin my business. Honey, murder always ruins something. You got any idea who might have done it? No. Well, who was in the place when you discovered the body? My usual three girls and two customers. Anybody leave or come in? No. How many people know about it? Just the girls. Neither one of the customers. Oh. Well, first we lock your front door. I don't want anyone to leave. Then we'll take a look at the dead man and find out if his neck really is broken. If it is, we call homicide. We locked the front door and Pat let me down a hall with booze on either side. In two of the booths, I spotted the customers relaxing as girls in white uniforms worked on their receding foreheads. At the end of the hall, we stopped at another booth and closed by a white curtain. In there, Rick. Okay. The vibrating table was centered in the middle of the room, an enclosure about six by 14 feet. The table was built at an angle so that when a patient climbed up and stretched out on his back, his feet were elevated a good 16 inches above his head. The angle and the vibration increased the flow of blood to the scalp, and under normal conditions, it's considered very healthy. But the man lying on the table now wasn't getting the full benefit of the treatment. His shoulders extended over the end of the table, leaving his head hanging down at a grotesque angle, rolling from side to side with the monotonous rhythm of the vibration. Oh, Rick. Not very pretty, huh? I forgot to turn the table off. I think I'm going to faint. Just take it easy. Was I right? You had to be. A circus rubber man would need vulcanizing if he turned his head that far. Busted neck, all right. Guess we better call the police. Can you keep the customers out of here? What if one of them gets inquisitive? Tell them the table's out of order. I'm going to call homicide and tell them Mr. John Wiley's in the same condition. As frightened as she was, Pat played it pretty well. She had tipped off the girls and started swapping jokes with their balding clients to keep them happy. I went in the office, put in a fast call to the 5th Precinct Homicide, and ten minutes later, Lieutenant Walt Levinson and Otis, his trained anthropoid, were looking at the late John Wiley. Sure looks like murder. I guess it would be better if he had a knife in his chest with a sign on it. Who was in the place when it happened? Pat, three girls, two customers, and a dozen assorted gay gypsies. Oh, for Pete's sake. Pete has an alibi. What was the dead man doing on the table, anyway? Trying to grow hair. Oh, that's silly. Who ever heard of anybody growing hair on a table? <laughs> Sergeant Lovelorn. Well, I thought it was pretty funny. Go out and round up everybody in the place and take them into the office. Then call the precinct and get the coroner down here. Then, if you're a good little boy, you can go out and play in the traffic. Well, a murder is a mess any way you look at it. A man lying on a table with his neck broken. Four women and two men, the only ones around when it happened. Bad publicity for a nice little working gal named Pat Stenz. But you can't hide it when it happens. Someone gets killed, someone gets hunted. And everybody concerned gets mixed up in it. Walt herded everyone into the office and the questioning started. The men were very unhappy. That bad publicity it couldn't be helped. Mr. Robert Wells, songwriter. Look, I don't know anything about it. I never saw the man before. Surely you can't possibly suspect me. Why in the world would I want to kill him? It's ridiculous. And the other, Mr. Jacob Green, jeweler. Oh, my goodness. My head is still wet. John Wiley? I never saw him before in my life. Not in my whole life. Hey, Pat, give me another towel, will you? Kill him? For why? I got a mother-in-law. First things come... <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, you see? You see? My death I'll catch from Jersey. <laughs> Two prosperous men, two prosperous denials. The girls came next. Three girls who worked for Pat. First, Mary Carroll, the girl who had worked on John Wiley. The one who had helped him up on the table and massaged his neck and forehead for five minutes. Sure, I put him on the table, but I left him like always. We let them lie in there and relax for about ten minutes, don't we, Pat? That's right, Lieutenant. That's the way it works. Mary left him and went over to start on Mr. Wells. That's right, Lieutenant. She did. Mary's a pretty strong girl, isn't she, Mr. Wells? Yeah, she could break break your neck. Oh, now, wait a minute, Lieutenant. You think she could, Mr. Wells? She's pretty strong, I guess, but 
She wouldn't do that. Any one of us could have gone in that back booth at one time or another, Lieutenant. You found him, didn't you, Miss Stenz? Yes. Do you usually go back to see how your customers are? Sometimes. Sometimes they go to sleep and the girl who left them's too busy with someone else, so I wake them up. Next girl, Lillian Booster. Yes, I went back by that booth several times. Why? Wants to make Mr. Green some coffee. You're black and strong. She brung it to me. And the other times? Wants to get some hair formula later to get a clean comb. A clean comb for him? Don't laugh. I got a few left. Look, it up here on top, you see? You're fairly new here, aren't you, Lillian? Three weeks. How'd you know that, Rick? Well, I completed my treatments last month. Lillian wasn't here then. You mean you? <laughs> now, now, now. People laugh at psychiatrists too, Walt, and some of them end up playing canasta with Lady Macbeth. <laughs> We were rejuvenating his spit curls. Thank you, Patricia Stems. They've been spitting better than ever. All right, all right. You, you're the last girl. What's your name? Nancy Cummings, Lieutenant. The last girl in her story was no different than the others. Yes, she had left her customer and walked down the hall past the last booth. No, she had not slipped in and popped Mr. John Wiley's neck while he lay resting. The coroner arrived and the whole party went down to the precinct to sign formal statements. They were then all released and sent home pending further investigation. I took Pat home to her apartment. Don't you drink, Rick? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Water? Mm hmm. Uh, you didn't kill him, did you, Pat? Don't be silly. He was growing hair. Kill off my advertising? Here. Thanks. You got any ideas, Rick? No. How long has John Wiley been coming to the shop? Oh, about six months. What do you know about him? Not much. He was a wolf. By your standards or Kenzie's? He got grabby occasionally. Put him straight. Know what business he was in? Well, whatever it was, he had a lot of money. Big tipper. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Oh, yes, just a minute, Lieutenant. It's for you, Rick. Thanks. Hello, Fatty. I got something on the dead man. Got a record. Blackmail. Oh? Know where he lived? We're checking. Now, wait a minute. Pat, you wouldn't by any chance know where John Wiley lived, would you? Well, I sent a bill to him every month. I've got a duplicate set of books here in the apartment. I'll, uh, get the address. Walt, Pat's got his address. I found something else in his personal effects. Key to a safety deposit box. Otis is checking to find out which bank. Well, we should at least have the answer by doomsday. Here's the address, Rick. John Wiley, 709 East 45th Street. I told Walt I'd meet him in Wiley's place Down my drink, gave Pat a pat And a half hour later, we were tearing Mr. John Wiley's apartment to pieces Nothing No? Well, I, uh, I at least turned up a kazoo Grab a comb and some tissue paper We'll do a fast course of Swanee Hey No tissue paper? No, here's a date calendar Good, good Maybe we've been working on a holiday now Here's a name, Nancy That comes after April, doesn't it? Same name on some of the other pages here. The 28th, Nancy, 6 o'clock. Again on the 22nd, Nancy, 8 o'clock. Again on the 18th and, and, and the 12th. Hey, one of the girls who works at Pat's is named Nancy. Yeah, I know it. Well, do you think we should go over and see her or sit down around a card table, hold hands and make her pop out of the wall? You know, someday I'm going to get very mad at you, Rick. Only when you find somebody prettier. Come on, Grouchy, let's go over and see Nancy Cummings. <laughs> Hi, here's her apartment. She lives with that new girl. Lady Wooster? Yeah, and stop flexing your claws. Who is it? Ah, uh, please. Yep, open up or we'll huff and we'll puff and we'll... My, what big noises you make, Grandma. The better to scare the men out of your closet, my dear. We'd like to talk to you, Miss Cummings. Certainly, Lieutenant. Come in. I was just making some lemonade. Would you like some? Oh, well, thanks. It's pretty odd, odd. Maybe you'd like something stronger? Uh, lemonade's fine. I I'm on duty. Uh, he's on duty. You better give him some torpedo juice. Miss Cummings, uh, you didn't tell us that you had dated John Wiley. Would you like your lemonade, sweet lieutenant? Uh, medium. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. You never asked me if I dated John Wiley. The lieutenant found your name written on Wiley's date book. I've been out with him six, seven times, I think. You know what his business was? He never discussed it. Ever meet any of his friends? No. Did he ever mention any of the other girls in the shop? No, I don't think so. Hmm. You, uh, you live with Lillian Wooster, don't you? That's right. Huh? Hey, who's, uh, whose picture is that on the piano? Lillian's father. 
You still don't have any idea why anyone would want to kill Wiley? No. How did Lillian Wooster happen to move in with you? I asked her to. When she went to work for Pat, she was living in a terrible place. One small room. I told her she could come in with me and share the rent. Well, how well did she know John Wiley? She'd seen him at the shop, seen him here when he came to pick me up. Where's Lillian now? Shopping, I think. Well, thanks, Miss Cummings. We'll be talking with you again. More lemonade? Or later, maybe. When things start getting a little hotter. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Here's an important fact about Rexall aspirin I'd like you listeners to remember. It's simply this. There's no faster-acting aspirin made. Oh, but what do you mean by fast-acting? Well, ma'am, aspirin itself is too fine to hold together in tablet form, so it has to be bound with an ingredient that will quickly disintegrate, that is, break up the tablet, so the aspirin itself will immediately be free to do its job. Well, you mean the aspirin can't go to work until the tablet breaks up? Exactly. And that's why Rexall scientists developed a binder so low in moisture content, it begins to break up the very second it touches water. Now that means that when swallowed with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall aspirin tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Well, that's fast enough for me. And it's fast enough for 10,000 family druggists, too. Quality like that is what we're talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective starring Dick Powell. Three in the afternoon, out of Nancy's cool apartment and down in the blistering street. The thermometer crowding night here and the humidity sticking to us like a steaming blanket. I feel awful. A terrible day to solve a murder. Yeah. I want to go look through some newspaper files. What for? That picture on the piano. Lillian Worcester's father? Mm-hmm. I've seen that someplace before. News story connected with it. Uh, I'll drop you off. I gotta get back and see if Otis has found the safety deposit box that fits John Wiley's key. Walt dropped me off at the newspaper and I went down to the morgue file to do some hunting. The air conditioning made the job easier and by four o'clock I walked into Walt's office with an interesting bit of information. We found the bank and the safety deposit box. Oh, anything turn up? While I was doing some pretty fancy blackmailing. Here's a bundle of evidence and a list of names. Mm-hmm. Well, I can understand why someone would pay to keep these out of circulation. Lousy photography. Uh, what did you find out? Well, here. Newspaper clippings. Mm-hmm. Oh. Picture of Lillian Wister's father. Same picture as the, the one on the piano. Ah, prominent banker leaps to death. William Baker. William Baker? The girl's name is Worcester. That's what she calls herself. William Banker. Give me that list we got out of the deposit box. I've just been looking at it. William Baker's name is on here, all right. That clipping I just gave you mentions that he left a daughter and a wife. Ah, let's go pick up Lillian Worcester or Baker or whatever her name is. Well, it might not have meant a thing. But at least we had found one person who had a strong connection with John Wiley, other than socially. The girl who called herself Lillian Wooster was the daughter of one William Baker, deceased, and one of John Wiley's blackmail victims. We climbed to the squad car and hurried back to Nancy Cummings' apartment, where Lillian Wooster lived as roommate. Let's go. Uh, hey, wait a minute. What's wrong? Hold it. Lillian Wooster coming out of the building. All right, we pick her up on the street. And uh, the doorman's hailing a cab for her. Let's see where she's going. Wouldn't it be easier to just ask her? Oh, stop trying to ruin my afternoon. There's nothing more relaxing than a pleasant drive through quiet, peaceful little old Manhattan. We started tailing Lillian Wooster's cab across town, along the river, and across the George Washington Bridge. She's headed for Jersey. Ah, oh, you looked at your compass. That's not fair. We kept going through Hackensack, past the outskirts and on out Route 17. Pretty expensive cab ride. Pretty expensive makes it pretty important. We kept following like that, 
Lillian's cab a good quarter of a mile ahead so she wouldn't notice us. They're turning off on that road. Oh, you're absolutely amazing, Fatty. I probably would have missed it completely. Oh! We took the road to the right off the highway and spotted the cab up ahead, pulling into the entrance of a large white building. The sign over the tall iron gate read, Woodview Sanitarium. She's getting out of the cab and going in. Uh, wait till she gets inside. Then let's go up there and find out who Lillian Wooster is visiting in the Woodview Sanitarium. Yeah? Something I can do for you? I'm looking for a girl. You know, honey, something that doesn't look like a man. Now you stay out of this, Diamond. Don't you start getting me confused again. He gets confused? At the drop of a hat. Watch, I'll drop my hat. Now you stop that. He doesn't like it, does he? Oh, it nearly drives him with... <clears throat> now you, you understand. Yes, of course. Where are you going? I think you better talk with Dr. Gerson. All right, run him out. Temper, 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 temper. Rick, I swear if you don't stop these confounded routines. The routines? Well, you know what I'm talking about. Who's on first base? Oh, don't you know who's on first? Huh? I'm Dr. Gerson. Uh, my friend here is given to uh, mass demonstrations in the aisle. Oh, shut up, Rick. I'm Lieutenant Levinson. I'll bet you're with the cavalry. You get wise with me, Mac, and I'll bust you one. Extreme persecution complex ever since Uncle Julius took away his mandolin. Well, we have some lovely mandolins here, Lieutenant. I am Lieutenant Levinson, New York Police. Now, 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 it's more fun in the cavalry. Maybe you'd think it was more fun in a cell. Well, it's wonderful. We have some very nice ones. Let me show you. Now, listen, I am Lieutenant Levinson, New York Police, 5th Precinct Homicide. And if you don't lay off this foolishness to help me, I'll tear you limb from limb. I'll get some help. You won't get anybody. Get away from that phone. Look, I, I, I think you better uh, let him tell you why he's here. Will it calm him down? I'm here trying to catch a girl. A oh, wreck. That's right. He's here trying to catch a girl. Certainly. Why don't we all try and catch one? Look, would you do me a favor, friend? Why, of course, Lieutenant. Take a look at those credentials. Certainly. Oh, my goodness. I'm afraid he's a real policeman. I need no help from you, Mr. Diamond. Grouchy. Oh, my goodness. Satisfied? Well, yes. Aren't you a little out of your territory, Lieutenant? I am not making an arrest. <laughs> Just trying to catch a girl. I am following a girl. She may be a murderer. She came in here a few minutes you ago. You mean Miss Baker? Then Baker is her right name? Who's she seeing? Her mother. What's wrong with her mother? Mrs. Baker is seriously ill. Have anything to do with her husband's suicide? Everything to do with it? I doubt Mrs. Baker will ever recover. We went back out to the car and tried to put it all together. Lillian's father had jumped off a roof. He was being blackmailed and couldn't take it. The shock had driven Mrs. Baker into a permanent breakdown. And John Wiley had been responsible for the whole thing. Motive enough for Lillian to get a job with Pat Sten so she could get her hands on John Wiley's neck. We waited until Lillian's cab turned out of the driveway and headed back for New York. We stayed close, watched her get off at her apartment. Then we went over to see Pat Stenz. You going to get a hair treatment tomorrow, Rick? That's right, honey. I, I want you to be sure that Lillian takes care of me. Did she do it, Rick? I, uh, I think so. But why? She seemed like such a nice girl. Well, she had a pretty good reason. But we need a confession, and Rick's got an idea how to get it. I want Lillian working on me through the whole treatment. Especially when I get on the vibrating table. Your scalp looks pretty good, Mr. Diamond. Oh, it's been itching a little. Ah, uh, losing any? Mm, some. Hi. Oh, uh, hello, Pat. His hair looks pretty good, Miss Stan. Let's see. Hmm. Um, use both solutions. Okay. I'll see you later, Rick. Nice girl, Pat. Very nice. Have you found out anything about Mr. Wiley's death? Oh, the police have gone to see our news. The lieutenant wants to see your roommate. Now, she told me. I hope you don't suspect her. She rather liked Mr. Wiley. She wouldn't have any reason to kill him. All right. Let's go down to the uh, other booth. Uh, you mean uh, you're going to stick me on that vibrating table? Not if you don't want to. Well, full treatment. That's what I came here for. Let's go. 
You don't mind going in there, do you? No, why should I? Oh, some people are funny about rooms where a murder's been committed. It doesn't bother me, Mr. Diamond. Give him a good rub and let him relax for about ten minutes, Lily. Yes, Miss Dins. All right, up on your back. Uh, Slide down a little, please. Uh, all right, yeah. Okay. Uh, what did you do before you went to work for Pat, Lillian? Oh, not much. Went to school. Finally decided to look for a job and found this one. Ever study this sort of thing? No, there's really not much to it. Pat shows us how to wash, apply the formulas, and rub the neck and shoulders. And all you need is a strong pair of arms, huh? I guess so. Your family live in New York? No. Oh, I noticed a picture of your father on Nancy's piano. A fine-looking man. He's dead now. Sorry. So am I. Mother's still living? No. Oh, ow. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I rubbing too hard? No, it's okay, it's okay. Well, you've got the strength for the job. Did the police find out anything about Mr. Wiley? Yeah, uh, he was a blackmailer. Ouch! Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm a little nervous today. Maybe I'd better get one of the other girls. No, 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 no. That's okay. I'm just, just a little tied up. Next step. Yeah. Try to relax. I guess I keep thinking about Wiley and his broken neck. Think I might break yours, Mr. Diamond? Well, it wouldn't be hard. If I was good and relaxed, you could snap it in a minute. I guess I could. So Mr. Wiley was a blackmailer? Yeah. I had a record. They're the foulest people on earth. They certainly are. You think he was blackmailing someone here in the shop? Oh, not necessarily. Well, if he wasn't, then no one in the shop would have a motive for killing him. Well, I've got a theory about that. I think someone in the shop hated him so much they waited until no one was looking and the girl was out of this booth. And they slipped in on him and twisted his neck until it broke. Why would they hate him that much if he wasn't blackmailing them? Oh, somebody else he might have blackmailed. Someone very close and dear to the killer. Maybe the person while he was blackmailing couldn't stand it and committed suicide. Interesting theory. Take your family, for instance. Ouch. Sorry. You weren't relaxing. Uh, supposing Wiley was blackmailing a member of your family, your father, for instance. I can't rub your neck unless you relax more. Maybe your father couldn't take him. Maybe he couldn't pay him anymore. Instead of disgracing his family, he committed suicide. Just turn your head a little to the side, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, better. Much. Well, if that happened to my family, Mr. Diamond, I guess I'd kill Mr. Wiley and not mind it a bit. Think of the shock. I even put the wife in a sanitarium. It probably would. Well, how did your father die, Lillian? He jumped off the roof. Now, if you'll turn your head a little more, I'll try to pop your vertebrae. Uh, we followed you out to Jersey yesterday, Lillian. I'm going to adjust your neck, Mr. Diamond. It's better if you relax so it won't hurt. Well, if you wanted to, you could pop it anyway. I couldn't stop you in time. I don't guess you could. There. Now the other side. All right. Did you kill John Wiley? Yes. Relax. <laughs> All right, Mr. Diamond. Let's go down to the police station. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you're looking for a way to save money on drugstore needs, buy Rexall MI-31, the triple action antiseptic that makes an ideal mouthwash, a soothing gargle, and an effective breath deodorant. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of this quality product at the same price as other leading brands of smaller quantity. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at any Rexall drugstore. And remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. (laughs) 
Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Virginia Gregg, B. Benaderet, and Larry Dobkin. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen, while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company, like Rexall mineral oil, for example. This is the mineral oil specially refined for extra heavy body. What's more, Rexall mineral oil is tasteless, odorless, colorless, non-irritating, and non-habit forming. Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Oh, pardon me. Huh? You know where I might find Mr. Richard Diamond? You want to hire him? Yes. Well, stop being so bashful, friend. Come in, come in. Thank you. You're Mr. Diamond? Well, any resemblance to the Irish washerwoman is purely intentional. Do you always do your own laundry? Always. Keeps my petty cash from looking too petty. Sit down, Mr. Uh... Baxter. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma, was a man, I guess, to be in his early 50s. Straight up, he crowded six foot three, counting the two inch heels on his handmade boots. Looking at him, I thought of an old Remington print and suddenly felt like singing a chorus of Home on the Range. I'd like you to come to Oak Mulgee with me, Mr. Diamond. Well, why, Mr. Baxter? My brother was killed yesterday. The sheriff and the coroner said it was an accident. I don't believe it. How did you happen to look me up? I raise cattle, Mr. Diamond. I do a great deal of business in Chicago and New York. I wanted a detective with experience, someone with a good reputation. Bless you. I called a friend on Wall Street, and he recommended several men. One of them was you. I checked your background. I'm satisfied. Oh, good. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. Chicken feed. I'll pay it, and if you catch the man who done it, I'll give you a thousand dollar bonus. Oh, well, now, I, I can't leave right away. It'll take me at least five minutes to get my affairs in order. <laughs> yeah, I can certainly see you appreciate a buck. <laughs> Mr. Baxter, I appreciate a buck like a Texan appreciates Texas. Texas? Never heard of him. How was your brother supposed to have been killed? Thrown from his horse, skull fracture. And you don't believe it? I do not. Why? Too good a horseman. Well, it could have happened. Well, if it did, he'd have taken the fall right. Might have busted something, but wouldn't have killed him. Anything else? His wife. My brother was a wealthy man, Mr. Diamond. His wife will inherit everything. Ranch, cattle, all worth about eight or ten million. You think she had something to do with his death? You tell me, Mr. Diamond. I called Helen, told her I was off to Oak Mulgee. Promised I'd send her a couple of Navajos or whatever they had out there. Then I took Clay Baxter over to my flat and threw a few things into a suitcase. <coughs> Oklahoma's dry. So's Richard Diamond. Might get arrested. Oh, I don't want to leave it here. Wouldn't make any difference if it was empty, would it? No. Got a couple of glasses. A fifth usually adds up to a full evening, but that's only when Clay Baxter isn't around. When he poured one for the road, the water line receded six inches. I had a quick one, and he finished it. Uh, how'd that soldier? How do you feel? Oh, lively. 
Why don't we forget the plane? You just start running for the window and I'll climb on. <laughs> Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Population 17,091, according to the last census, and very hot in August. Baxter's station wagon is waiting at the airport, and the driver took us into town where I was introduced to the local law. This here is Sheriff Billings. How are you, Sheriff? Jim, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective from New York. Howdy, Diamond. Howdy. Private detective, huh? Oh, I've been called other things. Still ain't satisfied, huh, Clay? Not yet. And you ain't either, and you know it, Jim. How about it, Sheriff? You think Mr. Baxter's brother was killed deliberately? Coroner says it was an accident. Hit his head on a rock. That ain't what Mr. Diamond asked. Well, uh, Will Baxter was a pretty good rider, but he could have been thrown. Uh, I don't... All the evidence says he was. Could see plain where his horse bolted. What could have made his horse shy? Snake, maybe. Not that horse, and you know it, Jim. Well, uh, maybe stepped in a chuck hole. He was limping right bad when he got back to the barn. No signs of anyone else near the body? Well, when I got there, some of Will's boys had already ridden out. Who found him? A couple old miners. Luke and Phineas Merriweather. Well, let's go out to the ranch, Mr. Baxter, and take another look at the spot where your brother died. Will Baxter's ranch is 40 miles from here, Mr. Diamond. Maybe you'd like to go out to my place and freshen up a bit first. You go ahead and shave and shower. I'm going to go build me a drink. Hey, this is quite a place, Mr. Baxter. I'm glad you like it. Take a swim in the pool if you'd want, but watch out for the catfish. Catfish? I, I'm a bachelor. Don't use the pool much, and I don't usually have guests. Love catfish for dinner, so I keep them in the pool. I caught a guy who wants floating bodies in his bathtub. Don't say. Funny, Harvey. I showered and shaved and met Baxter out by the pool where he was feeding his catfish. I watched a pound of liver disappear like leachy nuts in the Tong War. And we all headed back to town where we picked up Sheriff Billings. Forty miles later, we pulled up in front of the late Will Baxter's ranch. A little different architecture, but just as impressive as my clients. Clay. Afternoon, Sheriff. Oh, Afternoon, Wilma. Wilma. Wilma, this here is Mr. Richard Diamond. Wilma Baxter, my brother's wife. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Private detective. Come up from New York. Oh? Well, why don't we all go in the house? It's too hot out here. And Mr. Diamond wants to go out and look at the spot where Will got himself killed. Certainly. Have one of the boys fix you up with some horses. When you're done, why not stop back for dinner? Mr. Diamond's eating with me, and he's going to be pretty busy for a while. Now, I'll give you a rain check, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, thank you. I'd like you to tell me about New York. It's been a long time, and I've almost forgotten what it's like. Let's go, Jim. It's getting late. Bye, Mr. Diamond. Nice meeting you. Goodbye, Mrs. Baxter. Seems all broken up, don't she? Yeah. Where was she when her husband got killed? Perfect alibi. In town all day. A lot of people saw her. Mighty fine-looking woman. Mighty. We all rode down to the stables, and one of the hands saddled up three horses, and we started out across the open desert. For a man who had spent all his life riding around in taxi cabs, the experience was just short of agonizing. Just up ahead, Diamond. Swell. Never rode much, did you? No, I always bounce like this. Like to make my money belt jingle. <laughs> well, here it is. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. Oh. Well, here's where they found the body. Now, uh, uh, what did he hit his head on? That rock right there. Mm -hmm. Did you take an impression of the wound to see if it matched? Nope. Why not? Never thought about it. Well, that's a pretty good reason. Anyway, let's dig that rock out and take it back with us. I spent the next minutes limping around, looking for something, and came up with nothing except a longing for a hot Epsom salts bath. We dug up the large rock and took it back with us to Wilma Baxter's ranch. Ooh. Oh, 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 hey, oh, 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 howdy, Sheriff. Howdy, Frank. This here is Mr. Diamond, Frank. Diamond, this is Frank Kelly, the ranch foreman. Howdy. Detective fella, huh? Miss Baxter told me about you. Said you was doing some investigating. Yes, sir. Scientific investigation. The way the city boys do it. What you gonna do with that raw? A hopscotch. 
Oh, uh, on second thought, I, I think we'll take turns untying the knots in my back. Good warm shower and you'll feel fit as a fiddle. Well, I got a good start. I'm shaped like one. You'll find it a little bit rough out here, Dom. Oh, I'll get used to it, Mr. Kelly. I hope you're right. Ain't much like the big city. Oh? Huh? Just what is the big city like, Mr. Kelly? I ain't never been there. Just what I've noticed. Looks like a man can get pretty soft living in the city. Mm, well, I'd like to show you where I was brought up sometime, Mr. Kelly. We never got around to playing cowboy, though. We were too busy kicking each other's teeth out. See you later, Mr. Baxter. So long, sir. I don't think Frank likes you, Diamond. Uh, well, what about Will Baxter's horse? I can take a look at him. Right over there in that stall. Really pulled up lame. Oh, good horse. Never figured to shy at anything. Man, look at that. His hip swollen. Yeah, he really twisted something. <laughs> Steady, boy. Steady. Hey, that looks like an infection. Yeah, it's a funny thing. It kind of does. What are you getting at, Mr. Diamond? Oh, I'm not getting into thing, Mr. Baxter. I just said it looked like an infection. Yeah, we better tell Mrs. Baxter or Frank. Have someone take care of it. Tell me, uh, boys, if you jabbed a horse with something, would that make him bolt? Come on, I want to get back to town and talk with the coroner. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Last week, a customer said to me, I wish I knew some way to be sure I'm getting enough vitamins. Some way that's easy, yes, and inexpensive, too. Why, ma'am, millions of people have found a way to do that. They take Rexall Plenamins. Plenamins? Rexall's popular multivitamin capsules. Just two plenamins a day give you more than your minimum daily requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established. Well, you can't expect much more than that. Yet plenamins do give you more than that, for they also contain valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other factors of the vitamin B complex. You say, they must be expensive. On the contrary, ma'am. Rexall plenamins cost you only a few pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere, and remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Now, look here, Jim. Ain't my word good enough? Why, sure it is, Corner. But Clay hired Mr. Diamond to do some investigating, and he's doing it. Clay, I tell you, your brother died from natural causes. I don't think so. But if you insist, I'll show this detective fellow the body. I want the head wound matched with this rock. Okay, but the marchiary ain't gonna like it. They got him already to bury. The coroner led me across the street and into a funeral parlor where I took a look at the late Will Baxter. Six years with the fifth precinct homicide and a couple of dozen killings should have conditioned me. But like always, the first look shakes something loose in the middle of my stomach and I have to keep swallowing hard. Looks right natural, don't he, Clay? Yeah. They do a good job here. Uh, bully for them. Now he hit his head right here. Concussion, plain and simple. No other marks or bruises? Nope. While the coroner rolled the late Will Baxter into one of the back rooms and made a comparison with the head wound and the rock we'd brought in from the ranch, we went out on the front porch for some air. I lit a cigarette and thought about an old case I'd worked on five or six years before. You got a cigarette? Sure, Doc. Piggy uni, all right? Hmm. Funny thing. Head wound doesn't match the rock. Sure doesn't. Mm. Wound is too deep. Rock's round and flat. Nothing sticking up to go that deep. Then I want an autopsy. Why? Fracture still killed him? No, I doubt it. When someone plans a murder, they don't count on one blow to do the trick. Bet there's nothing else that could have done it. Well, nothing you can see. I've met someone here in Oak Mulgee that I'm pretty sure is wanted for another killing very similar to this. Now, Doc, go make that autopsy and fast. You think maybe you found something, Diamond? You, you think Will was killed deliberately? Maybe, but we'll have to wait for the autopsy. In the meantime, I'd like to go out and visit those two old-timers. Luke and Phineas? That's right, Sheriff. Well, it's my dangerous. Come on, I'll take you out. Uh, you better wait here for the report. 
Mr. Baxter and I will go on out. All right, you can use my horses, so you won't have to go all the way back to the ranch. Horses? Well, the Merriweather is on the other side of town, not oh. about ten miles, no roads. Oh, horses, ten miles. I mean, never play kick the can again. <laughs> Oh, you oh. really don't take the horses, do you, Diamond? Uh, uh, maybe if you could find me a nice long thin one. <laughs> Holy Ike. Whoa, 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 Steffi. That's one of the Merryweathers. Well, let's get out of here. Come on, horse. Now, come on, I'm yellow, and I admit it. Now, it's, it's okay, Diamond. That's just the boy's way of letting you know not to come any farther, unless they say so. Oh, uh, swell greetings. What happens now? Hey, up there. Luke, in here. What you want? It's Clay Baxter. I got a friend here who wants to talk to you. Ain't it? Yeah, Luke. Hey, Baxter. Got some friend who wants to palaver. I don't feel like palavering. Better shoot him. Giddy up. Just, just take it easy. Take it easy. They always act like this. Henny don't want to palaver. I gotta shoot you if you don't promote. It's important. About my brother. Henny? Yeah, Luke. It's about his brother that didn't we found the other day. Oh, all right, I guess. Let one of them come up. Baxter? Yeah, Luke? Send your friend on up. And up I went, leaving my better judgment running off across the desert. I climbed a small hill and found myself standing at the entrance of an old mine shaft. Luke and Phineas Merriweather stood on either side, shotguns ready, pointed right at my chest. Start talking. Well, uh, uh, gentlemen, my, my name is Diamond. Don't pay no import your names. What do you want? Just wanted to ask some questions about the man you found the other day. You a policeman? Well, kind of. Shoot him. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute. I'm not a real policeman. Then what are you? I'm a, I'm a private detective. Luke? Yeah. What's the matter? It's an honest profession. A fellow's got to make a living. You a real live private detective? Well, I'm a private detective. The real live part I'm depending on. Well, my goodness gracious. Come on in and have some vittles. Huh? Why, mister, me and Finney read all them stories about you fellas. Uh Uh-huh. We filled up one whole tunnel with old detective magazines. You fellas really are something. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Let's see your badge. Oh, oh, yeah. Sure, sure. There you are. Oh, yes, sir. Well, I'll be dog. Come on in, friend. Come on in. I'd like to ask you some questions about this here Dick Tracy fella. Well, one minute I'd face two shotguns. The next I was turned into an honored guest. I had coffee and biscuits with Luke and Phineas and answered enough questions about the private detective business to fill a dime novel of my own. I squeezed in enough questions to find out that the boys hadn't seen or found anything unusual when they discovered Will Baxter's body. Four cups of coffee and a dozen biscuits later, I bid the Merryweathers a fond farewell and returned to Clay Baxter. They loved you? Oh, worshipped me. Hmm. They're starting a Richard Diamond fan club. Well, did you find out anything? No. Uh, Well, give me your hand. I'll help you up on your horse. Oh, couldn't I just walk back? Come on, horse. Hold still. Steady, boy. Clay Baxter, sitting in his saddle, had leaned down and grabbed my hand to help me up on my horse, and that was when he got it. His horse took out with the wounded man still up and hanging on. I booted my horse in the ribs. Oh! I took off after Baxter like citation on a good day. I closed my eyes, prayed a little, and tried to remember every jockey I'd ever seen before. Suddenly, I looked up and spotted Baxter's horse dead ahead, standing still and right in my path. Whoa! Ooh! Well, I guess it's just my time. If I don't die from this bullet I got in me, I'm going to do it from laughing. How is he, Doc? Oh, he'll be all right. Bullet went clean through just under the collarbone. Didn't break anything. How do you feel, Mr. Diamond? Uh, crippled. Any idea who shot Clay? No. 
Clay said he thought it might have been the Merryweather boys. Oh, uh, I, I, no, it couldn't have been. Why not? No, the Merryweather boys use shotguns, not rifles. What about that autopsy, Doc? Well, come on, what about it? You was right. Will Baxter didn't die from a skull fracture. What was it? You don't know what was used for sure. A long, thin instrument. Whoever did it pulled the lower eyelid down, killed Will Baxter by jabbing something through the eye into his brain. Probably hit him over the head to knock him off the horse and then got down and made sure. And then jabbed his horse in the flank to make him bold. Nasty way to kill him, man. Well, it's been done before. Not a man's way of killing Wilma Baxter was in town all day. When Clay comes around, tell him I borrowed his station wagon. Going out to see Wilma? Going out to her ranch. I want to take another look at Will Baxter's lame horse. And Doc, I want to borrow a pair of surgical probes. I climbed into the station wagon. Close to an hour later, I pulled up on the side of the road. The gate to the ranch house was another hundred yards up ahead. So I piled out, climbed the tall white fence, and slipped into the barn. <laughs> Steady, fella. Steady. Steady. The horse's left flank was still swollen, very close to a serious infection. I ran my hand over the spot. <laughs> Steady, boy. There was something still stuck in the flesh, so I used the surgical probes and prayed the horse wouldn't kick my brains out. Whoa. Whoa. Steady, boy. Steady. There. Sorry, fellow. I didn't know you were a vet, Mr. Diamond. Huh? Oh, good evening, Mrs. Baxter. You know, in this part of the country, you can get shot for horse stealing. Oh, not stealing. Just taking this out of your horse's flank. What is it? That's a piece of a long needle. Might be a hat pen or something. I think you'd better tell me what this is all about. Oh, certainly. You're, uh... Your husband was murdered. That's impossible. Suit yourself, but he was. Somebody hit him over the head, knocked him from his horse, jabbed this needle into his eye, then jabbed it into the horse's flank so the horse would pull up lame, look like he'd shied. The killer tried to shoot me this evening, but he missed and got Clay Baxter instead. Who do you think did this? I don't know. The method doesn't fit a man. A woman, then? Well, the blow on the back of the head rules out a woman. Too much force. What have you got left? What I started with. A man and a woman. Very interesting theory. Mm-hmm. You're uh, from New York, aren't you? I've been there. I thought so. Your face is familiar. I haven't been in New York in at least ten years, Mr. Diamond. Oh, funny. Well, I've got to go out to the Merryweathers. Those two old miners who found my husband? Mm-hmm. They saw the murderer. What? Yeah, that's why I know how it was done. I was out there earlier, and I've got to go back after a sworn statement. Oh, why didn't they speak up before this? Afraid. Said it was none of the business. See you later, Mrs. Baxter. Have another biscuit, Inspector. Uh, uh no thanks, fellas. Ten's plenty. Uh, so, uh, Will Baxter was murdered, huh? That's right, and Mrs. Baxter thinks you two saw who did the killing. Gonna lay a trap, huh? Yes, Luke, gonna lay a trap. Mm. Now, look, I remembered Mrs. Baxter from someplace the first time I saw her. Then when I found out how the murder was committed, I recalled a case very similar back in New York. Man was hit over the head, pushed down a flight of stairs, and his brain pierced by a hat pen. A man actually did it, but a woman planned it. The man was caught, but uh, the woman disappeared. Why'd they do it? Uh, the victim was insured. They wanted to make it look like an accident. Ah, uh, come on, we better spread out. We should have company pretty soon. The two old-timers took off their coats and gave me some beat-up pants, which I stuffed with pillows and blankets. In five minutes flat, I had two dummies sitting with me at the little table. You, you think they'll fall for it? Well, uh, you can't tell, but uh, you two go on outside and wait until somebody comes in. I just want them to try for one of the dummies. Well, what if he tries for you? Killjoy. Luke and Phineas took their place outside the mine, and I smoked a dozen cigarettes, and then I heard someone coming in, moving quietly up the tunnel toward the light. I played it big. Well, that's, uh, that's fine, Phineas. Uh, now, if you'll just sign this statement. I rolled, and the dummy that represented Phineas Merriweather doubled over from the force of the slug. 
He shot again and Luke's dummy toppled. I kicked the lamp out before he got around to yours truly. Two down and one to go, Diamond. I'm afraid I got a big surprise for you, friend. I ain't worried. You should be. That wasn't even close. You're a lousy shot. Yeah. You missed earlier this evening and got Clay Baxter instead. I'll make up for it. No, you won't, train. Drop it. Uh -oh, uh... You heard him, drop it. Okay, all right, don't you? Wait a minute. Well, I get the light. Yeah. Well, hey, it's a Kelly fella. Yeah, you're getting way out of line for a ranch foreman, Kelly. <laughs> Give it to him, Mr. Diamond. Who had you kill Will Baxter? You know, Kelly, you said something today about getting soft in the city. Wonder just how soft I've gotten. Maybe you'd like to find out. Turn him loose, boys. Yes, sir. You are now. Go to it, Mr. Diamond. I don't like getting shot at. It makes me real unhappy when anyone runs around killing people. No, uh, oh, go on, stop him, do it. Shut up. I'm in here, let fight. Now, now, Kelly, why'd you kill Will Baxter? Well, my Baxter talked me into it, promised me a share of the ranch. And for that, you killed a man, huh? It's a big ranch. I'll get up. Sure hate to see you leave, Mr. Diamond. I hate to go myself, boys. Love them biscuits. Well, maybe we'll get up and see you in New York sometime. Hey, Kelly's coming too. Hmm? Doesn't like being tied to a horse like that, I guess. Yeah, well. Finny. Uh, yeah, Duke. Fellas coming too. Hit him with something. <laughs> sure. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. I often think there's no common ailment quite so distressing as acid stomach. And there's certainly no relief for it quite as fast and effective as Bismarex. This famous Rexall antacid often neutralizes excess acidity within one minute. And the scientifically balanced ingredients of Bismarex work in sequence, easing gastric distress and leaving a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Yes, Bismarex gives relief that's not only quick, but continuous and prolonged. Ask your Rexall druggist for Bismarex. He'll tell you, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Hal March, Arthur Q. Bryan, Virginia Gregg, Barton Yarborough, Wilms Herbert, and Wally Mayer. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. 